All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our March 3rd public hearing of the Environment Committee. We've got a, uh, a robust agenda today with uh, a lot of speakers uh, signed up. I'm looking at the list here. It looks like we've got uh, 61 uh, folks signed up to testify. Um, so we will get right into it, but I will first ask uh, if my co-chair has any remarks before we start. Uh, sure. Thank you, Senator Cohen, for kicking us off today. And hello to all of our members and our uh, public audience. I'm just looking forward to hearing um, the testimony today. And um, the input has been very valuable to date. Um, so ready to uh, hear the um, contribution to these legislation. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I know uh, Representative Harding will be joining us uh, shortly. Uh, we're all trying to balance multiple meetings here. Uh, but I, I think I'm here now. Oh, there you are. Hi. Yes, hi. Did you have any, you, any remarks Chair. before we start our hearing today? No, nothing further. Thank you for the acknowledge, acknowledgement, Madam Chair. And I look forward to uh, some testimony today and getting to learn more about these proposals. So thank you. Great. Thanks. And Senator Miner, any remarks? morning and um, I also look forward to the public hearing. I'd just like to note that there are a number of bills uh, with GEP, GEEP involvement. And if I could, Madam Chair, uh, maybe we could figure out a way rather than have uh, this be a dominant kind of topic today, maybe uh, the leadership could figure out a way to uh, schedule a meeting with the agency separately after this, just to go through these bills. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I, I don't think that that's a bad idea. I'm sure I'm looking forward to uh, Deep's testimony this morning, but uh, Commissioner has a lot of work cut out for her in, in going through each of these, each of these items. So um, we'll, uh, we'll look forward to continued conversation, but certainly want to hear uh, from Commissioner Dykes on these items and give the committee opportunity to ask questions uh, as appropriate. So with that, let's get started and uh, Commissioner Dykes, welcome. Great, uh, well, good morning, um, uh, Senator Cohen, Representative Borer, um, Senator Minor, and Representative Harding and uh, distinguished members of the Environment Committee. Um, appreciate the opportunity to uh, provide testimony today. Um, on a number of bills, um, as Senator Minor mentioned, uh, it is there. There is a bit of deep domination here, which is never a bad thing in my view. But uh, always appreciate the indulgence of the time. Um, I'll be. I'll try to be very brief. I'm just going to highlight a few um, uh, proposals that we have provided to, uh, written testimony on. Uh, first, Senate Bill 931 is a proposal that would authorize. Um, Deep to evaluate uh, California's heavy duty, medium and heavy duty vehicle emission standards um, and grant deep authority to uh, adopt standards provided um, that they're identical to those adopted by California um, if the commissioner determines that such standards are necessary to meet air quality and climate change goals. Um, just to underscore for the committee, uh, this is, um, you know, we are out of it, we struggle with ozone. Uh, and uh, poor air quality here in the state, contributing to acute and chronic respiratory problems. We know because, uh, through um, the, the tragic impacts of, of the COVID-19 pandemic about the uh, special vulnerability that um, respiratory illness uh, caused by air pollution um, can uh, create for, for populations in our state. And so um, this proposal would enable us to move forward um, to help support the transition and, and um, um, implementation of, of cleaner uh, transportation solutions, especially in the medium and heavy duty sector. The mobile sources um, in our state uh, account for 67% of NOx emissions, um, nitrogen oxides, which are a central component of the formation of, of ozone. And heavy duty vehicles account for 40% of those emissions. And as we continue to make progress in reducing emissions from light duty vehicles, um, that medium and heavy duty sector becomes an, a more pronounced uh, portion of our air pollution. So it's really critically important that we have this authority to be able to um, support uh, the deployment of more uh, clean uh, and, and, and electric vehicles um, to help reduce air pollution in our state. Um, I know that there's been a lot of uh, news making the headlines around manufacturers um, having breakthroughs in terms of reduced uh, costs of batteries and other components um, 
and, and certainly there's a lot of momentum even since last year when uh, we introduced uh, this, this um, or, or there, this legislation was introduced um, in the shortened session last year. Um, we've seen much progress in manufacturers uh, making commitments to shift to electric vehicles and that includes in the medium and heavy duty space. Um, the reduced cost of maintenance for these vehicles um, helps to offset the upfront costs of, of purchasing um, electric trucks. Uh, and so we, we believe that this can be a very cost effective option uh, for folks over time. Um, we also expect that the transportation initiative program, which we look forward to testifying about next year, will provide additional support for charging infrastructure um, and possibly other incentives that can increase vehicle deployment um, to help comply with these types of regulations if um, our uh, evaluation concludes that they should move forward um, as the bill's constructed. So I'm um, pleased to, uh, to bring this one to your attention uh, this morning. Also wanted to provide a testimony uh, highlighting uh, House Bill 6496, an act concerning certain soil related initiatives. Um, I know that the committee is aware um, uh, that there's so much opportunity for us to um, transform and, and, and accelerate and, and, and improve the affordability of uh, cleanup of contaminated sites across the state. Um, the progress that this committee supported in um, authorizing uh, uh, DEEP to move forward with a release-based um, uh, cleanup program for contaminated sites. Um, the efforts that, that we're so excited about in terms of adopting um, RSR and EUR regulations, I think will also be comp all of those are reforms that are spurring um, more cleanups and will make cleanup of contaminated sites more affordable um, and, and easier to do. And that, that's so important for economic development across the state. With that context, I highlight this as another opportunity um, uh, in section Sorry, section one of the bill, uh, it, it uh, reflects that DEEP has been approached by a number of developers who are identifying opportunities for redevelopment um, at locations that require beneficial use of very large quantities of soils um, that are lightly contaminated. And so this would be um, something that uh, we think that carefully done um, with <clears throat> appropriate you know, oversight and standards established by DEEP, um, we can repurpose those types of lightly contaminated soils in the, the right and inappropriate locations um, that is protective of human health and the environment while reducing the transportation costs <clears throat> that developers currently occur um, uh, for uh, uh, managing these types of lightly contaminated so soils where there are no uh, opportunities for appropriate local use uh, reuse today. So this is one that, you know, section one um, is something that we're very, uh, very interested in and we think will be another important arrow in the quiver um, for supporting more cleanup of contaminated sites, making that more affordable, um, more uh, effective for, for uh, folks to do across the state. <clears throat> I'll note that um, we've raised in our written testimony some, some um, areas in sections two through five where we'd like to continue work with the commu uh, committee. Um, certainly, you know, we uh, recognize the importance of addressing soil health. We think that um, to achieve the objectives of this bill, um, we, you know, it, it implicates a discussion around available resources and um, the opportunity to work with other state agencies who have expertise in this area. <clears throat> Um, House Bill 6501 um, is a, a another really important bill. Um, this uh, includes a number of streamlining recommendations for certain programs of, of the department. Um, I won't go through each one of those opportunities um, individually, but as a group, as a collective, um, they reflect the continued focus that we have at DEEP on ways to make compliance with our various um, regulatory programs easier and more affordable um, for uh, for applicants and for uh, municipalities and others that we uh, that we work with. It you know these are um, in some ways can be barely minor revisions, but they help to reduce um, duplicative process and limit uh, regulatory burden. And wherever we can do that, it ensures that our resources at DEEP are, are trained on those um, regulatory objectives um, that are most uh, most impactful. And, and, and um, so I just uh, commend the, the, the committee for raising House Bill 6501. Um, and as we know how important that will be uh, for our department.
Um, uh, finally, House Bill 6499 is an act concerning radiation security. This is also is a proposal that uh, we were seeking last year. Um, we strongly support this bill. What it will do is establish, uh, enable uh, Connecticut to join 39 other uh, states that have adopted agreement state status um, and to help reduce the cost of compliance uh, with some of our uh, radiation security programs um, and provide more locally responsive uh, regulation and administration of those programs. Uh, it, it just makes a lot of sense in terms of um, uh, providing for a more cost effective and more accessible uh, uh, approach to this program and following in the footsteps of a very large number of other states um, that have moved to agreement state status. Very simply, what this bill does it, is that it establishes the statutory authority for Connecticut to enter into an agreement um, with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for Connecticut uh, for Connecticut Deep um, to locally administer some of those requirements um, of the NRC for uh, ensuring the safety and security of radioactive materials. This uh, bill would not um, make uh, would not apply to nuclear power plants and spent nuclear fuel storage facilities, but rather to other um, uh, regulatory authority over types of uh, radioactive material used in industrial, academic, and healthcare facilities. Uh, Governor Lamont um, submitted a letter of intent uh, to, th to the Nuclear Regulatory uh, um, <clears throat> Commission in December um, to help us begin some of the early stages of evaluating uh, and, and initiating this process uh, to become an agreement state. Uh, but we, we certainly need the support of the General Assembly and statutory authority in order to move forward with that process. And so we'll be delighted to take any questions you may have um, on the, the benefits of this proposal and, uh, and certainly any of the uh, uh, bills that you have before you today. So thank you for the opportunity to testify. And I should also mention, I have many uh, members of my team here. Thank you for your, your indulgence and including them virtually. Um, I'll note our deputy commissioners for environmental quality, Betsy Wingfield and for environmental conservation, Mason, Mason Trumbull and uh, other uh, terrific members of our staff are with us. Thank you so much, Commissioner. And I'm impressed that you were able to get through all of those bills, your testimony of those bills so uh, quickly and efficiently. So I appreciate that. Uh, certainly sets us up for a, a good day, I think. Um, I'll take some uh, questions uh, from the committee first, and then I have uh, some questions as well. So uh, Representative Dillon, I see you have your hand raised, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. And good morning, Commissioner. Thank you so much for your testimony. I wonder if you could provide some clarity on your position on uh, Senate Bill 927. Uh, I believe that's an, a Senator Looney's bill, um, uh, which was really inspired by a very alarming uh, situation uh, where uh, the town of New Haven was, uh, was not alerted and about a spill and uh, there was uh, some concern about a potential threat to the oyster beds. I didn't, I didn't see this year being the year of the oyster, but that seems to be happening. Um, I wonder um, uh, what you mean when you say you're meeting with stakeholders, um, because obviously there's a lot of concern uh, when, you're, when you're looking at the Mill River and the um, intersecting there and the time of the of the uh, of what's happening with the with the business there. Um, uh, anyway, I'm sorry I was a little lengthy there, but what uh, it sounds like you're opposed to the current language, and that's that's worrisome to me. And I just wonder if you could be helpful in that regard. Thank you. I'm going to turn Hello. to our Bureau Chief, uh, Graham Stevens, to respond to your question. Uh, Representative Dillon, thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Graham Stevens. I'm the Bureau Chief of Water Protection and Land Reuse at DEEP. And Representative, thank you for your question. And, and just to clarify, with respect to um, this bill, Senate Bill 927, DEEP is supportive of improvements um, to the Sewage Right to Know uh, Act. And I, I think that this was an important uh, um, uh, statute that came into being 
uh, you know, and we've we've had some lessons learned with respect to the system that we have in place now. Um, we've been speaking with many stakeholders uh, for some time um, that that even predated um, the spill that you referred to uh, that impacted uh, the Mill River and multiple communities um, this past summer. And um, I think really what we're talking about as far as changes are, are, are some nuanced changes. Um, and some of those changes, um, you know, we've, we've already uh, had uh, discussions with the stakeholders on. So this has been an ongoing process and probably the, the language that the committee put together, which is, which is a good step forward. Um, you know, uh, we've evolved a little bit in our thinking since then uh, between the stakeholders. So we're, we're very happy to work with the committee to make sure that we, we enact uh, not only a changes that uh, improve uh, the public's knowledge of sewer spills, but also uh, ensures that the ongoing contractual process we're, we're engaged in to bring a new vendor on to, to aid in the public knowledge of sewer spills um, is, is honored. So we don't want the bill to necessarily require us to do something that uh, is beyond the contractor's ability. Uh, we went through a lengthy contracting process to bring on uh, a vendor that other states have used we're talking with other states. So we're trying to, to really be comprehensive in the way that we change this statute for the benefit of, of the public. Uh, thanks. Madam Chair, if I could ask one just follow up, I think this is probably going to go on outside of outside of this process, outside of this particular venue. And um, I, I have no right to speak for Senator Looney, but it seems to me in, intuitive that um, that if two towns border each other and if there is something important happening downstream and adjacent to the event, um, and I'd almost have to look at a map, that that, that shouldn't be a heavy lift um, to uh, to alert the the adjacent town. I certainly don't want to compromise any delicate conversations or any contract, but there could have been a lot at stake, and we're not clear yet whether or not there were any um, serious consequences. To we spend. totally agree with you, Representative. We totally agree with you, and we we feel that you know there should have been better communication even under the existing law, and I think that changes in the in the law that we support. Uh, will provide greater clarity on notification, particularly to um, municipal officials and um, other municipal officials that should be uh, working with with their their the, the, the members of the, the residents of their town to ensure that uh, folks are safe. So absolutely, we agree with that approach, and we we concur with your statement there. Thank you very much. You're Thank welcome. you, Representative. Uh, Representative Boer, my co-chair. Thank you, Senator Cohen. I just wanted to also respond to Representative Dillon because you're absolutely right. When there was a spill this summer into the Mill River, uh, we had gotten together to determine where was the gap? Where was the notification gap, the communication gap? And what do we, do, what do we need to do to tighten this legislation? So Representative Reyes was a, a very big part of that as well. We met with Betsy um, and Commissioner Dykes and came up with some thoughts around how to change that. Save the Sound was very instrumental in creating this language as well for this legislation today, as well as Senator Cohen, but you know, the whole leadership team. So we think that this is a better approach because there was gaps in the notification from one city to the next. Um, you know, because it's it's supposed to go to the elected officials downstream, but elected officials aren't always on their email or may not always see that communication. So we also brought the health directors into the loop um, as part of that notification and um, a little bit more requirements on the deep side as well. So um, I, I'm, you know, of course, there's always opportunity for improvement, but this is something that we've been working on since the summer and I think we're in a good place, but you know, unfortunately we don't, hopefully we don't find out in the next bill that we missed something, but um, we'll always work to improve this. But thank you for your thoughts. And thank you, Representative. 
I'm sorry if I misrepresented, but I was interpreting the, um, I was aware of the conversations and I was interpreting the commissioner's testimony, perhaps incorrectly. Um, it sounded like she was not totally on board with what, you know, with changes, but, but I'm sure those conversations will go forward and uh, rightly so, thank you. Thanks, and, and I just wanted to clarify the communication aspect, but thank you. Thank you both, uh, Senator Miner. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So uh, I'm not sure who the stakeholders are. I'm not sure my name is on that list of stakeholders. Uh, I do think we've made an attempt here to try and make the current situation uh, obsolete and make the future situation better. Um, but I too have some questions about the way uh, it's been drafted and it might be interpreted. Uh, line 11, 10 and 11 talk about partially treated sewage. And I'm not sure what the threshold is partially treated sewage, probably a heavy rain event on many of our large, uh, maybe many of our sewer treatment facilities uh, causes that kind of a discharge. So I do look forward to a continued conversation. I think we have the ability uh, to get a good bill out of the committee that would be helpful to all communities. Uh, but once again, I, I stress the importance of trying to meet with the agency uh, prior to moving the bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, and if I may, I have, uh, oh, Representative Harding, please. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and, and I, I apologize for not putting my hand up quicker. I'm still trying to get used to all this. Uh, thank you, Commissioner, for testifying and for all your work. Just have a question on the emission standards in regards to the cars. Um, how, how, how do you see or foresee the, um, the department's enforcement, you know, uh, practically uh, on, on, this, on this bill and how they're going to regulate this. And, and obviously some of it has to be hashed out as we go along, but uh, as of now, as the bill is presented, how, how do you see the department's uh, enforcement of all this and how do you see that working out? Uh, let me turn, obviously, so establishing these standards and, you know, primarily the, the focus is on shifting uh, the mix of vehicles that are offered for sale. Uh, and so that minimizes the, the enforcement needs. But let me turn to, um, or at least with respect to individual um, purchasers of those vehicles. But let me turn to uh, Tracy Babbage, who is our Bureau Chief uh, for our air, uh, air group. Tracy, do you want to, uh, could you respond sure. more specifically? Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Representative, for your question. Um, just a sort of broad brush, uh, this, uh, the, the requirements will apply to the medium and heavy duty vehicle sector. So we're talking about uh, everything, you know, from small step vans up to large heavy duty trucks. And it's useful to think about how we, what we've done on the passenger vehicle side as an example. So I first wanna say the requirements apply to the engine manufacturers and the truck manufacturers. And, and one of the important pieces of this uh, legislative proposal is that we're sending a signal to the manufacturers of these vehicles from uh, small vans all the way through heavy duty, uh, heavy duty trucks, larger uh, diesel trucks, that we want to see more of these cleaner vehicles placed in Connecticut. So what we're looking at is uh, requirements that are around sale and delivery when we get to that uh, point uh, through our regulation. It's very similar to what we do now on the passenger vehicle side, so that we're looking at percentage of sales uh, of those uh, vehicles uh, to be placed in Connecticut. So that's how we would do it. And, and also, just also as a reminder, this effort, um, we have uh, 15 states that are, have currently signed on to a memorandum of understanding to work on uh, cleaner trucks. And so similar to what we've done on the passenger vehicle side, we will be working collaboratively with our uh, sister states regionally and across the country because it, this, this initiative will involve states uh, across the country that are interested in pursuing this to make sure we're doing this in a consistent uh, way that also shares resources. So I hope that answers your question. It does, and I appreciate the answer. Thank you so much. Sure.
Thank you, uh, Representative. So I do have a couple of questions, um, and I'll stick uh, with that bill initially, uh, SB 931, um, and, and just ask, I know that there's a memorandum of understanding with 14 other states. You would think as a result of that MOU that um, the industry is probably um, making some strides, one would hope, um, in electrifying or, um, you know, um, emissions control and uh, standards that they have in place uh, for new vehicles that are on the road. I wonder if you could speak to what's going on in the industry, if anything. Certainly, I know, in highlighting what Tracy said, it, the, you know, signing on this, uh, onto this MOU, the fact that it, that we have so many jurisdictions that are participating across it does send that strong signal to manufacturers um, in terms of where they're making their investment uh, and the types of models that they're, and, and technologies that they're focused on, um, that a significant a part of the market share um, is participating in the MOU. And so that ensures the most cost-effective um, path for us to have ac you know, access to these types of vehicles um, at, a, at a low cost uh, and ensure compliance uh, pathways that are, that are affordable, affordable. But let me turn to Tracy to, to supplement that. Sure. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you, Senator Cohen, for the question. We're seeing a lot of movement, especially uh, in the smaller vehicle range, the smaller vans, the, the class twos, threes in, in that area, as we see more uh, things like uh, Amazon delivery vans, maybe one example. Um, and and wait, can I just interrupt with that real quick, Tracy? So are those considered medium duty then? The yes. Smaller vans? Okay. Thank you. Yes, they are. Yep. And uh, so uh, we are seeing much, you know, considerable movement in that area. And I, I think um, there's a lot of work that's going on now looking at uh, the total cost of ownership and the savings associated with the move to electric that really overcomes, you know, any uh, disparity in the upfront cost of going electric. So we're seeing much more movement. And it's something we're really paying very close attention to because we're also seeing what's happening in a worldwide market because uh, globally there are big moves uh, being made in the Asian market. China has been going very big, which is also helping to drive costs down. I think we see it on the continuum beginning with the, sl the uh, smaller vehicles in the range and then moving up the spectrum to the heavier uh, uh, heavy duty vehicles in terms of cost coming down quickly. Mm -hmm. And again, it's also related to battery costs as battery costs continue to decline. I'll also note that we are seeing expand, as Tracy highlights what's happening on the manufacturing side. Um, I'll also note that we're seeing real uh, promising and strong interest uh, from businesses here in the state um, who are who may have internal sustainability goals or um, other types of motivations in terms of lowering their operating costs for their vehicle fleets, um, they are you know we have a um, are able to provide uh, for we, we administer a small um, grant uh, program through EPA called the DERA uh, grant program as well as our VW funds which are targeted to um, med medium and heavy duty and we've seen you know a, an uptick in the number of applications coming in from Connecticut businesses who are interested in applying for those grants, um, which can help fund and offset some of the upfront purchase costs for um, electric and, and lower emission diesel vehicles. So um, we're really excited about what the, that, um, that pro those programs are telling us about the demand for these vehicles in state. Thank you for that. And I, you know, I, along these same lines, I mean, we, the reason we're moving in this direction is that we're currently in non-attainment with NOx, the National um, Ambient Air Quality Standards. And I'm just wondering, um, is this sort of our idea of getting us back to attaining those standards or back to, or attaining those standards? Um, and if so, I, you know, are we doing it soon enough? I mean, 2050 is a long way off, you know, for um, with this MOU to get to, to zero emissions. And I mean, obviously there would be progress along the way, but, but do we think that this is um, the magic bullet to get us there or are there, um, is it a combination of items that the department's working on? Well, certainly uh, NOx emissions are um, one, you know, the, the mobile sources are one of the 
you know, largest contributors to uh, NOx emissions in state. We are pursuing a, a whole range of strategies to try to um, regain attainment with the EPA standards, um, both in our stationary sources like power plants, looking at um, our, our transportation sector is critical just because it contributes two thirds of the, the, the NOx emissions in state. So, so this is very important for us to make progress. Also very important for us to have these regulatory tools in the toolkit um, to address medium and heavy duty because as we continue, we, we have been early movers on addressing light duty vehicles, our participation in that. Um, Zev MOU uh, some years ago and the authority that we have to address light duty vehicles in a similar light regulatory construct has contributed to um, the availability that we see today of electric vehicles being offered for sale, um, uh, passenger vehicles here in the state. So we, as we make continued progress in, in the passenger vehicles, we need, now is the time for us to have these tools for medium and heavy duty, which will become an increasingly, um, you know, take up more and more of the share of the remaining NOx and greenhouse gas emissions um, associated with the with mobile sources. And then at the same time, we're also continuing our uh, work to advocate uh, with respect to upwind states um, to address pollution that, you know, uh, air pollution that's coming across our borders. So we have to have kind of a full suite of strategies um, to tackle this. That's the only way for us to, um, you know, make progress to, uh, re re you know, to begin to, to be able to meet the, um, the EPA uh, standards and provide for cleaner air for families and, and for, for our kids um, here in the state. So that's that's one of the reasons why this is uh, this is so important. I think that the targets that we have in terms of 2030, 2050, you know, reflect our um, our forecasts that we are carefully considering. Again, this is the benefit of working with so many other states and participating in the California um, program. I had the opportunity to testify um, before the California Air Resources Board um, last summer, and I know our staff have been very engaged with them as they've been putting together their proposal, um, which we would be uh, evaluating um, and, and, and would follow if, if that evaluation proves out um, under this bill. Uh, and so, you know, the key is balancing the opportunities for um, b making, uh, uh, you know, significant progress as quickly as possible on the emissions reductions balanced with the availability um, of the technologies, the availability of the vehicles um, in, a, in a manner that's cost effective and affordable for, uh, for folks to purchase here in the state. All right. Well, thank you for that, Commissioner. And if the committee will just indulge me uh, for a couple more minutes, I do have a question on, or a couple of questions on another bill, uh, the uh, 6496 related to soil. Um, and I'm just curious about, with, with respect to Section 1, what do we use this soil for now, this lightly contaminated soil? And I, I will ask also a follow up question to that, which is, what does lightly contaminated mean? I'll turn to our Bureau Chief uh, Graham Stevens to help uh, address those questions. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, thank you for the, the question, Senator. So this, this bill um, and section one in particular dealing with um, lightly contaminated soils and, and some other um, materials uh, is really meant to um, address a waste management issue. So one of the things you'll see in the bill is that uh, it uh, is, is meant to specify that the soils um, already meet uh, uh, standards specified in the remediation standard regulations. That's the bill's reference to regulations promulgated pursuant to 22A. Um, and in our testimony, we're you know seeking just a clarification that that relates to regulations promulgated pursuant to 22A133K. Um, so these, these soils um, are, are not soils that we would find to be um, polluted or posing a risk to public health or the environment. But when, when certain parties do um, a construction project and generate excess soils, um, they need to find a place to um, you know, dispose of or finally place those soils. Many times, um, because there's not a, a great system for dealing with these soils, they end up being trucked out of state and landfilled. And we know from our own experience in Connecticut that, that the landfill should be, and the space in the landfill should be reserved for, for the waste that need to go there as opposed to 
soils that might be used for other purposes on other properties. So the, the concept with this bill is to, to, to work through a pilot program to see if we can uh, establish a process uh, using existing um, lenses that we apply to this, these issues um, to find a beneficial reuse for these soils or other materials in a way that's not going to impact our waterways, in a way that's not going to impact public health, um, and in a way that's going to be protective and uh, provide additional opportunities for economic development. So these soils are tested to make sure they meet the standard of lightly contaminated and don't pose a risk to public health or the environment. Correct. And there's other factors, however, that need to be weighed. For instance, you know, um, you know, the, the chemical properties of the pH of the soil needs to be needs to be such so it doesn't leach um, naturally occurring metals out of the uh, soils that are in place. They need to be placed in a way where erosion uh, is not an issue um, that might impact our waterways. So there's a lot of other factors that, that go into it other than just um, the testing for the contaminants, uh, but certainly the, the testing for the contaminants would be a requirement um, if a site were selected. Thanks for that. Um, and in the same bill, section six, with respect to dredging, um, I, you know, I have experienced this uh, horrific timeline with uh, permitting processes, um, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, area um, clubs and whatnot trying to get permitted, um, you know, to, to open up a season expeditiously. Unfortunately, that um, doesn't always happen, but much of what we're running into, um, at least in my area, is that it's uh, a delay with the Army Corps of Engineers. So I'm wondering if you could comment a bit on Section 6 and, and really if uh, DEEP is able to impact at all uh, that permitting process timeline. So I'm, I'm going to ask uh, Brian Thompson um, to, to see if he can provide you with uh, some more details, Senator, on that question. Sure. Brian? Thanks, Graham and, and Senator. Okay. Yes. Um, uh, yeah. It, it, we under, we definitely understand uh, the, the frustration that applicants can feel um, in uh, through the, the process that leads up to, to submitting an application. Um, and uh, it, you know, it's a process of, of um, characterizing the sediment before it's approved for disposal at Long Island Sound uh, disposal sites. So it's uh, uh, developing a sampling plan and getting that approved and then collecting data and, and doing analysis. And then uh, the Army Corps of Engineers um, goes through a process of, of what they're all sediment suitability determination. Uh, they do that in conjunction with EPA and, and DEEP, but it's, it's really led by uh, the Army Corps. And uh, it, it really is a, a, a critical function uh, for, in, that we need to make sure we do comprehensively and, and carefully um, because uh, you know, as as we know, uh, New York has been been pushing back on Connecticut's use of open water disposal sites in Long Island Sound. Uh, they they challenge our uh, use of those sites, and so we need to very carefully characterize and, and review the sediment quality uh, before approving of uh, of the disposal at those locations. So. Um, you know, it is a, a, a very um, sort of prescribed process and uh, we, we do work with the Army Corps closely on it. They have, within the last two years, uh, made a change in how they do that characterization. Um, so there was kind of a, a, a transfer um, or changeover in the, in the process that I think uh, took a little while for them to uh, to iron out, and, and and they've also had some organizational changes, um, so they've had some backlog uh, and, and delays in some projects. 
and it, it's pretty variable. It can be, you know, for some projects, it can be months for projects that are very complex. It can be, uh, you know, more than a year, sometimes two years to get through that, that process. So we, we have been working with them. We've been trying to iron out some of the problems. Um, we'll continue to do so. Um, but, but as I said, it is important that we ensure that, that the process is done uh, carefully. So it does sound though that like DEEP uh, could work collaboratively with the Army Corps uh, to come up with uh, perhaps a more streamlined process here and, and potentially impact timeline. Uh, we can, yes, we, we can do that. Have, as I said, we have been working with them for some time and, and it also involves EPA as well. So uh, we need to make sure all three agencies are are working hand in hand. Um, and uh, I think all the agencies recognize that there have been some issues and are, are um, trying to, to work through those. So I, I'm hopeful that it will get, um, it will move faster um, as we go forward. Okay, thank you. And I, I just wanna thank the committee for their indulgence of uh, me taking up so much time with my questions. I see Senator Minor is next, followed by Representative Piscopo. Thank you, uh, Senator Cohen. Again, I would ask, um, there are a number of bills here that uh, I think we need to try and get right uh, as a committee. And uh, the DEP staff has clearly put a lot of thought into um, how we might best get there. I'm not sure we're gonna be able to absorb it all today. I have questions on the, uh, on the bill as it pertains to uh, radiation security. I have questions on uh, 6501 uh, with regard to uh, permits that were uh, required. Uh, we required people to register diversions. It appears to me that now there'll be a fee. So uh, once again, I would just ask that we try and schedule an opportunity for at least the leadership of the committee to ask questions directly, maybe uh, we can do it via Zoom uh, before we try and move these bills. Um, they're all intended to do good work for the state. Uh, I just wanna make sure that that's where we are before we try and vote them out of the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for those comments. Uh, Representative Piscopo, followed by Representative Dillon. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Commissioner, for your testimony. I appreciate it. On the um, on the emissions bill uh, 931, I, could, I, I assume that the effort here is to shift uh, regulation uh, of emissions from the federal government to the California standard for medium and heavy duty trucks. Uh, that's a safe assumption, I, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but Toward the end of the bill, it mentions that we will have to, uh, from I think the wording is something like from time to time as California amends its regulations. So say they wanted to say tighten up on some of the emission standards. Does Connecticut automatically follow that procedure or will it come before our legislature or this committee and then the legislature to adopt those so-called or whatever the amended uh, amendments are to uh, those regulations. I, I think Commissioner, I'm happy to take that if it makes sense. Please, please uh, do. Thank you, Representative Piscopo for the question. And I'll, uh, the first part in response to your question about uh, EPA versus California. Uh, we've been looking at this very, very closely. Um, EPA has been talking about proposing uh, regulations in this space since 2018, but no proposal has been forthcoming as of yet. We do think that under the new administration, it will get um, you know, more attention, but it's going to take a fair amount of time before there is a proposal at the federal level. California, as we have seen on the passenger vehicle side, is much more nimble and adept at uh, responding to technology changes and incorporating those changes in their requirements. So 
uh, the California uh, approach will provide uh, better and better, better environment, environmental outcomes and uh, will uh, focus more on the advanced technology options for medium and, and heavy duty, as we see right now. Uh, California's rules will be effective uh, for the 2024 model year. At this point in time, we don't we don't know when EPA uh, will have a regulation or a rule in place, but it's probably looking more like beyond the 2028 timeframe. So just to give you a perspective, and as you know, Commissioner Dykes outlined, you know, Connecticut is non-attainment for ozone, and one of the reasons why we are so interested in pursuing this proposal is that we exceed the ozone standard close to two dozen days in the summer. We have some of the worst, if not the worst air quality on the East Coast. And our team at DEEP is sending out a, a, a public health forecast close to 20 days during the summer where we're telling our citizens that it's unhealthy to breathe our air. So we really need a suite of requirements that help us to address the ozone problem in the short term. And that's why we're looking, you know, and interested in the California approach as compared to the federal approach. Your question with regard to uh, the regulatory process, uh, any changes uh, that California makes from time to time, we will go through our regulatory adoption process, the full opportunity for uh, putting the proposal out, uh, notice and comment and uh, coming back to Reg's review. Uh, so that it's not an automatic as changes uh, get made and refinements get made, uh, we will also uh, ne need to go back through that process to adopt those enhancements. We, we, we will have a requirement to stay current with the California uh, standards. Identicality is a really important component to this, but we will be going through the reg adoption process in order to do that. I hope that answers the question. Yes, thank you, Tracy. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Dillon. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm not sure in the protocol that I wanted to follow up on a comment by uh, Mr. Brian Thompson. Would that be through you to the commissioner to him? <laughs> or, or you can ask the question, Representative. It sounds like you have a question pertaining to the bill. I, d I do, uh, and it would be its application to a specific case um, that did involve a decision by the, law, by the Corps of Engineers to put sediment from Eastern Connecticut uh, at a site outside near Morris Cove in New, in New Haven. Um, it, the dis I actually testified at the hearing against it. This is going back I don't know, within five years, I think. Um, but um, my question is, is, given that there is an institutional conflict between New York and Connecticut, which probably goes back to my parents' childhood uh, about the, the use of the common waters, uh, I'm, I wonder if you could provide today or later, probably, um, the application of this bill to determining the contents of anything that's placed in the harbor outside of Morris Cove. Uh, sure, Representative. Yeah, we can uh, perhaps best to uh, talk about that um, offline. But but essentially, uh, what what's being proposed now by the Army Corps of Engineers is uh, um, is as a part of the New Haven Harbor deepening project to place some of that sediment. Um, in the uh, excavation uh, in, in Morris Cove, in Harbor near Morris Cove. Uh, there are a number of other um, uh, approaches to like, um, using that sediment. Uh, that is one of them that is actually a uh, uh, habitat improvement um, to, by, by filling that hole and, and eliminating some water quality uh, and, and creating a better habitat. Uh, yeah, we can have further discussion about that. I'd be happy to. And that would be great. There was a Boy Scout troop in West Haven, actually, that asked me to speak on this. Um, I think they've probably all graduated from uh, from sound school by now, but um, it was very, very high interest. Anything you can do would be very, very helpful. Thank you, Representative Dillon. Representative Dillon. 
Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I don't see any other hands up, so I just want to say thank you to Commissioner Dykes and the Deputy Commissioners and Bureau Chiefs and everyone who joined today. Uh, thank you for your testimony, and it sounds like we'll be having some continued conversation. It's a team effort, Senator. Thank you so much for the time, and we look forward to continued discussion and, again, appreciate the committee raising some of these bills on our, on our behalf. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, moving right along, I think we have uh, Commissioner Hurlburt of uh, the Department of Agriculture with us. Welcome, Commissioner. Good morning, everybody. And I'll try to be as efficient as Commissioner Dykes was with her uh, testimony before everyone here. Um, Senator Cohen, Representative Bohr, Senator Minor, Representative Harding, and the honorable members of the Environment Committee. Thank you for raising um, three bills that I'd like to testify on, uh, on behalf of today. For the record, my name is Brian Hurlbert. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Agriculture, and I am joined today by Carol Briggs, the Department of Agriculture Staff Attorney, and Kaylee Royston, our Legislative Liaison. Um, for your information, I have submitted testimony with regards to HB 6504, an act concerning animal welfare, HB 6500, an act concerning supplemental revisions to the state's hemp program statute, and House Bill 6496, an act concerning certain soil health initiatives. Um, I won't be reading all my testimony, but it will address certain high points um, and be willing to answer any questions that you and the committee members may have regarding these bills. Um, starting with House Bill 6504, it's a priority bill that the, the agency um, submitted and requested um, to make substantive policy changes to enhance the department's ability to ensure that domestic animals in our state are properly cared for and that the department has the tools necessary to enforce these best practices. Section one updates the term animal to remove the outdated term brute creature, and it's not intended to revise or narrow the scope of the department's authorities or an animal control officer's duties. I do understand uh, that there's concern from some of the animal welfare community that this language about this language change. Um, and I will uh, add that we are currently working with them to address their concerns with regards to the definition in our statutes. Um, the bill also contains updated definitional changes to animal control officers and domestic animals to bring us in line with current federal language, including updated definitions for service animals, which add service animals and training in that language. Section three contains definitional changes which reflect the department's mission to protect domestic animals and to affect changes requesting to remove guide dogs and replace with service animal, which aligns our statutes with the terms used by the federal law in the ADA. Sections four, five, and eight, uh, we are requesting the words chief animal control officer, any animal control officer, or any municipal or regional control officer be replaced for references to the appropriate statutes authorizing the appointments of said animal control officers. Section six allows municipalities to create municipal, muni mutual aid agreements, I'm sorry there, for assignment of animal control officers on a temporary basis of their own. Um, this would, uh, put in, would allow the practice that is currently happening in the community to be um, aligned with our statutes. Section nine requires animal importers to have dogs and cats examined by a veterinarian within 48 hours of entering the state and being available for sale. Um, section 12 was not submitted by the department, but we understand where the committee and the um, advocates are looking to go with this proposal um, and, uh, regarding rabies um, quarantines. And we are currently in discussion with the Humane Society to work out a provision that would be in agreement with our sister agencies um, to clarify and provide the flexibility that's sought in this language. Um, just for the committee's um, knowledge, uh, this, um, the compendium regarding um, uh, animal rabies prevention and control um, includes both the Department of Public Health and the Department of Energy and Environmental Protection. So this is not a unilateral um, uh, measure that we can take. Sections 13 and 14 increase the reimbursement payments for vet veterinarians to spay and neuter pets and increase the funding limit for the feral cat program. Um, this is a really important past three years. 22 veterinarians have dropped out of the program or have indicated that they are, are disinclined to continue because of the low reimbursement rate. Um, and just for the committee's knowledge, another veterinarian has, uh, re has left the program just in this past week. Um, the department also requested two sections that were not included in the, in the raised bill that would allow for the opportunity to create a mediation session for restraint and disposal orders and updating rabies reporting requirements. Uh, moving along to House Bill 6500, an act concerning supplemental revisions to the state's hemp program. 
Um, uh, prior to starting my comments, I'd just like to first extend my thanks to you and all the members of the legislature um, for the amendments made to the state's hemp program that were passed during the special session um, last September. Um, those brought us in um, compliance with the USDA hemp interim final rules um, to maintain an eligible state program. Um, last month, USDA released, released the final rules for hemp production, and after our thorough review and working with USDA, our sister agencies, and the federal partners, we have drafted the suitable language before you to bring us in compliance with those final rules. The bill contains technical revisions um, due to numbering and language changes that the USDA final rules have um, versus what was contained in the interim final rules. The numbering for sampling and testing was changed in the final rule and our statutes need to be renumbered accordingly. Section two allows for the remediation of non-compliant crops. Section three clarifies the restrictions on eligible licensees uh, by specifying a 10-year conviction period. This change was at the request of the USDA. Um, the, this language that has been submitted and that you are considering today has been submitted to the USDA for their approval. And we would ask that this bill move forward intact to prevent any unnecessary delays, which could be caused by additional revisions. Um, uh, we're requesting for this bill and any of our bills um, that we update the citation authority under 51-164 to incorporate all previously authorized statutory citation references. Um, it's not currently in this bill. Um, we would request that it be added if, uh, as substitute language if any consideration for this bill um, or this language is taken up um, to grant us this authority. The, the enforcement language that we've requested is identical to the language for hemp manufacturers regulated by the Department of Consumer Protection. 51-164N, the citation statute has not been amended to reference 22-61L. Um, and without those changes, USDA may decide that our proposed hemp law does not meet the final rule requirements and may not approve our state plan, uh, which is why it's important that we get that language um, in this bill or one of the other bills that the committee sees fit. Um, a little asterisk on our, uh, on our language in the, in the conversation here. Um, as with any proposed uh, proposal regarding hemp, um, we are at the women mercy of the USDA for final guidance. Um, in our recent discussions with the director of the HEM program just last week, uh, the Biden administration and Secretary Vilsack may keep the rules as proposed, they may revise them, or they may delay implementation. Um, we will keep the committee posted with any developments as they happen, as we understand that this is important um, to the success of our HEM program. Finally, House Bill 6496, an act concerning certain soil health initiatives. Um, just for the committee's awareness, we have at the Department of Agriculture been participating in, and fully engaged um, in the Governor's Council on Climate Change, and I chair the Agriculture Soils Working Group. Uh, House Bill 6496 adds the responsibility for soil health to the duties of the Council on Soil and Water um, and the Conservation Districts. The department does have a seat on the council and the council was instrumental in the development of the governor's council on climate change report that we released. Um, we do have concerns with section six of the proposed bill. Um, the proposed um, uh, streamlining for marine dredging um, raises a, a, a concern for us. Um, eliminating that requirement would enable dredging with no lot knowledge of what is being dumped in, in the water or on the land. Should this be permitted near shell fishing areas, particularly town recreational areas, the department asks for more limitations to reduce, reduce the transport of contaminants to the shellfish area. Um, the Department uh, uh, Bureau of Aquaculture makes a determination uh, of significant impact to shellfish resources and shellfish habitat, and we request that any streamlined process include um, notification to the department in order to preserve and protect our shellfish industry. Um, thank you all for the opportunity to testify on these bills, and I'd be happy to answer any questions from the members. Well, Commissioner, I'd say you did pretty well at uh, getting through that timely uh, testimony and, and uh, in an efficient way. Um, I thank do you. see some questions from the members. Representative Dubitsky, followed by Representative Mishinsky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Commissioner, for coming in. Uh, I have a couple quick questions um, with regard to um, uh, raise bill six, uh, 6504. Um, in lines uh, four through 10, the redefinition of animal now 
includes livestock for the, my I understand for the first time why was livestock put into the definition of animal um, my understanding is that it always been a very uh, distinct and intentional definition, uh, a distinction between livestock and domestic animals. And I'm a little concerned that this kind of blurs that line. What was the intention there? Thank you, Representative Dubitsky. And um, uh, I appreciate your attention and concern um, to, uh, to that language. Um, it, it had been our opinion that brute creature would include livestock for the purposes of um, the animal control officer statutes. Um, and so we were looking to revise the language to make it more clear. Um, it, it, th there's no real definition of a brute creature. Um, and so uh, what we did here was we proposed specific language that would um, incorporate all of the types of animals that had been previously uh, included under our animal control uh, authorization. Okay. Um, I, I thank you for that answer, but it, it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, I'm looking down at, uh, so, so, it, so our, um, are, is livestock now a domestic animal or just an animal? An animal. Okay. So looking at section, um, well, at lines uh, 262 through 264, when it talks about appointment of animal control officers uh, to enforce laws related to, it used to be, dogs and other domestic animals, but the word domestic was removed. So does that now extend that uh, jurisdiction over livestock as well? I wouldn't say that it extended it. Uh, we have defined animal to include um, livestock, which was uh, you know, considered brute creatures um, previously. Um, and so we're just clarifying, clarifying um, that animal was defined earlier in the statutes and no need to um, uh, keep domestic in there because that would, would change what uh, we're referencing throughout the course of the, the proposed uh, statutes. Okay, so it used to relate to dogs and other domestic animals of which livestock was not. And now it relates to dogs and other animals of which livestock is. Doesn't that extend the jurisdiction? Uh, I, I would disag disagree with that. Uh, animal control officers have um, previously um, and continue to uh, investigate and work with the State Department of Agriculture on um, domestic and livestock issues. Um, there's, a, there's a case um, that uh, received a lot of publicity just recently regarding horses um, that was in a partnership uh, with the local ACOs. Um, so I don't think it is a, a, an expansion in practice um, considering the work that we've done. Okay. Um, so looking down at uh, line 360, where it does the same thing, it removes the word domestic um, and arguably now includes livestock. And then you go down to lines 364 and the word domestic is not removed. So, we, so if, an, if livestock is not a domestic animal, but is an animal, does the leaving the word domestic in here exclude livestock? Representative, that's a great question. And our staff attorney, Kill Briggs, has offered to respond. Okay. Representative Davitsky, our proposed language did eliminate the word domestic from the phrase domestic animal because the defined term in statute it, under 22-327 is animal. So we were trying to make the references in our ACO statutes refer to animal. Um, we did remove the word domestic when it got raised as the bill by the committee 
the word domestic got left in in a number of places. Um, that was not what our language was as proposed. Um, so we, we wanted the word domestic removed so that only the word animal was used throughout that statute. Okay. Um, so are you telling me this is a typo? Um, I'm being diplomatic, Representative. Okay. Um, the diplomatic way to say there's a typo in here. Yes. Well, there seems to be several of them because the word domestic is, is uh, left in in several lines, including line 368. Um, and there are, there are others, um, 379, so uh, 383. So it makes it difficult to determine where the jurisdiction lies if you're trying to incorporate livestock into the definition of animal, but it's not a domestic animal. And then in some places it refers to domestic animals and other places it refers to animals. Um, I think that would certainly need to be clarified um, in my view, because a, as it stands, I, I don't understand what, whether they're in or they're out. It, it would be our preference representative to remove domestic throughout the proposed language. Okay. Um, do, do you have any idea if it was intentionally left in by LCO or anybody else? I, I can't answer that. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I'd just be interested if there was a reason why it was left in. Um, you know, I, I apologize. I can't cite you a line number, um, but it is my un, reading through this. And I, I forgot to put a note in, as in a particular place um, that the it, under current law, it is legal for a farmer, for instance, to humanely euthanize a, uh, an animal who is been injured or suffering in some way. Um, my quick read of this bill seems to remove that right from the farmer and indicate that, it, that, that euthanization must be done by a veterinarian. Is that, is that, did I read that correctly? I don't believe that we referenced the farmer's ability or inability in this. This is that this um, statute references the animal control officer's responsibilities and, and I'll allow uh, Carol to add or anything to that comment. Representative, we're still not impacting a, a farmer's ability to handle their livestock, you know, in the way that they normally would. Um, much like if they're raising beef for slaughter, they're raising poultry for slaughter or for whatever it might be. They're, it, if they're handling their animals, they're still allowed to do that. Okay. All right. I, it just, um, and, and again, I, I didn't put in a note anywhere, but it, it just, it, it appeared to me that it, that it um, took all uh, the powers to euthanize an animal and assigned it exclusively to veterinarians. If that's not the intent, then I guess I read it wrong and I, I appreciate your response. Um, I think that's all I have on this bill. Um, I'll, I'll continue to listen to the debate and uh, I mean to the, the testimony. If I have any other questions, I'll chime in. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank, Thank you, you, Representative. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Mishinsky, followed by Representative Borer. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, Commissioner, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have two questions on the animal welfare bill. First, on the spay neuter, uh, it does make sense to um, it does make sense to change the vet fees so the vets will stay in the program. Uh, but what we do now is we wait until they drop out of the program and then we change the law and update the fees. Wouldn't it make more sense to peg in the law to peg what we pay to uh, some published schedule of vet fees so that we 
continuously update the law rather than do it uh, once every 10 or 15 years? I would be happy to consider that and, and make sure that we had all the appropriate public notice and everything. Um, I think your goal is our goal, which is to make sure that veterinarians are being re reimbursed at, at an adequate level to provide the services. Um, so I'm not immediately opposed to that, but I want to make sure we do it uh, appropriately. Okay. I just want to avoid this, this uh, mm -hmm. cycle of uh, vets gradually dropping out of the program until it becomes constricted and then we have to rush and fix it. So I'd like to avoid that if possible and keep the program smoothly running. Um, and then my other question is my, the same one I asked you last year about, uh, you've got some language in here on, uh, on working dogs and, um, and I'm trying to um, give some credit to the therapy dogs that go in and work with the public. And uh, would you be willing to would you be willing to accept language that the commissioner may issue uh, some kind of a badge or identification for uh, working therapy dogs? And then the owner of the dog would then pay the department a fee for the badge? I, I will, uh, am interested in that. Um, Carol has been participating in the um, uh, human services subcommittee that has been working on this. Carol, are there any, any issues with that? I, I don't fully, I uh, remember what the federal law is regarding um, state requirements on, on service animals and therapy animals. I think that's, that's one of the issues is that ther therapy animal is not a defined term in any federal law. A couple states, I believe, have taken steps to create such a category. But right now we were focusing on the service animals because that is a defined term under the Americans with Disabilities Act and um, we could easily handle that change in our statutes. I think it's certainly something we could, we could certainly continue to work on. Okay, so um, not during this hearing, but later this week, Carol, I probably should talk to you directly. Sure. And if we can, maybe we can use the New York definition. Uh, they've already got one and that would uh, make it easier to write for Connecticut. Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Representative, uh, Representative Porter. Thank you, Senator Cohen. Thank you, Commissioner. You had mentioned that you were working with um, some animal advocates on the definition of animal and animal welfare. And we've just heard a little bit confusion over the uh, technical definition, which it sounds like we need to take back and, and look at what was intent versus what was um, an inadvertent typo. Um, so can you clarify what the intent is on feral cats? The intent is to include feral cats as we have previously. Okay, all right. So I'm not sure that the language is clear around that. So um, that is something that we'll, we'll take back and we'll, we'll revisit after we hear all of the testimony today. Thank you. Yep, thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative. Senator Miner. Thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. So uh, I guess, I first of all, I'd like to align my uh, concerns with those expressed by uh, Representative Dubinsky, and I look forward to maybe another conversation uh, to try and allay some of those concerns. I think, um, I think I'll leave it there for today, but uh, at least with respect to that issue. I wanna to go to the uh, section that has to do with uh, kind of aligning uh, 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 facilities. Uh, section, I think of where that is, where we talk about regional uh, control officers, uh, animal shelters, and all of that. Uh, that's in the bill looks like section nine. So what is the hope, I guess, of the new language? What's the intention here? Is it to uh, require animal shelters to uh, come up to a certain standard of housing, so to speak? 
Senator, I, I just want to make sure I, I'm looking at the appropriate language. You said Section 9 and Section 9 is animal importers, but there is another section regarding um, uh, pounds is regional um, regional animal pounds. Is that, I just want to make sure I'm looking at so the there, right There are a couple here. of sections here. Uh, section where, seven, I'm sorry, is the regional pounds. There are, a couple of, there are a couple of sections here where I think the agency is attempting to um, improve uh, uh, the quality, let's say, of life uh, and the handling of animals uh, when they come into the state. With regard to physical structure, is there anything in here that would require an upgrade of facility? So section seven would require um, that um, regional pounds match the requirements of uh, municipal pounds with regards to construction maintenance and sanitation standards. Um, the language um, that is current statute hadn't been updated um, with the number of regional pounds that have been happening, the, the mutual aid agreements between communities um, to share ACOs and facilities. Um, and this would just make sure that um, if, a, if a town uses a regional facility, that it meets the same requirements that a municipal, uh, a, an individual municipality would have to uh, be held to. And so with respect to private nonprofit uh, shelters and rescues, um, the agency doesn't uh, feel the same way about the obligation to upgrade those as well. I know the news over the last year or two has been um, inclusive of a number of violations that the local ACOs or the agency may have felt were inappropriate. Uh, is there a reason why uh, there was no effort, I guess, in the bill to bring them up to the same standards we're requiring for municipalities? Um, they are currently regulated in a different section of statute. Um, and we also have um, some regs being proposed and drafted um, that will address some of these issues that you should be seeing in the near term. And, and lastly, um, I, I got to tell you that um, I'm continuing to hear from constituents that are adopting dogs from outside the state of Connecticut. Some are being delivered here to Connecticut. Uh, some are being delivered craftily to states adjacent to the state of Connecticut and people are incurring thousands of dollars of um, medical expenses for dogs particularly, but some cats and dogs. Is there anything in here uh, that changes uh, the state's authority to investigate those types of things? And uh, is the agency doing anything to rectify um, kind of a lemon law uh, approach to what I think most people enter into especially during COVID for all the best of reasons. You know, I think we all heard that uh, animals were not available at local municipal pounds and therefore they've gone to the internet. And it's, it's frankly heart-wrenching uh, to hear people talk about thousands of dollars on a credit card uh, in the hopes of keeping an animal they had no idea was as sick as it was because um, you buy them kind of sight unseen. Thank you, Senator. Yes, yeah, Section 9 um, specifically addresses that, and it would require uh, veterinary um, inspection within 48 hours of entering the state. If the, if the transaction is made outside of the state, I don't believe that we have any authority there. Um, but if an animal is brought in, um, this would align with our pet shops and other animal importers um, that they have to have a certificate of health from a, from a veterinarian um, stating that the animal is in good enough health for, for transfer. And if it's determined uh, last, you know, if it's determined that the, uh, the veterinarian is unwilling to provide such a certificate, what's comp uh, contemplated then in the bill? Arguably, the animal could not be transferred um, without that. And, the, and whoever is importing it or is responsible for it would have to 
um, hold on to the animal until the animal's in uh, a, a proper health that, that would uh, warrant uh, the certificate. Well, I don't, I don't want to, uh, I guess, go on forever here, but so if Senator Cohen, for instance, adopts a dog from outside the state, this, if approved, would require that she takes the dog to the veterinarian and the dog receives a suitable certificate. She's already got possession of the dog. I believe the, the language specifically requires that it is the person responsible for bringing the animal into the state um, be examined, uh, have, the, have the animal examined by a vet. And that could be done um, at a site, you know, not necessarily at the veterinarian's office, um, but at whatever site that the uh, transfer is happening. It's, it's not the intent that it's on the consumer to get that certificate. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Um, I do have a couple of questions. Um, so you mentioned the feral cat program, and obviously we're losing a lot of veterinarians. Uh, and uh, presumably, uh, they're they're telling you that it is because of the fee. And as such, we are assuming that by raising this fee, that these vets will come back into the program. Is that the assumption? Yes, Senator, we actually um, uh, maintained an animal population control working group um, through 2019 and early into 2020. Um, this, and this had been one of their regular recommendations. I believe the working group started in 2017 or 2018 prior to, to my um, coming on board, um, but this has regularly been one of their recommendations. And it, the, um, the working group does include two veterinarians um, who have um, uh, expressed their concern about the, the challenges with the, with the low reimbursement. Okay, yeah, and I think Representative Mashinsky had an interesting thought, and so maybe we could explore that a little bit further um, as we move forward. Um, it also, uh, in the same bill, with respect to uh, shortening the quarantine time, I you know heard your testimony. I see your written testimony, um, um, you know, indicating that you don't think this language is necessary. I would just um, ask. Uh, you, Commissioner, uh, you know, I understand that the state vet has the authority to issue waivers to shorten uh, that quarantine. Um, how often is that done? Um, because it's my understanding that these folks don't, don't necessarily recognize there is a process by which they could uh, or through which they could get a waiver. That, uh, th that is a, a great question, Senator. Um, and um, we uh, did ask to have that information available for today. Unfortunately, our state veterinarian position is vacant and Dr. Bruce Sherman, the bureau director is acting as a state vet. Um, and so I can get you that information as soon as possible, but I don't have it for me, um, right now. Okay. All right. Well, I would, I would like to see that, um, mm -hmm. uh, going forward. So thank you so much for your time today. I don't see any other questions. Uh, so I appreciate you all being here. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And we'll be in touch with, with follow-up answers to those questions. All right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, moving right along, we are up to Representative Irene Haynes. Is Representative Haynes with us? There you are. Welcome, Representative. Good morning, everyone. So glad to be here. Um, Co-Chair Senator Cohn and Rep. Hoor, uh, Ranking Members, Senator Minor and Representative Harding, I'm here today to address Bill 6502, specifically Section 4. Uh, previous law prohibits 10 or more balloons to be released in the atmosphere. And today I'm here to address the nine or less balloons we are still releasing. Uh, for the same reasons as the previous law was passed, um, there are a number of reasons, and I'll briefly um, go through them, as to why that bill was or that law was passed and why the um, charge of mine here to increase the um, number of balloons we should be releasing, or I'm sorry, to decrease the number of balloons we should be releasing. Um, first and foremost, we've all seen the, the, the awful pictures of um, how injuries um, to wildlife is um, prevalent with these um, balloons. Um, we've all seen the ugly pictures of turtles eating the plastic or birds having strings wrapped around their bills as they starve and have a very slow, angry death. 
um, infrastructure interference as the strings get caught in power lines and other infrastructure fires ensue and powder out power outages ensue therefore um, costly repairs and loss of you know all kinds of uh, property whether it's state property or personal property um, and finally um, something of particular interest to me is injuries um, to people who could be um, seriously injured um, and I've cited this before when this bill was before the the uh, legislature two years ago was the, the jet ski example. Um, a balloon actually got caught as it floats along um, the waterway, um, particularly in Connecticut River, and it got caught up in the intake of the jet ski. And the, in, the jet ski immediately stopped after doing 40 miles an hour down the river. And the um, passengers, husband and wife team got thrown from the jet ski and um, uh, were very you know, seriously injured. So these are reasons why this literal trash that we release into the atmosphere eventually comes down and causes all kinds of problems. This bill was passed two years ago through the House. Thank you so much to my legislation, legislative buddies there. Um, but it is human trash and we need to prevent this from day one um, in, in its entirety. Nine balloons or less are still a problem. And I appreciate that um, you, know, you guys are, are hearing this bill again. Um, and there are many other people coming up and testifying against this. And um, I hope that we can get this through committee this time, through the House, through the Senate, and to the, to the governor to, you know, once and for all, just to get rid of this trash entirely. So I'm welcome to answer any questions that you have, but I'm sure you all feel the same way as I do. And I thank you again. Thank you, Representative, and, and I just want to thank you for your leadership on this. I know uh, you were responsible for introducing the bill uh, two years ago, um, and, uh, you know, I too would like to see it uh, cross the uh, proverbial finish line. I told the story, I, I believe, a couple of years ago, and I've, uh, you know, posted this on uh, social media as well, you know, the uh, ham and acid have these wonderful osprey cams, um, you know, on the osprey nest. And uh, it was horrific to watch as uh, an osprey, you know, was entangled in one of the uh, helium balloons. Um, and, you know, just the, the thought of, um, you know, how that osprey was going to tear loose, but, you know, die for its prey, all of these things uh, with this uh, uh, encumbrance on its talon. Um, so it, it was really heartbreaking to see. Luckily, that, that osprey um, did break free of the balloon, but um, this is what's happening all over the place. And, and you provided some, you cited some examples of how in, uh, human uh, injuries could occur. And also we just need to be mindful of our environment. Um, so I'm just grateful for your leadership on this. I see my co-chair Representative Boer has a question. Sure, thank you, Senator Cohen. And uh, thank you, Representative Haynes. I just wanted to echo my co-chair's comments and really thank you for your advocacy on this. You've been um, a strong leader in this area. Um, for a few years now. Um, we all know how dangerous and toxic this is in our waterways, in our land. And, you know, I just, I cringe when I see people celebrating and releasing the helium into the air. And, you know, it's not intentional. I think, you know, often it's, it's a celebration and, and they look at it as a, you know, a happy thing to do. But I think it's up to us to really educate um, you know, folks throughout Connecticut that the dangers that it can really cause. And there's, there's many other ways to celebrate um, occasions. So um, I think with this passage, we'll be able to, um, you know, send that message. Um, again, I don't know that it's always intentional. It's just maybe um, not aware. So your bringing this awareness to everyone is uh, very much appreciated. So thank you. Yes, well, thank you. Uh, you know, another thing I didn't actually mention that I should is, is that the other part of this is, is that helium is actually a finite element in our, in our, in our world, and helium is used in the medical field um, where it's really super needed, um, and we don't need to be wasting it to, um, you know, release it into the atmosphere. So that's another piece of this as well. So um, I thank you for all you um, folks on the Environment Committee for advocating for this, and I appreciate the, uh, the support. I really do. Could I take one more moment? Is it on the same bill? And it's just to um, give you guys a heads up that there is somebody who else is going to be testifying coming up very soon. And I just want to introduce and support her testimony. 
Absolutely. Okay. My uh, um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep her in in order, Representative of, of uh, the those who have signed up to testify. But please, uh, you're welcome to say a few words in the introduction of her uh, testimony at a later time today. Great. So my esteemed um, East Haddam Town Clerk will be speaking on the uh, um, animal welfare bill, and she is coming up in five people. Um, I've gone over her testimony with her and very supportive of the testimony, and she has um, some real um, great information in regards to just um, clarifying some language in there. So I appreciate your, uh, your listening to her, and um, I give her kudos for speaking, as I do all my constituents. It's so important to come up here and testify. That's why we're all here, and we need to listen to our public. So thank you. Thank you all for today. Thank you, Representative. I really appreciate it. And it's really never been easier to testify. Um, so um, I'm, I am so appreciative also of hearing the voices of all the residents of Connecticut uh, on these important matters. I, I was remiss in, um, in saying that, um, you know, as we've, we've um, gone past the agencies um, at this point, um, you know, there are time limits on testimony. So I uh, don't want to catch anybody off guard. Uh, the, the time limit is three minutes. Our clerk will be keeping time and uh, you'll likely hear a bell or a polite interruption um, once uh, your testimony has reached that three minute time mark and, and we'll just politely ask you to wrap up at that point. Um, so I did just wanna mention that um, as we move forward. And next on my list here is Representative Ann Hughes. Welcome Representative. Are you with us? No, Representative Ann Hughes is not. So we'll just move on to the next one. Uh, okay. Uh, Representative Fiorello, I see you here. Welcome. Representative Fiorello. Hi, welcome. You're up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I am Representative Fiorella of Greenwich and Stamford. And with your permission, I would like to yield my time to Mr. Dan Martins of Novamont, North America as a subject matter expert. I am hoping that he can add substantive information regarding successful food waste composting with uh, minimal contamination. So thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Representative, for yielding your time and uh, and distinguished uh, distinguished uh, co-chairs, ranking members, and members. Thank you for allowing me to testify. Um, I'll be uh, giving testimony on House Bill uh, sixty five hundred two. So uh, I just like to say, uh, as a thirty five year Connecticut resident, I have experience in this space on the national, the North American, and the local level, and I'd like to share my comments on this bill. Um, I currently hold uh, a list of affiliations which are listed in my written testimony, so I won't go through them now, um, but I would like to specifically address the section five of this bill. I support mandating all pre-checked produce bags to be compostable. Um, on the surface, this will greatly change and reduce our state's plastic and carbon footprint. For example, a compostable replacement of the produce bag with a 40% plant-based content, one for one will lower our state's carbon footprint by 2000 tons. However, this is not the greatest benefit. Uh, this legislation will put food scrap collection tools in the hands of residents. This means that everyone can participate and most impactful for our urban areas where most of the food scraps are. And it allows all economic levels to participate in our state's organic diversion programs. Without a collection bag, people will not participate this is proven locally, nationally, and internationally. Without a compostable bag, micro haulers, so critical to these food scrap diversion programs, will have difficulty with curbside programs and composters will have to contend with microplastics. This legislation supports getting food scraps from the kitchen to the, to the processor. This logic is in line with international legislation and today only compostable produce bags are allowed in the following countries. France, Spain, Austria, Italy, others, and the cities closer to home, San Francisco, Mexico City, and others. This is very progressive environmental legislation. Connecticut would be the first state to pass it, certainly showing uh, environmental leadership for the history books. However, it cannot be passed without amending the certification requirements. These, as written, 
are national and internationally unrecognized as standard methods. They would undo 25 years of standardization efforts, rolling the clock back to say 1995. Um, please amend to the labeling and the testing methods as published in the strictest legislation uh, from model legislation in Washington State, California, and Maryland requiring certifications to ASTM D6400 and international TUV, TUV home compostable regulations. In addition, mandating that compostable produce bags can only be green or brown in color and all other traditional bags cannot be those colors. There is no reason for plastic bags to be colored green. This will streamline the sorting and composting operations, limiting contaminations in the overall process. And I say thank you very much for letting me testify. I beat the buzzer. You did. Well done, Mr. Martin. Thank you uh, for being with us today. Um, I would just ask um, I, if um, there is a reason um, why we think, and, and I am just curious about this, plastic produce bags um, need to be used at all. I mean, at this point, obviously, um, you know, this is something of a habit and tradition that we have across the nation. Um, and I'm curious um, from your standpoint, if um, you believe it's um, something that's necessary, a, a habit that, that would die hard um, if we didn't have these produce bags at all. And also if um, you're aware of any places that use uh, paper in its place. And I know that paper has um, some serious environmental concerns along with it as well. Yes, um, it, what I would direct is look at the EU single use products legislation. Um, single use products legislation at the European level, not country level, um, uh, exempts produce bags as far as a single use item. Um, what they do is they would, would, would agree to using them as a compostable product as opposed to plastic. This is why the legislation in Europe has gone this way. And the reason they do this is because they are used for food scrap collections. It's a very simple tool. Um, it can be uh, used uh, you know, by anybody. It's inexpensive. However, it does not prohibit people from bringing their own like debt bag if they'd like to use that, or from stores using a paper bag, because the legislations are so restrictive, even in the States, they say, um, must be a compostable bag. And under that, uh, paper bags do qualify as well. Um, that's up to a grocery store to decide. Um, it's not as practical as kind of going backwards, but I'm, that's the legislation. So um, it's, you, you, get, you don't take tools out of the hands of people for collecting food scraps, especially the low income folks in the urban areas where all of the food scraps are that you wanna get. And urban areas have a lot of problems as far as collecting, um, but you're not prohibiting people either who are in other areas who do not wanna use any bag and they have the choice not to take one. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, yes, it did. Uh, thank you. And uh, could you just um, enlighten us, uh, the committee, as to um, a, a cost differential between uh, the typical plastic produce bag, um, the grocery stores, and I, I'm talking about grocery store costs right now, uh, that grocery stores uh, currently have in their produce uh, and often the meat section, as opposed to a compostable bag that your company produces. Well, yes, and, and of course we don't produce the bags. We're actually the biopolymer manufacturer. So I, I can't speak for market conditions, but as a good general rule of thumb, um, you would say at least two times, possibly three. So that's the difference of the cost for a produce bag. And um, you know, like I said, that would be up to all the different companies around the that would make them. Okay. And are there um, currently grocery stores um, in the state of Connecticut that are using these bags? Yes. Um, the first, well, actually, there's a lot of health food stores and different small stores that use them. But the major chain that you would recognize in uh, across the country would be Trader Joe's. Um, Trader Joe's uh, it put a uh, non plastics. Um, and uh, produce bag, on, uh, sorry, compostable produce only based out of legislation that came out of Brookline, Mass. 
Uh, that then also uh, influenced San Francisco to pass the same ordinance uh, last uh, fall to, uh, to a committee of uh, 10 to zero from their environmental committee. So they were very proud of that. So yes, the stores play a part as well. One of the, and I, and I thank the committee again for their indulgence, but uh, one of the um, concerns around plastic bags is, um, you know, the impacts on our environment um, and what, uh, what that does, what they do for our, or to our wildlife, for instance. Um, and I'm not sure that compostability solves for that totally, right? Because if a compostable bag falls in the water, for example, um, how quickly does that compostable bag break down? And if it's not breaking down immediately, is there not still the opportunity for our wildlife to be entangled, our marine life to be entangled? Um, you know, in the, you know, we were just talking about helium balloons. Are there not those same opportunities with compostable bags as there are, um, you know, the, the typical bags that are currently being used? Yes, there's certainly, certainly, you know, we don't call it litter anymore because litter was something that puts, put it on people. We call it leakage. But um, yes, in the environment, if addressing specifically marine, um, we, we have tests, we've done studies in Europe. Basically our material is heavier than water. It has a density of 1.27. So it actually sinks to the bottom. Um, so it doesn't float on the top. It wouldn't get caught in a boat, but it could happen. This is not absolute. Uh, this is why we certainly don't want to have any products released into the environment. Um, as far as the material itself, it's a fairly weak material. It's not a polyolefin plastic. It's not bulletproof. It's not polyethylene. It's really, it's really made to have a short lifespan um, to which it starts breaking down in the environment. So uh, is it less potential to choke a marine life five years from now, 10 years from now? Uh, yes. But does that mean that we should throw it in the, in the anywhere it doesn't belong? No. That's why for it being used for food scrap collections, it's a very specific use. It has a very end of life. Um, you know, this stuff has been very vetted throughout the world. Like I said, Spain has a lot of coastline. France has a lot of coastline. They, San Francisco is the city by the bay. Um, it's been really looked at by greater minds than me. But yes, you certainly don't want anything to escape into the environment. But it won't last for long. In the ocean, it will be four to eight months or so. Four to eight months. And what's the breakdown, breakdown period on land? Well, the way the materials work is they have to um, basically be in touch with microbes in order for them to be eaten. So if they would basically in the environment, there's articles on this, it shows as short as like three months, if you're stuck in a tree, but I actually have one, you know, in my, by my home compost pile that I've been watching and it gets really frail and really breaks down in several months. But the international soil biodegradation uh, survey says that with a survey standard says that within two years, this is for agricultural mulch film where they're actually laying it on the soil. Um, EN 17033 says that all particles must be gone within two years. Okay. We appreciate your testimony. I see there's lots of hands up here. Uh, Representative Michelle, followed by Representative Mushin. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Dan, for testifying today. Uh, I, I appreciate the fact that you're saying it shouldn't be uh, released in the environment. One of the, uh, I have some experience with marine life protection and some of the marine life actually eats the garbage, but the plastic bags thinking they're jellyfish. So that certainly doesn't solve that problem, uh, the composting, because uh, several months in an esophagus doesn't save the uh, marine life or keystone species. Um, uh, how uh, I, you did say? Uh, how many months did you say it takes to break down in uh, in the ocean? Well, the the studies that were done by the Hydra Foundation, who's Christopher Lott, like you follow marine plastics, uh, you'll know his name. Uh, off the Isle of Corsica, they found that the shortest the shortest term was four months, and the longest was eight months. So. Um, Basically, you know, the product will sink to the bottom and at the bottom, it'd be at the 
ocean, it gets eaten by microbes, just like a dead fish would be eaten or an onion skin. It's viewed as food. Right. I mean, yeah. And so I, I guess I, I did mention that marine life will also eat it, uh, not microbes, bigger life, bigger than the plastic bag. Um, do the countries you mentioned earlier have uh, national uh, curbside composting services to collect the waste? It, it varies by country. Um, for example, uh, Italy is the most, has the best, you know, mostly Northern Italy does, um, Austria does, France has an infrastructure that's more home composting. So for them, uh, they're very important that they have home compostable certification for all the produce bags. Um, they also have carbon uh, goals. So um, France requires 50% uh, plant-based content. Italy does, Spain does not, Austria, uh, is at 40. So it really depends on what the goals and the infrastructure is for the country as to the most appropriate um, product. But they all use the, basically the same compostable standards. Merci. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you, you, Representative. Uh, Representative Mashinsky followed by Representative Boer. Hi, Mr. Martins. Uh, Morning. I wanted to ask you, doesn't, don't the composting services give out the compostable bags when you are part of their service ter territory? Um, it depends. Some of them do, um, some of them do not. It just depends. Now, for subscription services where you're actually paying, um, they usually do supply bags, at least the ones that I know here in Connecticut. Uh, but uh, if you're trying to get it mass uh, participation, uh, food scrap collection, which would be needed to get to the 500,000 tons of food scraps we have, you have to put tools in the hands of the people. Now, produce bags are fairly thin. They're like leaves. They really are, uh, you know, they, they break down very quickly, but they're good for in a spot. Or if you have the wherewithal to go buy a box of, say, you know, like a bio bag, 20, you could still do that. You can still get your favorite compostable bag or have them supplied but you need to supply tools readily and easily in the hand because if you don't have a way to collect the food scraps and take it to the curb or to your uh, collection bin, they'll go in the trash. And that's just, and that's not my opinion. That's just from almost three decades of this happening throughout Europe and the United States that people won't participate if they don't have a, a tool. And the best tool so far has been a compostable bag. Okay, well, my, my concern obviously is that if you distribute these to households as the uh, Blue Earth and companies like that do now, then you know the bag will be used for composting. Whereas if you sell it in the store, in the, in the food section of the store and people bring it home, it may or may not be used for composting. It may also end up in uh, hanging from some tree or down in Long Island Sound where it'll be for four months minimum. Yeah. So the other, the other system seems more controllable to put the bag into use where it will be compostable if you tie it to the composting service rather than have the consumer bring it home where they may or may not use it for composting. So that's, that's my hesitation about, you know, just distributing them through the grocery store where they're, they're just another plastic shopping bag to some people who are not composting. Okay, well, the only thing I'd say that is that unfortunately that's, that's one of our problems with scale. Um, the only composting programs that we have are really very limited and they're very, they're paid services where you have micro haulers bringing bags. Um, this is really, like I said, this is very progressive legislation that looks 10, 20 years down the road. Um, if you look at the deep goals, I mean, their plans really look like they're they're like 10 year goals. So how do you plan for that? And how do you take plastics out of the environment, but still give people tools for composting? So that's, that's where you, you have to look, but yes, by today, if you wanted to draw that as a line, I could understand that, that logic. Okay. I, I should say, I can agree with that logic. That's better. Okay. I just want the two linked together. If they're not linked together, I think we're just adding to the problem. If they are linked together and there is a composting effort going on in the municipality, okay, then it would work. But if it's separated and there is no service there, it's just another plastic bag that ends up the environment. That's okay. what I'm concerned about. Yes, it's, I mean, 
another conversation would be on bioplastic and compostable materials. It's not just another plastic bag, but I understand your concern. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Four, followed by Senator Miner. Madam Co-Chair, are you available? All right, let's move on to Senator Miner. Good morning uh, for another minute or so. Uh, so section five seems to me to um, create kind of a, an obligation to submit information and then have it analyzed. Um, are the products that you've discussed not only today, but in the past, are the, have those products been vetted previously? And is this level of um, scrutiny, I guess, here in Connecticut um, gonna be advantageous to moving forward with food scrap collections and the like? Well, what I would say is, you know, where we are today in Connecticut, you're re we're really jumping on the, the, the crest of where the rest of the world is after like 20 years of worth of understanding and vetting. The first compostable bag was made 30 years ago. I mean, it's, it's a proven tool for collecting food scraps for composters that works with the whole value chain. So this stuff has been looked at upside down and backwards. Um, and, and all of the very stringent certifications and, and laws that are put in place should be honored. I mean, we don't need to start reinventing the wheel and going back because you're leaving open uh, latitudes for people to say this, but that. Um, the current certifications, uh, which I would recommend to follow, like I said, Washington straight law are extremely restrictive and they're also labeling laws. Um, you need to follow international ISO standards, ASTM standards, the base being D6400. Then on top of that, you can layer um, home compostability. Then on top, you would layer BPI, which tests for PFAS. Uh, and then on top of that, you layer certification that says can only be used for food scrap collection. So you wouldn't certify like a shoe or a, a rake or something like that. But I'm all for the strictest of. When I see this these parts that I have uh, basically think need to be amended, it's because um, you're going against the, the rest of the world and even the rest of the state. And you're gonna set a precedent here in Connecticut, although applauded for being the first state to have this progressive legislation to support food scrap, you're gonna set a precedent that any community anywhere can set up their own standards and their own groups and then certify to it. And, uh, it's going to be an embarrassment, you know, at least, but I think it's dangerous. Now, I'm very deep into this. I'm what you call an expert by anyone else except in Connecticut, maybe. But um, I work in this for 15 years. And I really think that, you know, if we're not ready for food scrap collection to do it right, then we probably should pause and we should wait till we are. Um, but that's not what I hear from the our folks at Deep and all. There seems to be a real enthusiasm for it and I would support it, but let's let's do it the right way. I mean, really strictly do it the right way. I'm sorry if I got off on a sermonizing, but uh, I just hope I answered your question. Yeah, so I, I, I guess what I've heard the commissioner of DEEP in the past talk about the importance of getting food scraps out of our MSW and the sheer volume. And if we could achieve that separation um, perhaps we don't need the number of uh, waste energy facilities that we have in the state of Connecticut. We could do it another way. We could do it through digesters. Um, I think one of the benefits of this collection bag uh, is that for those that home compost uh, and don't want to leave a can on their counter, uh, it even gives them a way to do it. And you don't need to worry about whether it's going to fly off. I mean, I, I have experimented with these and I can tell you they don't last much longer than the vegetables I put out in my compost pile in them. Um, why do you think there seems to be such resistance? Uh, there isn't a grocery store that I've been in in the last year uh, that doesn't have uh, probably 10 or more rollable bags that you kind of pull a single bag off of 
Um, I have seen some that appear to be green. Uh, so I don't know if they fit the qualifications that the products you're talking about do. Why is that such a bad idea if we were to make them all um, compostable as opposed to what we currently have, which I don't believe are necessarily compostable. So when we talk about a four month deterioration versus some other time frame, the other time frame isn't even a part of the conversation, but I suspect it's much longer than four months. Yeah, I, I agree. Now, for I would look at some of the other testimonies. We have U.S. Composting Council, which has testified that you know compostable bags will bring food scraps. Uh, we have CHIC, which is the Italian Compost Council. Um, they've sent a testimony letter in talking about the use of standards and their legislation for produce bags. New York City also sent in testimony, Earth Matter, on um, on Governor's Island, who only will say that they, uh, you know, brings in food scraps um, and there's others. So uh, don't let my word uh, carry weight um, with you. Talk to composters and talk to people get the food scraps. Now, as far as like in stores, um, this would be part of my Washington state's model regulations, which I would follow because yes, there is a problem when you see bags that are green. That's why I said they're plastic, they're polyethylene. Uh, besides the proper labeling, the proper vetting, you need to have a something that people who are astute like myself can look at and go, oh, that's this. But you also need people who are not, who are just shopping to have the guarantee that if it's compostable, it's green, uh, it, it's good. If you're a hauler, you open up the bin and you look in it. If there's all the green bags in there, it's fine. If it's something else, it's not. If you're a composter, they dump a load. Uh, they don't look for little specks of uh, little things on it. They basically, uh, I'm sorry, logos and things. It's there, but they can look at it and see if it's green, we keep it. If not, we reject it. So again, this is very progressive legislation. It doesn't just force the compostable, compostable industry to comply, but it forces the plastics folks to comply, which is just like, you know, they're the ones that need to, to help us here. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Representative Porter. Thank you, Senator Cohen. And thank you, Dan, for your testimony. I'm just, I've been making notes. So I just want to clarify a few things, if you may, if you will. Um, so on the colors of the bags, are you saying we need to educate the public or we need to put something on the bags that indicates what type of bag it is? Um, you need to you need to have all the labeling. This is stuff that's been around for these labeling laws have been around time. They're not adopted here in Connecticut, but the proper labeling must be there. Um, BPI labeling actually even gives a certification number that you can go back and track who the manufacturers are and do that. So that's one thing. Now the overlay, which is progressive, is actually a dig, uh, designating a color for compostable bags only, which is green or brown. They're green for compostable and brown for paper because people can still use a paper bag if they like. Um, so you can educate folks or like they do it where sometimes legislation is much more um, mandated, just make all the bags that color. Like San Francisco, they say all, bag, all produce bags have to be green, but they don't allow any other bag. So it's just if it's a produce bag and it's green, it's compostable. So you're actually making it easier. All this legislation is to help consumers. It's not to help me It's to, or, or my company. It's to help consumers and help composters to take some of the confusion out of this whole thing, which um, it is confusing. And there's a lot of claims and there's a lot of bad actors. Composters are trying to do the thing. So this type of legislation, strict as it may be, is progressive, but it's necessary if you want to do it in a big way. Now, if you want to do food scrap collection in a very small way, we can just do, we can keep going. That'd be fine, but that's not what I'm hearing. So. Okay, thank you. And then you said that produce bags help collection in the city. What did you mean by that? Well, you know, I do a lot of work down in New York City. Um, you know, I, I worked with ESNY uh, they had three and a half million people in their food scrap collection program, you know, the same that we have in the total Connecticut as population. And it has all, in, when you were in inner city, you have space restrictions. Um, yeah, you cannot home compost. 
Uh, they have different ways of picking up. You've got to run trucks up and down the streets. And, um, and basically it also has to do with um, terms now used of like environmental justice, injustice, social justice, injustice. If, if you're out and have the, have the wherewithal, anybody can participate. However, it tends to be in the urban areas you have folks of lower income. Like I'm working on a project now at NYCHA housing in, in New York City. Um, for that, they have to have tools and they're not necessarily gonna pay to go um, buy a box of, uh, I won't say bio bag, but I just did, sorry. But that's the way it comes to mind. So you have to put tools in people's hands or they won't participate um, and they'll basically throw it in the trash. So that's why in the urban areas, um, you know, uh, San Francisco passed this. They have 900,000 people in, in the city that's more people in the city than we have in Connecticut. Um, and the urban areas are where the people are. The, pe the food scraps are where the people are. So if you don't set up a program to facilitate the urban areas, you will not get the, the food scraps. However, I'm a home composter. I'm a Yukon master composter. We could all home compost, but we're gonna get about a third of the volume that's out there. So it's really trying to gauge up to a, uh, a a larger vision, a goal of collecting that 500,000 tons. Okay, thank you. Um, and then one last question, your, what is your company's name? Uh, Novamont. And is your company the only one that makes these bags? No, no, actually there's, there's quite a, um, uh, you know, the, the first compostable bag was invented by a, a woman biochemist named Katia Bastioli, who, uh, did it 31 years ago. Um, she's the CEO of our company. So we're, we're here in Connecticut. Our CEO is Katia Bastioli. She's an international environmental figure. It'd be great if we still had the original patent for all this material, but we do not. Um, there are several companies that can make the raw material. Um, I don't know if I have to name them in Germany, in France. Um, there's Asian companies too that make them in China. Um, however, the bags can be made locally by any bag manufacturer. So uh, we just make the biopolymers and that was the Novamont advantage of basically creating these materials that never existed before. But of course, in 30 years, they've been replicated. Um, but no, we're not the only ones. Um, on one hand, it'd be good. But on the other hand, we're stopping food scrap re uh, recycling if we were the only ones. Thank you. So um, are any of those companies currently um, working within the United States? Yes. Yes. I mean, I'll, I'll throw the big gorilla out if you want. Um, we're a small company. I think we're the best. Um, but if you want to call on uh, BASF out of Germany, which is the world's largest chemical company, um, they'd be happy to, to sell you some material. So... <laughs> So we're not the, we're, I think we're the best, but there's also Kingfa uh, that sells into the West Coast. There are a, um, there's Kingfa, there's Biotech out of Germany, uh, which uh, their biggest customer is in France, um, but they all can come here, but we're collecting food scraps in all of plastics. You remember all of bioplastics worldwide uh, bioplastics is less than 2% of the plastics industry. It's very small, it's very niche. And really, unless you're collecting food scraps or doing something on an environmental level, it's, it's, there's not a lot of place for it. So uh, you have to wait for environmental things to, to grow before there's really a place for our products. Okay, great. And, and my questions around the other companies is I, I just wanted to make sure there was enough competition around the product that, um, you know, if we were to go forward with something like this, that we were, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't about yeah. one company. While we appreciate you being here, we want to make sure that there's, there's a market, right, for this. Yes, and I'm concerned about some of the studies that they talk about doing studies, because if you want to look at it a different way, um, plastic bags would not have to go through these independent studies. And however, it means that every single bag that was going to be sold in the state would have to go through an independent study us being the leader, I can certainly pass all these tests and pay the fees to go around the international systems, which would then give me a lock on the state because the other guys would not do it. 
Connecticut's just too small of a market. So um, um, although I would appreciate uh, your favoritism in the market, unfortunately, <laughs> capitalism does not allow that. Well, I appreciate your, your honesty and your transparency and I appreciate your testimony. You know, I, you know, I say this with every food scrap bill we discuss, it's, you know, to have 25% of our waste um, be food waste and on the front end having um, food insecurity across our state at um, levels in some cases that are higher than the national just does not reconcile for me. Um, and I think we need to do a better job of what we're purchasing and consuming in the first place, right? Um, so that's just my, my anecdotal comments, but um, I do appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, um, Madam Co-Chair. Senator Miner. I forgot to ask, um, <clears throat> so when, when these bags are digested, what is the residual? Is it a is it a plastic bead or some fiber that then uh, remains in the environment, or is it um, what is it? Okay. Well, for compostability, for standards, this is why international standards are important. Um, they basically have to be digested like a food source. So, what comes out of it when it's digested is CO two. Uh, what comes out of this biomass, which is basically the residual of the body of the microbe, um, and then water, and, and that's about it. It's similar to if you want to think of you eating a donut, okay? You eat a donut, you will energize the donut, you'll have CO2 come out of your nose, you'll have other material come out of the other side, and, and that's what's left. And then when you die, your body will be biomass. Um, it's 100% digested. I was thinking more on the lines of celery or lettuce, but uh, thank you. I will not judge. Thank you, Senator. Uh, Mr. Martins, can I just ask one other question? Uh, your, uh, the bags are, uh, in, in your case, are typically made of uh, vegetables, is that correct? Well, they're not, they're not made from vegetables, but you can, we try to use plant-based uh, chemicals. So the uh, what they are are they're they're a combination of alcohols and uh, acids that can be vegetable sourced or um, they can be fossil sourced. Now in our case, for our company, we try to make uh, in, basically we've invented chemicals from plants that didn't exist before. Um, now, for example, we have products that have sixty percent plant based, um, thirty. Um, our competitors have decided not to do that because that's not one of their core pillars of their company to get off of fossil source chemicals. They don't all exist. 20% of our company is still research and development. So uh, we're pushing the envelope. And this is why, for example, in France, they started with requiring 20% plant-based. The next year had to go to 30 to 40, and now they're up to 50. So um, same thing with Italy. Um, and other countries because they're trying to lower the carbon footprint of these materials, of, of all plastics. And unfortunately you can't do that with traditional plastics, but it's just another, um, it's another benefit of working with biomaterials. So can you uh, tell me what uh, approximate uh, the percentage of plant-based chemicals that are used in your product as opposed to the fossil-based? Sure, it, like I said, it depends. But for commercial, the highest level that we can do commercially is about 50%. Uh, we can do that all day long. For uh, agricultural uh, mulch film, which they use in Europe, uh, the, the organics group requires 60%. But in general, I think that everybody could do about 30. So it really depends on whether the state or the entity wants to push a uh, lowering carbon footprint uh, agenda with these products by forcing uh, higher, just like EPA uh, uh, car regulations for emissions. Um, but that's really, it just depends on the entity. But yes, we could do more, but that's about it. That's, that's the state of the art. So they do still, even with the, at the 30% standard, they contain those uh, sort of 
pressure based chemicals is what you're saying. Like there's really not at this point, there's yes, there's not the ability to eliminate those chemicals entirely. Yes, they're they're very simple chain uh, carbon molecules. They're 100% compostable. Uh, they get eaten by microbes. They're not the those same type of petrochemicals that you're thinking that are in plastics. They are not those. They are ones that have basically been made through green technology. Um, however, um, the technology is is only where it is. It's state of the art. But one day we hope as a company to have 100% plant-based material, but that technology doesn't exist. Although us, and I hope other people are also working on it. I, you know, I, I know that um, they're making strides in uh, hemp manufacturing and, uh, you know, hemp plastics. Is this something that's coming on the scene, um, you know, in, by way of produce bags, do you uh, suppose? And if so, would those be 100% um, plant-based? No, they could not. The technology didn't exist. You have to remember that what we use is the vegetable oils from the plants, from the seeds, even with hemp. Uh, they squeeze out the hemp oil. And then from that is refined into the chemicals that are plant sourced. So it's a little bit, it's, it's almost unfortunately a, a, like a, it's hard to say it's made from because the only way it'd be made from hemp is if you took a hemp plant and you weaved it together and got a produce bag. What you're using is you're using the oil and then the oil is refined sunflower oil. Um, we use the cardoon in Europe, which is a weed. Um, uh, we, but really you're getting the oil and then you're breaking down the oil into acids and alcohols. It's a little bit of chemistry, but I don't want to mislead you as well and say, yes, we could do that. But um, um, I love the hemp farmers just so I don't disparage them because they are a big, big user of our compostable mulch film here in Connecticut and throughout the States. The young guys want to get off the plastic and they really support the industry. So. Well, I appreciate your testimony, Mr. Martins. It seems to me that the best solution is that people bring their own produce bags, but uh, apparently we're not there yet in the, in the state. So um, we'll be considering these alternatives and I appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much. And thank you to the committee. Thank you. Uh, and Representative Ann Hughes, welcome. I'm sorry I, we didn't see you initially and, and you got bumped a little bit, but appreciate your patience. Welcome. Thank, thanks so much, uh, Madam Chairwoman and ranking members of the Environment Committee and my esteemed colleagues. I'm here just to basically champion rah-rah um, uh, support of SB 62 and act uh, concerning the important trade of the big six African species and also in support of HB 5030 and HB 5794. And really I'm urging us to, in this moment, to face the climate crisis at our doorstep. And that includes all of these are interconnected, right? And to urge the Environment Committee to really take the bold, boldest possible steps to both uh, preserve the biodiversity and, and that's the big six and ending um, you know, trophy hunting in Connecticut and, uh, but also sharply curbing our climate uh, and carbon emissions. And I love this conversation about how to policy drive behavior change, right? In the face of this climate. Um, and we are really talking about trading convenience and, and uh, modernizing to face the, the modern climate crisis at hand. So both all of these bills before you today, um, you really have a choice of how far to expand these measures to, 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 really, um, to really create an urgency to the crisis we're facing. Um, uh, and in lieu of convenience to look at impact-based behavior. When we did the plastic bag um, ban, actually people's behavior changed pretty quickly. So I think, I think you're right, uh, some of the members speaking to the public will around changing behaviors, changing practice to um, both eliminate uh, carbon emissions and, and, um, and uh, food waste and to um, 
and 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 again protect our biodiversity protect the interconnected habitats of our endangered and threatened species and recognize that um you know the plastics is as much of a threat as as trophy hunting quite quite frankly uh, uh, across the globe right now we're all com connected and we're all connected by the climate crisis at hand so i urge you to take broad and um, bold action uh, during this session. Thank you so much, Representative. And just to clarify that the uh, big six bill is SB 925. Oh, did I write that down wrong? Sorry, thank you. Yes, SB 925, I, I definitely wanna champion that. I think, uh, I think Connecticut public is really ready for that. And that's really modernizing, really how we, how we treat this for um, entertainment and profit and to, you know, restore protecting um, our uh, wild species and that and their habitats. Thank you, Representative. I, I don't see any questions um, from the committee at this point. So I appreciate you being with us today and your testimony. Thank you very much, Co-Chairwoman. Have a great day. Be well. All right, next up we have uh, Chris Edge from the town of Berlin. Welcome. Thank you so very much. Um, <clears throat> I'm Economic Development Director for the town of Berlin, um, advocate of creative reuse of properties as well as traditional, non-traditional solutions to move communities ahead. I'm speaking today on behalf of Bill 6496. With the support of this committee, Governor Malloy and Governor Lamont, the state of Connecticut has invested over $500 million in the brownfield assessment and remediation in the last decade. This has brought many properties from blighted and vacant to vibrant and again paying taxes. This has been a wonderful thing, but with environmental remediation and development, contaminated soil becomes not just a reality, but what to do with it becomes a major undertaking. Trucking out of state has become a costly venture and makes some projects untenable. Bill 6496 would create a pilot program for the reuse of treated soils in industrial and commercial zones. It would provide the state of Connecticut and firms within our state the ability to reuse this soil as fill. This soil, again, would hit the RSR standards within DEEP's guidelines, and the cost of this treated soil will be much less than clean fill, which at present is the only option to use if you need to raise a level of a project. As was said, this bill is the support of DEEP and is actually one of the bills that retired priorities for the session. I do want to say thank you so much for uh, Commissioner Dykes, Graham Stevens, and, and one of your former associates, James Albus, uh, who's now up in the commissioner's office for their hard work on this. This was truly an effort between state government, local government, and the private sector, because it is important for all of us, considering the investment that the state has made. In Berlin, we've been working with the developer for three years on a few properties which encompass over 70 acres, are industrially zoned, but have over a quarter million dollars in back taxes. This property is unlikely to move in any direction without the assistance of this bill. This firm has already received approval from Inland Wetlands and our Water Courses Commission, but they need to raise portions of the site to make this work. This reclaimed and treated soil is the method by which they can make this happen. If this bill goes forward, we're able to get into it with this particular developer. At the end, we're gonna have 15 acres of heavy industrial land on a rail line. Um, almost unheard of in Connecticut, will be great for Berlin. Uh, I would ask your assistance to move this legislation to the floor as it will benefit communities throughout the state, not just Berlin. Soil reuse is a logical additional step that would save money by allowing treated soil to remain here in Connecticut for provision or excuse me, beneficial reuse rather than being shipped out of state. Again, uh, I'm on the local side on the ground. Um, I so appreciate what this uh, committee has done and, and I really hope that uh, 6496 will be something that you'd be interested in supporting getting to the floor. Thank you so much, Mr. Edge, for your testimony. It's a, a really interesting proposal. Uh, we started to see it coming together last year and uh, good to see it. Um, you know, before the committee uh, this year. So I appreciate your, uh, your working together with the agency on this and uh, we'll see what happens as we move through the process. I don't see any questions from the committee at this point. Uh, so I uh, appreciate you being here. Great. I just want to say one last thing. I just I want to uh, say thank you to you, Senator Cohen, as well as uh, Representative D'Amico, who was the uh, former uh, co-chair um, both of you have been tremendous, worked very closely over the last couple of years, and just appreciate your effort and, and being open to different possibilities, especially when it comes to something like this, which is 
non-traditional, but hopefully can be a great benefit to our entire state. Thank you. Appreciate Thank that. You. Be Thank well. You. You, you as well. Thank you. All right, next we have uh, Deb Zinnett with the Connecticut Town Clerks Association, followed by Charles Rothenberger. Good morning. Good morning, welcome. Thank you. Um, hello to all Senator Cohen, the distinguished members of the Environmental Committee. Um, I'm a member of the East, Haddam, or I'm the East Haddam Town Clerk and a member of the Connecticut Town Clerks Association, and I appreciate the opportunity to testify on House Bill 6504 an act concerning animal welfare. Section 10 of this bill expands the fee exemption for a dog license to the owner or foster family of a discernment service animal. It's noteworthy that the proposed legislation specifically removes the reference to dog, which raises concern that licensing of other animals is contemplated either now or in the future, although that's not the subject of this testimony. CTCA supports the intent of this bill to provide a waiver of the license fee for a service dog utilized to assist its disabled owner as defined in statute. It also suggests significant modifications relative to section 10. Particular, the documentation requirement notated for the temporary placement of a service animal must be expanded to one that's been permanently placed. Assurance that the licensing is to remain restricted to dogs only. Please define the term service animals is it the intent of the legislature to require licensing of animals other than dogs that serve in this capacity? State law, state law dictates what town clerks can and cannot do when issuing a dog license. As with a free fishing license, although the customer may indeed have a disability and a doctor's note, the specificity of the law dictates what we can do for issuance. Um, please put the same controls in this in with 6504. Um, we're worried that clerks would be tasked with arbitrary decisions and those will vary from town to town. It's my understanding that Connecticut has no recognized certification process or registration list of service animals. It would seem appropriate that the nature and temperament of a service animal must be evaluated prior to having it serve in this capacity. And there would accordingly need to be documentation attesting to same. Again, this proposed legislation has requirements for the registration of a service animal temporarily placed, but not permanently. Well-trained service animals are often placed around the globe, yet an online certification can be obtained for the fee of $39.95 on the internet. Is that something the town clerk would need to honor? And additionally, and to be consistent with prior CTTA, uh, can't talk, to be consistent with prior Connecticut Town Clerk Association testimony, Whenever dog licensing statutes are discussed, we're compelled to point out that the statute that's presently in place is long overdue for an update. However, to amend or ex expand a flawed system is questionable. Most municipalities report that only a small fraction of their dog population is licensed. The statute as it is written continues to punish those who license late, um, but poses no consequence to those that never license, it, license at all. We're concerned that this legislation could be a gateway for another agenda which we're concerned would have a significant impact to the town clerk's office. Thank you for your opportunity to be heard. Thank you, Ms. Danette. Um, so is your position that, um, that we should be taking further action to um, um, impose uh, additional fees uh, or fines on those who do not license their animals? That we would leave entirely to you, but as a clerk, if someone comes in to license their dog three months late, I have to find them. But if someone never licensed their dog at all, there's no consequence for that individual. Right, right. And service animal, I mean, I guess, um, I, I believe, and, and you know, I'll have to check in with LCO on this, but I, I believe that we do have uh, definitions of service animals. Um, but your concern goes beyond that, right? That, that, that there are um, some sort of arbitrary uh, denotations that can be obtained through the internet or various other sources that could be brought in and um, you would have to discern whether or not those would be valid. Exactly, for the puppy, they, they mentioned having it come in a, you know, a service organization, say a Fidelco, for example, the organization placed the puppy, they were going to provide the paperwork. That's good, but what do they do about the permanently placed dogs? That's not there. 
that's not written in the legis in this proposal. Okay. So, All right. I really appreciate your testimony today. It gives us uh, something to contemplate as we um, move forward on with this language. Thank you. I don't see any other questions, so uh, we'll move right along. Thanks again. Be well. Thank you. Uh, our, our next uh, up on this testimony list is Charles Rothenberger from Save the Sound, followed by Jason Patlis, followed by Annie Cornish. Charles, are you with us? Gaia, do we, do we have- uh, I have him in the room. If you'd like, you can move on to the next person on the list, who is Jason, is number 17, if, if uh, number 16. Charles, are, are you with us? Um, I am, yes. I, I, I apologize. I am, uh, I am multitasking, as I'm sure all of us are. So, yes, uh, yes. But I, I did hear my name, so, so I appreciate it. You are, you are up, and uh, Jason will get to you immediately following Charles' testimony. Uh, very good. Um, so I just like to say, um, uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, uh, Save the Sound uh, is weighing in in strong support of SB 931, um, uh, which is really a, uh, a simple bill with huge potential benefits. Um, this proposal builds on Connecticut's successful history of implementing California's emission standards for light duty vehicles. Um, as uh, you're aware, federal law recognizes California as a leader on vehicle emission standards and explicitly authorizes California to adopt uh, standards that are more stringent than uh, the federal minimum standards. Uh, and also expressly authorizes other states, such as Connecticut, to adopt California standards. And we have a long history of doing that. Uh, we first adopted California standards for light duty vehicles in 2004. Um, that has resulted in significant um, reductions um, in uh, pollutants and has also assisted with our ability to meet our uh, climate reduction goals, um, since we also adopted California's uh, zero emission, emission vehicle standards. Um, as you're aware, the transportation sector accounts for uh, nearly 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, the heavy duty vehicle sector are actually responsible for a disproportionate share of those emissions, um, in addition to being major contributors to both NOx and fine particulate matter. Um, so cleaning up these emissions from the heavy duty uh, and medium duty vehicle sector is particularly uh, important, um, and especially important for the health of uh, low and moderate income populations uh, living in our dense urban communities um, and along our major transportation corridors. Um, so there's a, a lot of benefit uh, to Connecticut to one, um, explore whether these uh, standards actually uh, will provide the benefits that we, uh, we imagine they will. Um, and if so, um, moving forward to adopt them just as we have um, so many other standards. Um, and, uh, you know, again, important to point out that uh, we have a long history of moving in lockstep with uh, California on these standards. Um, it's not a new process for us. Um, we've been doing it for decades um, and is something that uh, we are well versed in. So uh, we uh, thank you for the opportunity and we urge the committee uh, to favorably report the bill out of committee. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. I, um, I actually don't see any hands or, or any questions for you. So I just want to take the opportunity to really thank you for all of the work that you have all been doing. You've been um, significant contributors to the language that we have been crafting for many of these bills. Um, and you particularly have an environmental justice lens when you are working with us um, and you do your homework and you bring information to us as legislators to help us craft uh, the best legislation we can for the environment for Connecticut. So um, I, I know I can say on behalf of all the committee members, thank you for everything that you're doing. Well, well thank you. And I apologize for the lack of video, but you, uh, you caught me by surprise, so. <laughs> That's okay. And I apologize for my dog barking in the background. No, um, no so we don't have any questions or any other comments. So we're gonna thank you for your time. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat>
Um, so Gaia, I'm sorry, I just want to make sure I'm reading this right. Is Corinne, is Corinne the next uh, speaker? No, we have number 17, which is Jason. Oh, Jason Patlas? Yes. Okay, okay. So our next speaker is Jason Patlas, followed by Annie Hornish. Right, thank you so much. Good afternoon, Coaches Cohen and Bora, Vice Chairs, Ranking Members and members of the committee. Uh, as you just heard, my name is Jason Patlas. I'm the President and CEO of the Maritime Aquarium at Norwalk. I'm delighted and honored to be testifying before you this morning uh, or this afternoon as it is now. Uh, I'm testifying on two bills, raised Senate Bill 925 and then raised House Bill 6502. Uh, with respect to Senate Bill 925, I'm uh, here on behalf of not only the Maritime Aquarium in Norwalk, but also Beardsley Zoo and Mystic Aquarium. Uh, your first question might be why the three of us are testifying on this bill, uh, which relates to six species native to Africa, uh, including elephants, lions, leopards, rhinos, and giraffes. Beardsley does not have any of these species in its collection. And I can guarantee on behalf of Steve Cohen at Mystic and myself, um, we, the aquariums are not looking to uh, import these species and add them to our collection anytime soon. So um, the first reason we are testifying on this bill is because we uh, support very strongly the intent and the goal of this bill to protect wildlife in their natural habitats and to deter cruel and inhumane treatment of those animals, whether they're endangered or threatened or not, um, what goes on with trophy hunting and what goes on with um, treatment of these animals is very important, uh, regardless of their, um, of their condition um, as endangered or, or otherwise. Um, as institutions accredited by the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, we adhere to the highest standards of animal care for those animals within our collection. But we also, all three of us in zoos and aquariums around the country, um, prioritize conservation of wildlife in their natural habitats. And so for us, this bill is consistent with uh, our general philosophy. Uh, the second reason we're testifying on this bill is because we'd like to respectfully request one very small, narrow change. And that is on line 25, there is a reference to museums being accepted from uh, the prohibition. And we would like to add zoological institutions in front of museums for the same reason that museums are excluded. Um, specimens of these animals, um, uh, biofacts as they're called, are very often used by zoological institutions and aquariums for the educational programs, for the work we do with our guests and our students in particular. And uh, while we don't have any of these particular species in question, um, the prohibition um, would give us pause and we would like to be accepted so that we can include these specimens uh, as part of our educational programs in the future. Uh, and then with this change, we'd be very pleased um, and eagerly supportive of the legislation. Uh, with respect to uh, moving on to House Bill 6502, with respect to that legislation, I'm representing the Maritime Aquarium um, on our own. And we are in strong support of this bill. Uh, the facts are sobering and mind bending with respect to plastics. That includes the volume, the scope, the uh, longevity of plastics in the environment, particularly in the ocean, and in particular, the impacts of these plastics in the ocean. Uh, we heard a little bit about that from prior witnesses. Uh, the short goal is to divest society of these plastics and to do it as completely and as quickly and as best as we can. The starting point for this, as the legislation provides, is in single-use plastics and in, um, and in unnecessary plastics for which there are cost-effective substitutes. We are leading by example at the Maritime Aquarium in our cafe We've done away with plastic straws. We've done away with plastic utensils that are not biodegradable. In our gift shop, similarly, we do not have stuffed animals with any plastic um, uh, stuffing, um, nor do we have gifts that are wrapped in plastic. Uh, we have really eliminated plastic as much as we can, almost entirely, from what we do in the aquarium. Uh, but leading by example is not enough. Earlier, we heard that policy needs to drive behaviors. And so this legislation is really critical. 
we can lead by example at the Maritime <laughs> Aquarium. I just want to interrupt for a moment because the timer went off a few moments ago and just want to let you know you're out of time. Okay, uh, well, it's only to uh, endorse the legislation uh, and to uh, say that we need to not only lead by example, but we need the state to lead by, uh, by its policies. And with that, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your testimony. I see some um, hands raised for some questions. So Representative Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, uh, Mr. Patlis for testifying today. Um, I actually have some uh, background at the Maritime Center uh, from when I was a student, uh, going marine sampling with my teacher, marine biologist, Jerry Capriol, uh, on the RV Oceanic. Uh, sampling uh, 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 marine water and counting diatoms and silicoflagellates per drop. But uh, on, on that, my, my position might be a little bit different. You mentioned an amendment that you would like to see in SB 925. And as I, I'd really appreciate your education department. Uh, you have like a section on top for younger kids. I think it's been uh, changed, but I don't think any of these animals will fit there. And, uh, and uh, so my, my question to you is you mentioned the word educational and I, I, I just wanted to ask what, uh, what you called educational in terms of one of those species uh, being in captivity and uh, why would there, if you can give me more valid points for uh, this sort of amendment, because I, I really it's troubling to me, but I'd love to hear about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think there are two ways to answer that question, um, Representative Michel. Uh, the first is that if there is a, an, a recognition that museums have an educational role to play and that use these biofacts as part of their educational programs, then by extension, zoological associations, aquariums um, should have that same opportunity as museums do. Secondly, with respect to what we do with those, um, with those specimens, I can tell you here at the Maritime Aquarium, uh, we have uh, first seal skins, for example, that we use as part of our education programs uh, when we talk about the need to protect seals in the wild. Uh, when we talk about um, what these seals are like, what their bodies are like, when they see them in our um, seal exhibit. Uh, and so um, the skins, the artifacts, the specimens that come from um, wildlife are really critical for, uh, for our educational programs. Um, they provide something tangible and they provide a way for us to, um, to expound on the lessons that we have. Um, I can go into more detail, but I'm respectful of the time of everybody uh, uh, in the hearing. No, I, I, appreciate I appreciate it, Mr. Uh, Pat. I just, I just have a, a concern that um, an, an animal in captivity doesn't act like it does in the wild. I understand uh, viewing the animal, but that could be done without the animal, uh, especially with today's technology. So, uh, but I appreciate your answers and I'm done. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, if, if I may, Madam Chair, there's, uh, with respect to the uh, provision in line 25, that provision relates to only artifacts and specimens of animals. There is a section uh, elsewhere in the bill with respect to live animals. Um, and there already is an allowance for zoological institutions in that. That is line 61 through 63 in that legislation. Uh, again, it already incorporates zoological institutions. So we're looking for something that's uh, comparable and that's appropriate and consistent in line 25 and uh, section sub D. Thank you for the clarification. Thank you, thank you, Representative Michelle. Senator Cohen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for being with us today. Uh, Jason, really appreciate the testimony. Um, I am, um, I just have a question about the plastic. You know, obviously um, we're trying to be mindful if we do in fact move away from uh, the traditional plastic produce bags are compostable bags in fact the answer to that um, or do they also contribute to the problem and I would just ask um, I know you know your um, aquarium has done extensive research on, on microplastics and, and their harm um, 
you know, knowing that potentially this is the lesser of two evils, uh, but still, you know, I mentioned uh, to our previous uh, testifier that I was concerned about marine life. You know, if, if something takes four to eight months to break down in the ocean, aren't we still presented with the same issue that, um, you know, traditional plastic produce bags present, um, you know, and, and so I just, I'd love to have you weigh in on that a little bit and, and, and tell me what your thoughts are and, uh, you know, what you'd like to see us do as a committee. Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I was um, I, I was struck by the intensity and the specificity of the uh, discussion earlier. Uh, I, I was um, I was afraid that I might be asked to opine on that, and I, I will confess that uh, I would need to get back to you on an answer more specifically on biodegradable plastics versus uh, plastics now and uh, the kind of phased approach that uh, that was discussed or studies that was that were discussed. Um, I, uh, I would not be in a position right now to offer um, uh, insight directly to your question, but I will say this, that, uh, and that is to underscore the um, deleterious impacts, the devastating impacts that exist on wildlife, and the fact that there are more and more studies that show that those microplastics wind up being bioaccumulated they, um, they're being seen in oysters and bivalves uh, in their entirety. We then harvest those oysters and bivalves for our own, um, for our own, um, uh, our own diet. We are seeing them show up not only in the digestive tracts of finfish, but we're seeing bioplastics accumulate in the tissue of finfish. And that again is what we eat when we, uh, when we eat fish. And so there is a very, um, strong and growing understanding of the direct impacts of microplastics in the ocean and, uh, and us directly in a way that we did not know previously. With respect to what all of the solutions are, um, again, uh, my testimony really is to push the General Assembly and this committee to move as quickly as possible um, and to look at the science, to look at the experts, but to move as quickly and as comprehensively as possible to eliminate plastics from the environment. Again, taking into account all of the things that um, transcend my own purview, but fall into yours in terms of cost effectiveness, um, technical feasibility, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I can testify that we would encourage you to move as quickly and as effectively and as comprehensively as possible, taking uh, a broader suite of concerns into account. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Appreciate that. Thank you, Senator Cohen. Representative Dillon. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for your testimony. I. This is really kind of simple. Uh, did you submit your requested amendment in writing to the committee? Uh, yes. The testimony that I looked at didn't have it in it. And uh, I simply wanted to look at it, you know, for consideration. Uh, thank you, Representative. Uh, there were two written testimonies submitted last night at about 8 p.m. Uh, the first was on behalf of the Maritime Aquarium alone, and that was on, um, you know, and that was on the um, uh, HB 6502 on plastics. There was a second testimony that was submitted on behalf of Beardsley, Mystic, and ourselves for um, SB 925 and the uh, specific um, request that we're making uh, is in that testimony. Great, thanks a lot, bye. Thank you, Representative Dillon. Senator Minor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you for being here uh, to testify, albeit remotely, um, I would be interested in uh, perhaps some of the information that you have uh, with regard to microplastics in the tissues of fish. Uh, I'm, I, I can understand how they might actually uh, show up in an oyster, uh, especially being a bivalve. Um, uh, and I, I guess just for the record, I'm pretty sure uh, microplastics uh, as an issue were uh, pretty thoroughly discussed earlier as part of that uh, compostable plastic bag 
compostable bag discussion. And I'm, I am, uh, I was pretty convinced based on my questioning that microplastics do not exist once the bag has been consumed. Um, so I just wanted to say that, but I, I would be very interested in the uh, microplastics uh, information. If you could send it to the committee, that would be helpful. I'd be delighted to. It's not work that we are doing at the Maritime Aquarium, but it is literature in the scientific community that um, that we've used and that I personally am familiar with. So I'll be happy to pass that on. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Miner. Um, I'm just looking. I don't see any other hands or questions. I just had a, a follow up question to Bill 925. So are you suggesting that we carve out for educational components? Can you just clarify that for me again? Sure. The, um, uh, the language right now on um, uh, basically provides, uh, and this is uh, section one, subsection D, that right. starts on 17. Um, unless such activity is otherwise prohibited by federal law, the provisions of subsection B shall not apply. And then it's got a number of um, conditions, number one, number two, and then- um, We have the museums. Uh, right, exactly. And then, and then it will say on line 25, a such specimen of big six African species is to be part of a temporary or permanent collection of a museum that has a tax exemption from the, uh, from the IRS. And so we would ask that zoological institutions be included in addition to museums, such that if we've got any specimen of those species um, as part of a temporary or permanent collection, um, uh, that that's allowed. Uh, I think by extension, we would have those specimens in our collection for educational purposes. I don't know, I cannot speak for Beardsley, um, but certainly for the Maritime Aquarium and Mystic, uh, I can't speak for Mystic either. The Maritime Aquarium would not likely put those specimens on public display. We would be using them as part of our broader educational program. Um, but the exception here is not necessarily limited to education. So, um, so are you talking about um, existing specimens or you or new? specimens in the future that come your way you want to be carved out? Yeah, future. I, I think, um, I think um, th that none of the three of us have any existing specimens right now. I think one of the concerns we had, well, I know one of the concerns we had with this legislation is the precedent that it sets for limiting the way we can do our educational programming, the um, uh, the tools, the products, the accoutrements that we could bring into our educational programming. Again, um, we operate consistent with federal law. We operate consistent with state law. We operate consistent with the accreditation standards um, that are provided by the Association of Zoological um, for Zoos and Aquariums. And those really all hold us to an extremely high standard of care and practice in what we do. And um, and so we want to make sure that um, legislation does not necessarily limit us in ways um, that, um, that would undermine the work and the missions of the organizations. So you've gone all this time without the specimens? Uh, that is correct. I, again, I cannot speak for Beardsley. I could speak for, um, I could speak for the Maritime Aquarium. So you've been able to conduct your educational programs without the specimens to date. That is correct. Uh, I will note that we do have specimens um, for educational purposes, um, skins and things like that, of animals that are not necessarily in our collection. So, so, um, so accepting them in the future, do you think that encourages the hunting? No, not at all. I, I think hunting stands on its own as um, as a practice, as a culture. Uh, you know, tro trophy hunting um, is really very separate from um, the way museums and zoos and aquariums uh, conduct their programs, acquire wildlife, whether it's specimens or to um, Representative Michelle's points, live animals. Again, those standards are very, very strict. Uh, we adhere to them um, 
And, uh, you know, and they, they, I think, provide the safeguards that this bill is looking to do in terms of um, preventing cruel and inhumane uh, actions and activities that affect wildlife, whether that wildlife is endangered or threatened or just wildlife that we want to uh, respect. Got it, okay. And then just one other question on the specimens for the educational purposes with all of the technology that we have now, is, is it possible to provide the education, you know, with the 3D technology and um, a more modern way and a more, um, you know, sophisticated way? Um, I don't know about a more sophisticated way or a more modern way, but I can guarantee seeing kids uh, engage with live animals or with animal parts and products. There is nothing that is quite as immediate or as evocative or as frankly um, impactful for young kids to be able to touch and feel and see immediately this connection to nature. And, and I've seen kids get that connection to nature, whether they are petting a seal skin that we have on display as we're talking about why they're endangered, why they need to be protected, or, um, you know, or touching a, a live um, tortoise that we have on display as well. I mean, that, that connection is visceral, it's immediate, it's impactful. There are also lots of studies that show how kids, uh, how live animals and how um, those accessories really add to an educational experience for a kid that is transformative. Okay, but, but, but just to confirm, you haven't, you haven't had those specimens. You, I, I can speak 100% confidently your, with the, the Maritime Aquarium. I, I cannot speak on behalf of Beardsley and Mystic, but I can get you that answer. Okay. I just, I, I guess my point is I'm, I'm just trying to reconcile if, if we haven't had them as specimens, right? And you've still been able to provide education to the children. Do we really need them? That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. I, I understand the question. I, I think to the extent there is an exception already in the bill for zoological institutions elsewhere, and the fact that this provision has an exception for museums, to some extent, uh, you know, we're looking for some legislative drafting consistency that doesn't shortchange or um, undermine the work that we do, um, you know, by um, uh, inadvertently or or okay. or unnecessarily. I appreciate that. I did see a hand up, but then it went down. So maybe you answered their question already. Oh, well, back yes. up. <laughs> Representative about, Michelle, are you, is your hand up? Yes. And it was just for a, a clarification that, yes, the bill is about uh, trophy hunting and, and, and that uh, the, uh, there's already uh, protections for animals being imported from other countries. So my, 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 I would say the clarification here is if there would be live animals as described in the bill, there would already be in the US uh, and from other institutions. Uh, that, that's all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you, Representative Michelle. I don't see any other questions. So I wanna thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. As always a pleasure and an honor to be with you. And thank you again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Annie Hornish and Gaia, I see number 20 is Corinne. Is there a speaker number 19 or did? Yeah, we have a speaker 19 is Nicole Wong and speaker number 20 is Corinne. And you'll see them over in the, um, in the panelist list. Uh, they'll, they'll be okay. numbered there too. <laughs> okay, I see 17, 18, 20, but I know 18 is Annie Hornish. So Annie, are you with us? I am. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Co-Chair Cohen, Co-Chair Borer, Vice Chair Slap, Vice Chair Gresco, Ranking Member Minor, Ranking Member Harding, and honor Honorable Members of the Environment Committee. Uh, my name is Annie Hornish, and on behalf of the Connecticut-based supporters of the Humane Society of the United States, I'm here to testify on the following bills. First, we support Senate Bill 925, the Big Six Trophy Hunting Ban. Today is World Wildlife Day, so this bill is especially timely and appropriate. The second bill, um, we support House Bill 6502, which intends to reduce the volume of plastics in our environment. Uh, this waste is detrimental uh, to the environment and wildlife. Finally, uh, the third bill uh, is HB 6504, an act concerning animal welfare. 
Uh, we have common ground with the Department of Agriculture on, on two major components of this bill. First, we support reduction to rabies quarantine period uh, from six months to four months. That aligns Connecticut with the best practices uh, nationwide. And secondly, we support, strongly support increased funding for the APCP's feral cat grant program and the increased reimbursements to veterinarians. Uh, this is a hugely successful program by the Department of Agriculture with a near 100% compliance rate. So we'd support, we'd support even increasing that percentage higher if that's possible. Um, but we do oppose uh, the rest of the bill. I first wanna thank the Department of Agriculture for meeting this morning to discuss this bill and for their willingness to ensure that community, uh, community cats are, or feral cats are included. Uh, the redefinition of animal is problematic because it dramatically narrows the scope of animals to which animal control officers can intervene, like when wildlife is injured and suffering, uh, for example, like with car hits. Uh, it would also cause inconsistency and confusion in our statutes and with law enforcement. Uh, currently, there is consistency uh, in so far that an animal is defined as a brute creature. I think most people understand that brute creature means non-human animal, but I do agree that a better, more modern term uh, should be used. Uh, th this redefinition would create two definitions of animal uh, in statutes, one for domestic animals and an ACO's handling of them, and one for the cruelty laws. Uh, but animal control officers obviously deal with both sections of law regularly. I understand that DEEP has jurisdiction over wildlife matters, but it's common practice that the local ACOs and police uh, are who, the, the ones who usually are the first responders for injured wildlife. If a squirrel is injured, many ACOs will get them to a wildlife rehabilitator or a veterinarian. And that's because DEEP lacks the staff. They can't be expected to be first responders everywhere. So it's common practice already for ACOs to help wildlife. Uh, ACOs even undergo training in solutions to wildlife conflicts, training that uh, applies to their professional credentialing. I would suggest that we move forward with the solid common ground we have and uh, get everyone at the table uh, this summer, uh, uh, Department of Agriculture, DEEP, animal welfare groups, wildlife rehabilitators, and hammer out a single definition of animal. This inconsistency and confusion is moving us in the wrong direction, and it's away from the compassion and empathy for wildlife. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Annie. Thank you for all that you do and all of the information that you bring to us. And sometimes, uh, sometimes letting us know sometimes things we've missed. I don't, I don't see any questions or any hands. I'm surprised. Yeah, there he is. Uh, <laughs> Representative Michelle, uh, I didn't see in the queue, uh, but Representative Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair. And sorry, I'm, I'm dealing with two loaner computers. My, my own computer during a, a Zoom meeting last week, uh, its battery is inflated, so I just, would caution my colleagues with the double zooming and triple zooming uh, uh, to look out for uh, your okay. safety with the computers. We all um, have challenges. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, Annie, uh, can, thank you for testifying. And you're, you're such an amazing uh, advocate and you work really hard on all the animal issues in our state. Um, can you go over again the uh, definition for what the current definition for animal is? Because I'm, I'm still I'm perplexed by maybe if you have any additional comments on this. Yeah, um, sure. Thank you for that question. Um, well, currently, animal is defined uh, in two areas of statute. Uh, one is Section 29-108A, and that uh, defines animal as a brute creature. Uh, that applies to chapter the, the chapter it's in, which is 530A. And it also applies to the cruelty statutes, uh, which is 53-247. Uh, um, and, and that's written into um, chapter 530A, but it refers to another chapter. So that's one definition of animal. And the second definition of animal uh, is in the chapter that's being discussed here. Again, it's any brute creature for all of chapter 435, which, which is the, the, the bill being discussed here today. But obviously, another concern we have is that if we read this redefinition, it would make it easier in the future to similarly redefine animal cruelty under the general 
animal cruelty statutes, which is 53-247. And that would vastly weaken uh, the scope of anti-cruelty laws. Uh, currently, they cover all animals as they should. That cruelty laws, any animal applies. Uh, but, you know, because, you know, all animals have the capacity to suffer. And so that by definition, they can be a victim of cruel treatment. So it should be that way. And, and that's why I think it's really important that we get a, get a definition that works and a definition that's consistent and easy to apply and easy for uh, law enforcement uh, to understand when they read it. Thank you. And Annie, just uh, one more question. Um, what are your thoughts on the um, proposed redefinition of uh, poultry? Oh, uh, yeah, um, that's another area. Um, well, we, like I said, we'd support two sections of the bill that we're 100% in, in agreement with the Department of Agriculture on. Um, but the poultry definition, that's another example of where confusion could be added. And, and I understand the Department of Ag and DEEP have different um, oversight, but when you're defining poultry, one way for the Department of Ag, because in, in, the, in regards to food production, and then with DEEP, that's a separate use for like, for example, um, pheasants, uh, hunting pheasants versus, you know, raising and eating a, a bird or poultry. That they're, they're suggesting poultry is redefined to apply to uh, animals used in food production. But it's really, um, I, I think it, it adds a lot of confusion to statutes to do that. And I think uh, to, just for keeping things clear, um, it's best to, to, to get these definitions hammered out to have one definition of each of these categories. Thank you for raising this valid point because this, I, sometimes the statute's already confusing to me. <laughs> so <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much, Annie. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Michelle. You have another um, question or comment from Senator Minor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, there are a number of sections of this bill. One of them uh, talks about aligning language for regional animal control officers with local animal control officers. And I think attempts to clarify when um, a neglected animal may be found to be so cruelly treated, uh, malnutritioned, or the number of other circumstances around line 159 through 162 it talks about them being euthanized by a licensed veterinarian. Is that a section of the bill that uh, you support? Um, uh, uh, thank you for that question, um, Senator. Um, right now, no, only because that definition of animal has changed. And as a practical matter in the field, if an animal control officer comes across, say, um, uh, a, a red raccoon was hit in the, in the street by a car or something like that, and that animal was suffering or a deer, they should have that, they should know that it's safe for them to dispatch that animal. And right now, and that's why I don't uh, agree with the rest of the section because it's all predicated on that definition of animal. And so it would, it would uh, limit the first responders, police and ACOs from acting because they'd have to contact deep who would have to come out and that's just not practical. And when an animal is suffering, we wanna end their suffering as soon as possible. So that's why, that's why we have problems with that. In a normal situation with uh, a dog brought in or something um, where a licensed vet is, is um, uh, you know, analyzing that or looking at that animal or assessing the animal, uh, yes, that would be agreeable that while if the vet's doing that, they would be the proper ones to euthanize. Um, well, the section that I was talking about didn't didn't deal with wild animals. It was dealing about whether or not um, an animal in a human's care was being uh, humanely treated and applying for permission to euthanize uh, that animal. Uh, so my question is, uh, do you have an issue with the court being able to make a decision when it comes to a neglected animal? Um, being uh, humanely euthanized. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, and I'm, maybe I'm sorry if I'm misreading what the proposed language was, 
but I thought the definition of animal would apply to the entire entirety of the bill. If I if I am wrong, um, if I'm wrong, uh, and also the, the application of wildlife is my is my main concern. It, did I answer you? And I'm sorry. If I'm not well, sure. I, I'm not sure. So I, I'm just trying to be sure. So if the if the definition of animal was left alone, and the language allowing for a regional ACO to apply to the court for euthanization uh, by a licensed veterinarian, you'd be okay with that? Um, well, not if it would require the veterinarian to have to come to a scene of a car hit for, for wildlife, because that's not practical. They would never be able to get out there. If this is a neglect case, it depends. I guess it would have to depend right now. I'm sorry, I'd have to reread that carefully carefully there. Um, but I, my understanding is that if that's a hindrance to putting an animal out of suffering, uh, my answer would be no. And I'm sorry if I'm not answering that question. Uh, I'm not sure okay. I understand what it is. That, no, thank you. Okay. Thank you. You're all set, Senator Miner. Yes, for today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I don't see any other questions or any other hands up, Annie. So we want to thank you for being here and for all your uh, contribution to the conversation. Thank you very and, much. And all your advocacy for our animals. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Our, um, our next speaker is Nicole Wong, who will be followed by Corinne Bolding. And Nicole Wong, we don't have on, so we'll go with number oh. 20, Corinne Bolding. Unless she... I'm actually, um, oh, wonderful. Actually, can you hear me? Oh, there you go. Okay. Hi there. Good afternoon, Chair Cohen, Chair Borer, Vice Chair Slap, Vice Chair Gresco, and the ranking members and other members of the Environment Committee. My name is Nicole Wong, and I'm a campaign manager with Green for All, a program of the national social justice nonprofit Dream Corps. I manage our team's clean transportation and transit equity advocacy to promote the adoption of clean cars, trucks, and buses in neighborhoods overburdened by transportation pollution. I'm here today to express strong support for SB 931, an act concerning emission standards for medium and heavy duty vehicles. Connecticut's participation in the joint regional medium and heavy duty MOU last July was an important step toward reducing emissions from the most heavily polluting vehicles in the state. Now, Connecticut has the opportunity to also reduce pollution even further by adopting the Advanced Clean Trucks Rule, or ACT. Um, the ACT rule builds on the MOU to set a more ambitious sales target to transition the state to zero emission medium and heavy duty trucks. Although heavy duty vehicles make up only 10% of vehicles on the US roads, they are um, the source of close to 30% of global warming emissions and 45% and 57% respectively of NOx and PM 2.5 pollution. That, as you know, um, increases the risk of asthma, heart attack, death from COVID-19 and other serious health issues. This vehicular pollution especially harms low-income communities and communities of color who are more likely to live near heavily trafficked areas such as freight hubs, ports and highways. Across the region, communities of color are exposed to 66% more air pollution from vehicles than white communities. And according to the 2019 state health assessment, Hispanic and black residents in Connecticut visited the emergency room due to asthma at almost five times the rate of white residents. Adopting strong medium and heavy duty vehicle standards is imperative to begin addressing the disproportionate pollution burden that communities of color have historically faced while improving public health and economic outcomes across the state. For instance, reduced asthma rates um, alone can mean fewer hospital visits, reduced medical bills, and fewer missed work and school days. Additionally, transportation is the largest source of greenhouse gas emissions in Connecticut. Um, therefore, bold policies like California's medium and heavy duty rules are crucial to reduce emissions from these vehicles and advance Connecticut's climate goals. As more and more zero emission medium and heavy duty vehicles become available and battery prices drop, adopting the standard will be crucial to marshal the needed investments, infrastructure, and planning for a pollution-free transportation sector. So in sum, please pass SB 931 to reduce health disparities, reduce greenhouse gas pollution, and spur the market for zero emission vehicles in Connecticut for years to come. Thank you so much for your consideration today. Thank you, Nicole. Well done.
Thank you for coming and testifying before the Environment Committee. I'm looking, I don't, I don't see any um, raised hands in the Zoom. Any questions? I sounds like you um, eloquently um, conveyed your thoughts, and there's no questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, our next speaker is Corinne, followed by, hang on a second. So Gaia, I'm sorry, I have Corinne number 20 and then Janine number 22. Is there a 21? I don't have 21 in yet. Oh, okay. All right, so our next speaker is Corinne, followed by Janine. Thank you. Chairperson Cohen, Chairperson Bohr, and members of the Environment Committee, my name is Corinne Bolding, and I'm honored to be here to testify before your committee. I'm a first year student at Trinity College and chairperson of Comperg Zero Waste Campaign. We as a student advocacy group strongly support passage of HB 6502, use of per certain polystyrene products, availability of single use straws, release of certain balloons and compostable nature of single use produce bags. In America, we have a stuff problem. Our economy encourages us to make, use, and toss at the greatest possible speed, which results in the using and disposing of an estimated 300 million plastic grocery bags, 70 million styrofoam cups, and half a billion plastic straws every day. About a third of the plastic trash ends up in rivers, lakes, and oceans, while most of it sits hundreds of years in our landfills. One of the worst forms of this plastic pollution is polystyrene or styrofoam. It's toxic, breaks apart easily, and never really goes away. Nothing we use for, for a few minutes should pollute our environment for hundreds of years. Long-term, we need to move beyond plastics. It is not enough to recycle and reuse. We need to stop creating unnecessary and harmful waste in the first place. A concrete step we can take is to eliminate unnecessary single-use products including bags, straws, and foam containers. These single-use products, which are used for an only an average of 12 minutes, sit in our landfill for up to a millennium and represent the most absurd but preventable sources of plastic waste. Cities and countries all over the world have already imposed bans or purchasing fees on plastic bags, straws, and EPS products, which have proven to be effective in reducing waste. Alternatives are plentiful that do far less harm on our environment. We applaud the committee for the work it's already done to phase out single use plastic shopping bags. And with this bill, we support your work to take the next step. The move towards banning polystyrene takeout containers and prohibition of single use straws in full service restaurants continues our progress towards zero waste society. Comperg is excited to be releasing our Slash the Trash webinar this coming Earth Day, April 22nd, 2021. And we urge the committee to deliver this bill to the governor on Earth Day 2021 to join in celebration. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I look forward to continuing our work on this issue and in the General Assembly for the rest of the session. Thank you, Corinne, and thank you for your great testimony. And clearly you have a passion for something we all on the committee have um, an interest in. So. We very much thank you for being here. I actually don't see any questions um, in the queue for you. So with that, um, have a great day and thanks for, thanks for coming on virtually. Thank you. You're welcome. Representative Bohr, I do see that Randall has just joined. So I pr promoted him to be speaker. Okay. Randall Collins. Okay, so our next speaker is Randall Collins followed by Janine. Randall, are you, um, so is Randall in the panelist room? Let me go get him. Okay, go find Randall, because I, I see he's in the, in the other room. Yes, he left the room, and then I had to rename him by his number and just promoted him in. Got it, got it. Okay, Randall, you have been promoted to speaker. Uh, thank you very much, I was... I'm still working my way through the Zoom world and I figured that was that was on me. And uh, my name is Randy Collins, uh, advocacy manager with the Connecticut Conference of Municipalities and here to testify today in support of uh, 
House Bill 6497, an act concerning stormwater authorities. Uh, CCM strongly supports this bill. Uh, it's an issue that we've been working on for many years uh, since the uh, we had worked uh, over over the course of a year uh, drafting um, and coming to an agreement on the current MS4 stormwater permit. Uh, the new permit uh, is, contains a significant uh, number of expansions from the uh, the older permit, uh, and these are unfunded mandates uh, that were put on our, our on our municipalities. Um, knowing that this is the uh, the stormwater permit is what we have, and it's not going away. Uh, we are looking for the ability to create a stormwater authority program to allow municipalities to give them another another means to fund uh, paying for this. Uh, uh, the requirements of the permit. Uh, this would expand upon um, Public Act 07-154, which had created a pilot program for four municipalities, which were Norwalk, New Haven, uh, New London, and Stonington. Uh, it created a pilot program to allow those four municipalities to create a, an authority. Um, and we were simply looking to expand that language to all of our municipalities. Uh, currently, New London is the only one that has a stormwater authority. Stonington uh, is actively pursuing a stormwater authority. They were, uh, things have gotten a little off track because of the COVID. Um, but the bill simply would create uh, a process by which municipalities, you know, could by local option enact a stormwater authority. Um, that authority could then set rates based on the amount of impervious surface a property has. The rates that the authority set would then have to be further approved by a local town council uh, board of selectmen, whatever that local governing body is, um, as a secondary measure to make sure that those costs are in line. And any money raised by a stormwater authority would be required to be spent uh, the mitigation of stormwater. Um, as I said, this is something we allow four towns to do, uh, towns and cities to do, and something that we would like to see expanded to all of our municipalities. Um, we have put in, um, there is language that we Almost got this passed in 2019, we ran into a problem. Uh, this bill does address it by defining who, what a municipality is to make sure um, that our 169 towns and cities are, are clearly defined as the, the authorities, the, uh, the enabling authorities that can create these um, uh, stormwater authorities. Um, as I said, I've written, submitted testimony and be happy to, uh, uh, to answer any questions. Thank you, Randy. And I know that you, CCM, has worked very hard on this issue and something you've been working on for quite some time. Um, I don't see any other questions, but um, I'd like to, oh, I do, Senator, uh, let me defer to Senator Minor, and then we'll come back to me. So Senator Minor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here, Randy. Good to see you. Uh, <clears throat> so I want to, I guess, put my small town hat on for a moment and ask you whether uh, CCM uh, views the creation of a stormwater authority in communities that have no collection system uh, for treatment, similarly to the way they do others that have uh, perhaps a combined collection system or are anticipating a standalone stormwater collection system that would then be attached to a treatment facility. Um, how does CCM view these? Are they different or are they all the same? Uh, currently, I believe it's 134 towns have a storm, have, are under the requirement of the MS4 permit. Um, and that those towns are established, are set based upon, it's a federal, it's a federal requirement uh, based on the Census Bureau of who gets it. So Willington, Torrington is not under the MS4 permit, but Willington is um, because of a population density that they have from Yukon. So I think, and, and we know that that number is going to, to grow. We've seen that the requirements set down by the feds. Um, so we've encouraged our, our smaller municipalities to start being proactive in, in taking some of these stormwater mitigation measures. Um, because when we work the permit, that they can get credit for that disconnect standards, uh, the two percent disconnection standards that are within within the permit for work previously done. Um, so we think if if municipalities establish, even if they're not under the requirement, they're still treating stormwater. Um, and you know if they think that they need the the additional resources that could be provided by a stormwater authority, we wouldn't deny them 
uh, that opportunity, but it's a local option. Yeah, I think a lot of towns, uh, I mean, I grew up in Salem, Connecticut. We don't have water sewer. Um, I don't think that this is something that they would put onto their residents. But when you look at a community, you know, like Stanford, um, and the requirements that they're under to meet the stormwater permit with 11,000 catch basins, um, it, it's a tool, it's a resource that they could definitely use. Um, and I know that New London has it and, you know, it applies it across the board. So um, I think our goal is to provide municipalities a tool. We don't want to set a one size fits all. So it could be something very minor. The other point is we encourage, you know, our smaller towns, you know, the idea that, hey, if, if a municipality would, or if a property was to, I'm going to repave my driveway and that if I, you know, put in, you know, made it impervious, disconnected as a residential homeowner, that there could be a, a discount. And I believe that that's the way New London does it, that there is benefits of, of disconnecting. So the idea is we're not looking to, we'd rather see the disconnection put into place than raise the revenue. Um, because what we raise is not offsetting, not fully offsetting the cost of, of what it's going to take to meet the MS4 permit. I don't know if that quite answers your question, but. <laughs> well, I, I guess, so I think this is an important conversation for us to be having. Um, and I, I just want, I guess, to be clear in my mind that as we're having this conversation, it's not contemplated that this would be uh, only for large municipalities, that it's conceivable that a community like Cornwall <clears throat> could institute a stormwater uh, authority and um, program. Uh, there would have to fit within certain guidelines, but it's not really uh, limited to only municipalities above a population of, you know, pick a number. It's intended to uh, provide municipalities with an option uh, to provide the financial resources, uh, which would be garnered through some user fee, presumably similar to a sewer treatment plant and a sewer collection system. Uh, but for those communities that may find another way of of doing it, just a straight discharge into someone else's remaining property. Uh, it's conceivable, I guess, listening to you, that they may not be part of that program. There may actually be opportunities to exempt them from what might apply in a business district as opposed to townwide. Um, yeah, as I said, the way the I, I base a lot of what what I'm. What do we work off of? We look at what New London did. As I said, they charge about, I think it's, they have a couple different rates and it's charged at like $7.50 per thousand square feet of impervious surface. Uh, that data is pulled uh, from the, uh, the GIS mapping uh, that they do. Um, the New London actually assesses that, that fee scale to all real property owners and they assess it to themselves. Um, so the city of New London based on their impervious surface will set, will write a check to their stormwater authority, which goes towards mitigating uh, you know, the cost of MS, the stormwater runoff, uh, flood reduction efforts. So, you know, as I said, if I took a town like Salem and there no sewer, you know, no, limited if any stormwater runoff, I don't think that the town would adopt that. Um, and that's something that each individual town would take into, a, you know, into account. But if you have a town, a city like Stanford, you know, or as I said, Stonington is currently looking at doing this, um, which is going to be a mix of, you know, they've got some commercial areas, they've got some highly built up residential, and they've got some very rural side. But, um, you know, the requirements of the permit, it's, as I said, it's not based on a town's population. Um, you wouldn't think that Willington would be in and Torrington is not, but it's a, a federal standard based on the, the latest census, which is going to change. Um, when, the, when the new numbers come out. So you could have small towns conceivably along the 395 corridor, you've seen it pushing up from Norwich and pushing down from, um, from Worcester, Mass. Uh, and eventually those, they're gonna catch more and more of those towns. But um, so as we talk to those towns, like you can look and is this coming? Probably. And if it is, what, do you, um, what are you gonna need to do to meet the, the requirements of that permit? Um, because if you're not in compliance, then you're going to be subject to, um, you know, a consent order 
you know, from, from deep. So, you know, we're not being recalcitrant when we do this, but it's, it's a very expensive permit. Um, you know, there's a construction permit, there's a linear permit for DOT. So uh, this is simply something we're not looking to rewrite the, the MS4 standards. Uh, we're not looking to create, you know, new retention models. We're just saying, hey, you know, if you, based on the amount of impervious surface, you know, we, this is the fee that we need to collect and meet these standards. Otherwise, it just simply goes onto that property tax, which is on residential homeowners. It's not, you know, we're not looking to lay a new tax. We're already paying the bill. We're just looking to, to find another way outside of that property tax to pay. Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you, Randy. And thank you for those answers. I don't see any other questions in the queue for you. So we want to thank you for your testimony and all your work on this uh, issue. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Janine, followed by Kathy Flaherty and Mary Ann. And uh, okay. Our next, so we'll start with Janine. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Representative Borer. Uh, good afternoon, Representative Borer, Senator Cohen, uh, ranking members, vice chairs, and honorary uh, environmental committee members. My name is Janine Bear Getz. I'm here today representing BYO Connecticut, which is a citizens coalition of 21 Connecticut towns reducing plastic waste. Um, I'm here today to support uh, HB 6502 and to register um, a couple of um, considerations that we would like you to um, consider going forward. The first is under section two, like the uh, plastic bag bill that was passed in 2019 and in section one and section three of the current bill, there are allowances for ordinances that are already exist or ordinances that are stricter or str as strict or stricter than going forward to be protected. So we're asking the committee to consider adding that language under section two of 6502. We have currently four BYO Connecticut towns with uh, actually five with um, current active legislation that address polystyrene and straws. And they currently all meet or exceed the um, legislation um, in the section two. Um, also, we have two other towns who are currently working on this. So this leads me to my next point and ask is, for, it seems like a lofty ask perhaps to expand straws to stirs, cutlery and other um, as defined here, um, accessory disposable foodware, which is very common definition used around the country in styrofoam and uh, waste reduction bills. And this will just expand the strength of what we're trying to do here, the intentions of reducing waste. So, um, again, several of our towns, two of our towns that already had legislation passed on this um, address cutlery, address um, straws, stirs, and so forth. Uh, they do not in any way conflict with the, um, your section three as far as upon request, and they recognize um, people with disabilities and ask for So those are all covered there. Um, the last point that we're asking for consideration on is um, section five, which is the study. And we have three specific points that we'd like to address with the committee. We applaud the committee's um, innovation in studying these materials. They're coming out fast and wildly. So it, it's great to um, hear from uh, Commissioner Holbert today and also from Soundwaters and Maritime Aquarium about the effect that these new products uh, might have on our maritime and our oyster beds and uh, a strong economy that uh, we rely on in, in Connecticut. So I would uh, ask that the study, I know an earlier speaker said that some of these bags don't break down from for four to eight months or 730 days or two years. And this study seems very limited in its scope as far as 180 days. We would ask that you extend this um, study to um, allow for the um, breakdown of the 
compostable produce bags. We're also, also asking for you to add a section into uh, five, section 5A2-147 at the end of the composting test period. The final report shall include an analysis of decomposition materials, including but not limited to heavy metals, known carcinogens, and endo, sorry, endo, oh my gosh, disruptors, you know what I'm saying. Um, so in, in previous work that I've done on toxic chemical reform, uh, we know that fragrance and proprietary uh, so, um, formulas are often loopholes for industry not to divulge their contents. So we feel as though this is a great way for, uh, for this science study to actually see what's left over when it um, composts or decomposes or what have you. Um, and lastly, on this um, same section, we're asking for um, this study to also make sure that at least five different environments are uh, examined, industrial composting, home composting, anaerobic digestion, soil, and fresh and salt water. As you all know, you know, we sit on- I just on want to interrupt for just one moment because I rang the bell a few moments ago oh. and I wanna make sure that we can wrap up. Sorry, guy. Yes. So sorry. We have one of the most important estuaries in the country and we need to take care of it. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your work always. This is a, a glorious bill and we're very excited to support it. So thank you for your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Sorry, I was on mute. No. <laughs> I was thanking you and um, before I turn it over to Representative Michelle, I just um, curious, what are the four towns that are BYO? Uh, Norwalk, Stanford, Westport, Handum has a straw and Groton also. Yeah, and that's through local ordinance. And these are through local ordinances, yes. Okay, great, terrific, thank you. Representative Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Janin, for um, testifying today. Nice to see you and thank you also for your amazing work. Uh, for all those years. Um, uh, you mentioned uh, section two. What, so in Stanford, we have a really good ordinance that uh, it took uh, a short time, but it did take some time to train, to train the population to get accustomed to these changes. What would this bill do as written uh, to uh, the ordinance of the city of Stanford? Well, thank you for that question, Representative Michelle. We are hoping that, um, there will be consideration uh, for the committee that the previous or ordinances that are already in place will be protected. Because as we do know, it takes a while for people to change behaviors. And once they do, they seem to be set on those. So um, I know Stanford has one of the strictest um, ordinances out there for polystyrene and straws upon request. Right. So this bill current, uh, as, as written currently would take away uh, the ordinance that we currently have in effect in Stanford? So it's an interesting because in section one, there's a provision and in section uh, three, there's a pro pro provision to protect or ordinances that are already in place. But in section two on polystyrene, there is not. Okay. So we're asking for that to be added into that section as well. Okay. Well, that sounds great. Plus, I know the city of Stanford is working on other bands currently. Yes. And we certainly don't want the good work uh, to protect the environment to be uh, uh, um, lowered by uh, a state bill. We want to make sure that if a municipality is also involved and with broad bills that they should be able to. Thank you very much, uh, Janine, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Michelle. Thank you, Representative Michelle. Senator Kasser. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Janine. It's so great to see you and thank you. thank you for the decades of work that you have already committed to, um, to our environment and protecting uh, the state's natural resources. I know that you always do your homework on economic impact and that's part of the very thorough process that BYO does uh, when, um, when drafting and advocating for local ordinances. So I just wanna ask you, from your experience or any data that's been collected from the towns that, that you've already um, had success in, what has been the economic impact of these ordinances? 
Um, thank you, Senator Kasser. Good to see you. And so the economics, so we're looking at twofold. So when we started um, with plastic bags four years ago, um, that was right on the brink of the wave of the waste crisis. It was um, certainly some towns and cities were already recognizing deficits in their waste management budgets because of the uh, lack of landfills or incinerators or actually the transportation of moving all this waste. So we continue to examine the economic impact of the styrofoam removals and also straws and so forth. But uh, most of these ordinances are less than a year old that are in place. So we will continue to examine the impact, but we know that they've been removed from the waste stream, which you know, it lightens the burden on the waste municipalities because they are, you know, every renegotiation of transportation and waste management as opposed to waste reduction is costing our towns money. Thank you so much. And what about the economic impact on local businesses? Is this a hardship? Are they easily able to accommodate it? Does it maybe even have an economic benefit to local businesses? So that's a great question. Thank you, Senator Kasser. So we um, we have seen um, in, I know in Westport, there was some concern at first as far alternatives and price increases, increases but many of the um, restaurants have come back um, seemingly. We've also done an audit in our town in Greenwich. We've already seen that a majority of them have already have already turned over their inventory and are not providing um, because of COVID, but they're not providing any accessories without um, request. And also um, many of them have already decreased or, or has, have decreased or eliminated polystyrene as well. So this is the wave of the future because of municipality budgets. And I know uh, there was a study done about the 35% uh, of millennials, I think, are making conscious decisions of where they eat and how they shop based on the um, environmental stance that the restaurants and, um, and um, retailers have. So I hope that Thank answers Thank you so question. much. That's, that, that's what I suspected, that it actually um, is an advantage, a marketing advantage and, uh, and will draw customers, um, environmentally conscious, socially conscious customers. And then, you know, as the data, um, as the data comes back and, and maybe you know the fear subsides, it will become standard practice as, uh, as many other things have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kasser. And um, before we go on to, um, we do have a question from the Senator. I just wanted to clarify for some of the members that on the straw component of the bill, it's not an elimination of the straw. It's a, um, a don't provide, don't automatically provide it. So, you know, when you go into the restaurant, sometimes restaurants automatically put the straw, sometimes it has the paper on it, sometimes it doesn't have the paper on it, um, and they need to toss that away. So it's completely wasteful because they can't serve it to somebody and then take it back and reserve it, and, and a lot of people don't use it. So really it's uh, don't automatically give the straw out rather than ban them all together. So with that, um, Senator Miner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, the, uh, the leadership of this committee uh, grappled with um, how we were going to try and uh, package bills, no pun intended, and provide, um, you know, an opportunity to have uh, good conversations about what we think we can do uh, and maybe not spend a lot of time on things that we we're really unsure that we'd even have the bandwidth to do under the COVID environment, doing Zoom meetings and Zoom hearings mm -hmm. and the like. And so, um, you know, I, I say that in speaking, I guess, directly to your comment about adding uh, utensils and some other items to the bill. Uh, I, I remain worried that the public um, hasn't quite figured out how to engage government, um, people that are involved on a regular basis do, um, but rather than have someone be surprised, I probably would prefer to see those items left to another day for another discussion. Not that I'm necessarily opposed 
to moving away from them. Uh, in fact, there are some of the places that I've gone to eat, uh, they, they make it a point to tell you uh, that they're not really plastic utensils, they're something else. Um, uh, but you know, I, I just, I, I'd be uncomfortable trying to expand the language as you've suggested uh, for those items. Although, you know, I think we should have a conversation about preserving the local rights, especially when uh, there are some ordinances that may be stronger. Um, this plastic, and I wish I could uh, season myself to use a different word, uh, bag issue. Um, I think about a lot of the plastics that we use, clear film that we use, and the ways that we use it and wonder if we can't be moving, shouldn't be moving in a direction that is far more likely to deteriorate without um, developing microplastics in the ground and in the water. And that's what I think most of these films are. Uh, the gentleman that testified earlier talked about uh, the agricultural benefit of using these films as opposed to other films that are made out of petroleum-based plastics. Um, my interest in this topic is that the, the greatest problem we face is the 513,000 tons of food waste uh, in the state of Connecticut. And if we were able to provide um, as part of the food uh, procurement process, um, items that would almost decompose as quickly as the items that we purchased, uh, that's been my interest. Why is that a, a bad, uh, I guess, interest? Because I get a sense that um, continuing to um, study doesn't move us along towards uh, putting some of these products in place where they might actually benefit the long-term goal that we have. Thank you, Senator Miner, for your question. And um, I, I know I, I mentioned that the cutlery may have been lofty in uh, what you all were proposing, uh, but I did want to state that there are several of our BYO towns that already have legislation that address cutlery and, and those things that you get when you get delivery that you didn't ask for that you just immediately throw away. Those account for, I think it's 290,000 uh, tons of waste a year. So, um, I figure you guys were going for it. I might just add a few more things in. And uh, of course, it's upon request, as um, Representative Bohr um, pointed out about straws. So it, that we just wanted that language to also be upon request for cutlery and, and accessories. I know that Grubhub and Uber Eats are now changing their policies to ask before you get. So uh, they have opt-in programs to receive this type of waste. If you truly need it, you can get it, but um, they're no longer just sending the waste. Um, so it, it actually would be an advantage to your point of reducing waste in our waste stream um, to uh, when you were talking about food waste as well. This is just more plastic waste that cannot be reused. It's gonna be incinerated, landfilled, and we're running out of space and, um, and incinerators and so forth. So thank, I appreciate your comment on that. And I, I hope that you might reconsider. <laughs> uh, in regards to um, section five, uh, I'm so, I misunderstood. I thought this was calling for a study. So I, I think that, um, so I think you're right. I, um, the way the process works, the ranking members and committee uh, persons generally don't uh, direct how some of these things are drafted. And I believe um, proponents have uh, had contemplated uh, a more direct step to be taken this year. Uh, really trying to move us in a direction of replacing rolls of clear plastic petroleum-based film bags with a color-guided, color-coded, uh, decompostable bag uh, to move us down that road toward supplanting the uh, petroleum-based film products with something else, plant-based oil film products. 
at least yes. until we figure out how to wrap some of this stuff. Yes, and, and thank you for refocusing me. Um, so I would say just in that world alone, there are, are different feedstocks coming out and um, like uh, hemp that was mentioned earlier. So uh, there's corn, there's potato, there are all different types of feedstocks as well. So my understanding, this was a study to really study um, what the options are for consumers out there. I know I visited Whole Foods yesterday um, and they had green produce bags. So I just assumed those were compostable. Uh, after reading the fine print, they were not. So um, they were 100% fossil fuel based um, bags. So I, I would say that uh, BYO Connecticut is committed to educating our citizens of the state and we're also committed to reducing waste. So we will make a promise that uh, we will, during this study, we will communicate with citizens to bring their own produce bags. And then in regards to substituting bags in a grocery store and those rolls, that's not my business model. So I don't wanna speak for those stores because um, they would have to incur costs that I, I don't really have business speaking about saying that they can or cannot. And on another note, I know that in municipalities that are, road, are rolling out food waste programs, they are purchasing or giving away those food bags uh, when someone picks up their buckets. So that food waste scrap programs, they're going, they're, they're, they're fueling, people are allowed to use those bags. I know some people who work in um, and live in the city, in New York City, they have, um, compost in their in their homes, they freeze it, and then they have a bucket, a bucket at the um, bottom of their basement that they put their food scraps in. So I think this is a, a collaborative effort going forward, but um, I, so I, I don't know if that answered your question, Senator Minor, sorry, I'm very chatty. Well, I, no, no, and I, uh, and I certainly don't want to characterize your comments, so I won't. Um, I just, I, you know, I, um, I understand there's there's uh, some opposition to plastic of any color, and so um, it just this has intrigued me in that uh, as a gardener, as a composter, me too, uh, as an individual that knows that if I take uh, the other plastic bags and walk them out to my compost pile, they'll be there years after. I mean, eventually I have to fish them out of there and throw them in the garbage. Yes. I would prefer to have a bag um, that when my cucumbers and my broccoli stems are uh, deteriorated, the bag is gone too. And that's what I found out with this material is that uh, it really does work. And so I, I guess I'm still mystified by the opposition, but I understand it exists. And I'd like to think that humans uh, at some point uh, could differentiate between the two but I'm sure we're not gonna get there today. So thank you. And I really do appreciate your effort uh, and all the hard work you've put into uh, all of these issues. Thank you, Senator Minor. And yeah. I hope you recognize I'm not in opposition. I was just saying that I, we support the study. So yeah. I hear you, thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Representative D'Amico. Uh, th thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Janine, for your testimony and for your hard work. I appreciate it. Uh, you, you always give us, you know, good, good, knowledgeable, good information. So, so I, I have a question to follow up on, on Senator Miner's uh, uh, discussion uh, with regards to uh, uh, House Bill 6502, uh, specifically about the, the last section of the bill dealing with the bags. So th th did I read this incorrectly or did I read it correctly to say that this study is going to be done on uh, uh, on, on the, the, the product or products of, of one single company. Did, did I read that properly? I don't have the bill in front of me. Oh, uh, that was not my understanding, Senator D'Amico. It says that, um, that uh, they shall accept applications on behalf of manufacturers single-use produce bags for the performance of a study at the request of said commissioner, which is the Commissioner of Energy and Environmental Protection and to be done by the Connecticut Academy of Science and Engineering to determine if compostable single-use produce bag is available 
uh, for use that does not adversely impact the environment, land, air, and waters of the state. Okay, I, I, I thought, maybe I'm mistaken, I thought that earlier in that section, that last section of the bill, it said something about the, the product of, of a company and, and but, but perhaps I'm wrong and, and I guess I'll, I'll just have to go back and, and, and take a look. I might but, have uh, to that... read it as well, <laughs> but I don't think okay. it did. I, I think it was, it was saying it would be, um, it's open to applications and that the uh, commissioner may be, uh, uh, there may be the commissioner has at will to see who gets into the study. Um, that piece of it's a little um, confusing. Okay. W w would you would you recommend that 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 we d study more than just uh, one or two? Uh, would you recommend that we do a, a more comprehensive study? Yes, I would recommend that you did a, a more comprehensive study with different feedstocks for sure. Um, okay. Also, you know, after hearing Commissioner Holbert, I, I was very taken with his um, you know his concern, obviously, in aqua agriculture and the impact that has on our state economy. So I would even suggest this was not in my written testimony, but after hearing him speak today, that perhaps their um, commission is in somehow involved in this study as well, because they're directly impacted um, by this by these bags for sure. Um, so and especially if they don't. Um, composed or break down in um, water, certain water situations and so forth. It could be detrimental to our oyster beds. Okay, uh, th thank you. I, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. I, I don't want to take any more of the committee's time. Thank you, Janine. Thank, thank you, Madam you, Chair. Representative D'Amico. Thank you, Representative D'Amico. Senator Cohen. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, hello, Janine, good to see you as always. Uh, thank you for all of your and, and BYOCC's hard work. Yeah, as you know, I uh, work closely with the you know, BYO groups in, in my area and I'm just grateful for all the work that, um, that you all have done. Um, I am curious now, you've piqued my interest on this cutlery and accessories. It's, it's not something uh, we've talked about uh, too much before and uh, certainly is in line with um, some of the language in the bill. I, could you just lay out for me um, first how you said uh, the four, you named the four municipalities. Those were the, those that have the straw Ban, is that correct, or it would be upon request, or is that polystyrene and straw? I just I, I want to clarify: are there uh, the number of towns that have a polystyrene ban and the number of towns that have a straw ordinance? Thank you, Senator Cohen, for the question. Uh, so, um, Groton, Westport, Stamford, and um, Norwalk. Sorry. Uh, have polystyrene and straw upon request. Hamden, BYO Hamden has just um, a plastic bag ordinance, checkout bag ordinance and a straw upon request combination. And our, thank you for that. Are there other towns uh, that you are aware of that are uh, trying to move forward on either of the upon request language or polystyrene as a local ordinance? Yes, we have two additional BYOs that are working on um, ordinances right now. Uh, Greenwich is one of them and New Canaan is another. And um, we were inspired by Grubhub and, and Uber Eats to start including the cutlery and so forth. But Norwalk already has cutlery in their ordinance and so does Westport. Norwalk and Westport. And mm -hmm. when you say cutlery and accessories, can you just tell me what that what that would include? Yes, so I just ordered from a restaurant the other day, so I'm very familiar with the waste that I have uh, uh, compiled. Um, so when it came uh, with my food, there was a, a plastic tub of salt, there was a plastic tub of pepper, there were um, cutlery in a plastic bag, there was um, packets of um, sauces. So those are all um, what they call food disposable foodware that um, perhaps should be upon request or opt in to a program as opposed to just automatically sent or automatically given to you in the restaurant. Okay. 
And I, I mean, I think you know by now, as, as do most of the members of this committee, I'm a huge proponent of reducing single-use plastics and reducing waste. I do think um, the cutlery and accessories takes a little bit of education, right? Because the other items, if you don't have a straw, you can drink out of the side of a cup. Uh, if you don't have polystyrene, there's something else encasing your food. But if you get out of a restaurant and you don't have a spoon to eat your soup with, or you don't have a fork, so that presents a little bit more of an issue. How are those local ordinances, that, did they run education campaigns? Was there anything of that nature that went along with it? Yes, so they did run education campaigns. And then I, 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 sorry, I keep defaulting to Uber Eats, but they're one of the largest companies in the country doing food delivery at this time. So they're actually, you know, the ones coordinating a lot of deliveries for restaurants. Um, and they instituted an opt in program. And yeah. so Yes. It's, it's interesting because presumably with Uber Eats or the food delivery, you're at your home or an office where you might be able to obtain something like that as opposed to, um, you know, on the go. So I just just need to be thoughtful about that. But um, really interesting and I'm grateful for your testimony and grateful, uh, as, as I said, for all your advocacy and uh, bringing this uh, to our attention. So thank you so much. Thank Great. You. Thank you for your consideration and, and thank you again for HB 6502. Thank you, Janine. I just, um, I had a quick uh, follow-up question. Oh, I saw Representative Gresco. I'll, I'll, let me just grab my, get my questions out. <laughs> Those um, four cities that, that are BYO, where did um, the concept originate from within those cities? Do they have a strong sustainable Connecticut program? Do they have a council member that introduced it? I'm just, you know, of course we wanna pass this legislation so that it's across the board, but um, you know, for other like programs or, you know, components of this, this legislation that might um, not make it over the finish line. I'm just wondering how we can um, get more local ordinances across our state. Thank you, Representative Gore, for the question. Um, I think that it was a combination of um, mandates by the mayors of these towns to reduce waste, that it's affecting municipality budgets. I think it's um, also just in their, you know, their um, trying to provide a healthier environment for their citizens. So I feel as though it might be a, a combination of grassroots efforts, um, municipal efforts, and just an overall citizenship um, concern for many of these ordinances, as we have seen with the, the checkout bags as well. Great, thank you so much. And we do, have another, okay. we do have another question from Representative Gresco. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, getting back to Uber Eats, um, I don't use them. So uh, if I was to do it old school and call up on the phone or, uh, or, or do it uh, more modernly uh, online, there's a box I have to check to, to get uh, the cutlery or does the person on the other end of the phone ask me, do I want a knife and fork? Is that, is that the process? Yes. Yeah, so, um, yes, there are both processes in place. So that's, and I don't use Uber Eats except for I have a 17 year old child. So I've been introduced to Uber Eats and Grubhub and there's no, nothing like not leaving your bed to get your food delivered. I thought that's what I was doing, but now it's delivered by Uber Eats. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an opt-in program. And also, you know, from an economic impact statement or economic pr proposition for restaurants, a lot of this waste, they, would have, they wouldn't have the, you know, the liability, not the liability, but the burden of providing these things if people didn't want them, right? So it'll it'll be a cost reduction for many restaurants. And that's what they've seen in certain studies that when they do an opt-in, um, it's not to inconvenience their customers, it's just they know a lot of this waste is going straight from them into a landfill. So they're also taking ownership of the waste stream. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Gresco. Okay, and with that, I don't see any other questions, but thank you for, um, for your indulgence and uh, staying with us with all your input. We appreciate it. Great, thank you so much. I appreciate your time and consideration. Sure. Bye -bye. Our next speaker is Kathy Flaherty, who is here on behalf of Marianne Lanton. Lanton, did I say that right? 
Um, it, thank you, Representative Bohr. Mary Ann Langton is here, but I'd love for her to unmute and just say hi to all of you because she's asked me to read her testimony. Sure. But... Mary Ann, do you want to unmute and say hi? She might not be able to, so let me just read. Okay, we, we see her though. Yeah, you see oh, there her. She... Okay. There she is. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Marianne. So, We're used to seeing Marianne in the halls at the oh, Capitol. Yeah. So you made it virtually. Thank you. Okay, Kathy, I'm sorry. Okay. So uh, my name is Kathy Flaherty. I'm the executive director of Connecticut Legal Rights Project, but Mary Ann Langton and I are both members of the Connecticut Cross Disability Lifespan Alliance. And I very much appreciate uh, the committee's reasonably accommodating Mary Ann by allowing me to read her testimony. Uh, hello, Co-Chair Cohen, Co-Chair Borer, and distinguished members of the committee. My name is Marianne Langton, and I live in West Hartford. I oppose this raised bill 6502 for the following reasons. And I'm just going to interrupt for a second. It's only section three that she opposes. Uh, the definition for single use straw can be easily misinterpreted. And two, the language is too weak when it refers to owners, operators may provide plastic straws to customers with disabilities. Within the past two years, the majority of restaurants have begun using various types of eco-friendly straws. These are great, but as a woman with a disability with an involuntary bite, I cannot drink through these types of eco-friendly straws. Therefore, I would like this bill to mandate that food establishments must provide plastic straws to people with disabilities upon request. Plastic straws are an essential independent living tool for many people with disabilities, including myself. I am unable to drink from a glass or a cup due to my physical disability. I cannot hold a glass or cup and then bring it to my mouth without spilling out all of the liquid. Therefore, plastic straws are an essential ad adaptive device for my everyday living. So many people have either given or told me about the metal straws. These straws are dangerous because of all my involuntary movements. The Cromwell Dental Association, where I go for my dental care, strongly advise me not to use these metal straws. They are fearful that the metal straws might break my teeth. In conclusion, I hope that I have shown you that plastic straws are a necessity in my everyday life and for other people with disabilities lives. Please vote no to raise bill 6502 and that's section three. Um, with the committee's indulgence, I'd just like to give you my testimony which I can do in about 30 seconds. Sure. Is I co-sign what Mary Ann said. You know, when I hear people say things like, well, if you don't have a straw, you can just sip from the side of the glass. No, not everybody can do that. When we, if this state can't figure out how to deal with disability so that people at high risk can get vaccines, we expect the state to deal with disability when it comes to people getting straws so they can drink. The amount of waste that's getting generated because every vaccine dose uses plastic. The amount of medical waste I have generated now that I use a CPAP machine, people with disabilities in this state get ignored time and again when policy decisions are getting made. And it's not that we don't believe that everything else in this bill is great. I'm delighted that you are finally taking some action against balloons. Nobody needs balloons at all, period, full stop. You could ban balloons and life would go on. Might be a little less fun, but life would go on. But, and I know this is not a ban on straws, but I can tell you from personal experience, if you go and you ask for a straw, the, the servers kind of give you all kinds of static. I put stuff in my written testimony about that. It's, it's easy to say, oh, they can just have it. They'll have it in the back, the full, they just don't. So I heard the beep. Um, so I, my suggestion would just be take line 68 to 116 out of the bill. And then you got full support. Okay, thank you. So um, so what you're saying is that you support the bill as long as straws are available, if, if folks ask for the straw. Um, so in those towns that currently have BYO that don't have straws, is there a is there a designation whereby when you go to that restaurant or that establishment that you that you know that they don't have straws? This is one. I don't know. I don't live in those er that area of the state. 
you're not going to see me drive from Hartford to a restaurant in New Canaan. It's just never going to happen in a million years. So I have no idea what they do. Um, what I would suggest is that do that education campaign and explain to people, if you don't need a straw, don't use one. You know, this bill coming out before, I used to get iced coffees at Dunkin' Donuts. We've been talking about Uber Eats, so I might as well talk about Dunkin'. I used to get iced coffee at Dunkin', but iced coffee, you need a straw to drink. You, you just can't. And so I actually stopped getting iced coffee because I started making it at home. I can use my reusable cup. I don't have to get a plastic cup. I'm not getting a straw. But the numbers that you get in terms of the stats, that big number that came out was a nine-year-old kid who called up a random company and somebody pulled that number out of thin air. There really is, the plastic straws are a very, very tiny part of the plastic waste in the world. And everybody sort of views it as like the gateway plastic. But it, you know, straws are things that people need. The other okay. stuff, they don't. Thank you. I, I do have some follow-ups, but I'm going to defer to my co-chair, Senator Cohen. Thank you, uh, Madam Co-Chair. And uh, thank you so much, Kathy and Marianne, for your testimony. And I did want to, I feel compelled to apologize for that insensitive comment about drinking out of the side of a cup. And I uh, stand corrected and I appreciate that. My, my point was obviously, um, you know, that, that sometimes you leave a restaurant and and don't have the tools. And my, and it brings me to my question. Um, I do have friends with disabilities um, that uh, require the use of plastic straws. And, and again, to Marianne's point, not, um, not metal straws uh, because those can be uh, difficult. Although silicone straws um, seem to be acceptable for them, but I do recognize from, from prior hearings that we've had on this matter that having that, that bendable piece is um, advantageous um, you know, for many in the disabled community um, that, that often comes with the flexible plastic straw. Um, I, I would add though, many of them do carry their own straws. Um, I wonder if that's commonplace in the community, in the disabled community that requires um, plastic straws in order to um, uh, drink their beverage. And then I, I do have a follow-up question to that. Um, this is Kathy. I appreciate the question, Senator Cohen, and I also appreciate the the um, apology. Uh, I I think most people say that, and and that's kind of the automatic reaction. Mm -hmm. um, there is a saying that people in the disabled community have about suggestions like, "Well, why can't you just carry it with you if you need it?" They refer to that as a crip tax because it's yet another added expense that a person with a disability has to take on to live in the world. So I would suggest that that is not uh, the approach that I would like to see this committee take. I would say, think about it again, educating people. If you don't need a straw, don't use one, don't take one. Um, and it, but they need to be available for the people that do. And thank you, Kathy. And, that, and that's sort of my follow up with the way the legislation is written is such that the straws would continue to be available. Um, so I just um, wonder, you know, this is really, you know, if you're at a restaurant rather than, you know, you, we go to diners and we have those straws placed on the table automatically. Uh, and then they're um, discarded because they can't be reused, even if the customer doesn't use them. I just wonder, um, and you, I know you've spoken to this in past uh, public hearings as well, um, what the, if there's a suggestion that we could get um, to a place where we're not having um, restaurants automatically distribute straws that are perhaps unwrapped or can't be reused if a customer doesn't choose to take it, um, but also keeps in mind the disabled community. Uh, this is Kathy, I would say again, not having it, not having it in legislation. I think it's reasonable to do an education campaign of restaurants, but I think Marianne speaks to this. When the original bill came out a couple of years ago and you really were talking about a ban, people stopped having plastic straws at their restaurants. The other problem with the language in your bill is you actually say this doesn't prevent a town from having more restrictive legislation or more restrictive ordinances which means towns could decide. 
I mean, I remember Stonington was considering one. I, I find it interesting that they're not on your list, but I also remember tweeting at the town people in Stonington that contemplating a straw ban was showing they didn't care about the, di the disabled residents of their town. So I think the sooner more people in government realize that some of the policy decisions, no matter how well-intentioned they are, hurt people with disabilities. And there's a lot of us out here and we see what you're doing. Um, not, and I don't, don't mean like just you, we mean like the collective you. Um, we see it and it happens time and time again. Um, and it feels like you have an array of people who are like getting thanked for doing their environmental work and all the work they've been doing. And I'm with you when it comes to the bags, when it comes to the polystyrene containers, you know, honestly, when it comes to some of the other accessories. But when you're talking about a tool that literally was designed by a dad because his disabled daughter was in the hospital and couldn't drink while she was in her bed. I just wish you could go after the other stuff. Uh, I appreciate that. And can I, could I just also clarify um, for the record that there's nothing in statute right now that prevents municipalities coming up with their own ordinances. So we're, you know, that's still something with or without this legislation, towns uh, can go ahead and, and implement a ban or a, a prevention of, you know, a distribution to some extent or another. So I just wanted to clarify that. And I thank you so much for both yours and, and Mary Ann's testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cohen. Senator Minor. Thank you. Uh, thank you for being here, Kathy. I, um, I, I guess what I think I hear you saying is that if you make it, if we make it difficult enough to acquire a plastic straw, uh, especially for the disabled, it actually kind of goes down that road of violating the reasonable accommodations uh, rules. And, uh, you know, I, I agree with you. I think since we've been having the conversation, I'm less likely to find a straw on a table than I was two years ago. Um, I think the business community has recognized that if they don't have to buy these, they won't. And if we make it difficult enough to get one, they won't have them at all. And so it's more than likely that uh, folks that need them um, are going to be in a bit of a bind because if they're not available at the restaurant and you don't have one with you, uh, there is no real remedy other than someone filing a lawsuit. Um, I, I missed which line you suggested that we remove. Um, I, if I read it quick, because I was reading the bill on my phone while I was waiting to testify, uh, section three is lines 68 to 116, if I read that correctly. Um, so I just think that we'd be better served if the reference to straws was just removed from the bill. Uh, I do, uh, hear what I think it was Senator Cohen said about not not being able to stop municipalities from doing things. And I think that's true too. Um, hopefully there are people from municipalities watching this and realizing the impact that some of their local decisions have on people with disabilities who live in their towns or people who live in other towns who may decide not to go to restaurants in those towns because we don't think that um, that's a good thing. You know, like for me personally, I don't need a straw, so I don't use them anymore. Um, you know, I have lots of friends though, like Marianne, who do need them. And what you're basically saying is that Marianne and I cannot go to a restaurant together because I don't know that she's going to be able to drink while we're there. Um, and, you know, I think uh, we have enough limitations on our ability to participate in community life. Um, and it would be nice to have one thing that we don't have to fight. And frankly, I, 
the thought of somebody having to bring a lawsuit over straws is beyond frustrating. Um, and I'm a lawyer. I hate the fact that we are stuck off and having no other choice but to bring a lawsuit to um, enforce our rights. And, but, you know, because I know that some of us have had conversations about that, um, but hopefully nobody will literally have to make a federal case out of it because that's what it would be. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Miner. I don't see any other hands um, for questions. So I wanna thank you both Kathy and thank you Marianne for your testimony today and for all your, all your input on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for letting me go now. I appreciate it. Sure. 24, but you can go straight to 26 after. <laughs> Take care. Thanks. Okay, our next speaker is Thomas Lefebvre. I don't know if I said that correctly. <laughs> No, um, it's perfect. <laughs> but what is it? How do you say it? It's Lefebvre. The B, the B is silent. Uh, the B is silent. Okay. All right. Well, Thomas, you're up. Thank you so much, uh, Dear Madam Chair, dear esteemed members uh, of the Environment Committee. My name is indeed Thomas Lefebvre, and I'm, I'm the coordinator at the Transport uh, Hartford Academy at the Center for Latino Progress here in uh, uh, Hartford. And I'm here today to strongly support SB 931, an act uh, concerning emission standard for medium and heavy duty vehicles, sorry. Um, there are some uh, clear benefit to SB 931, the first being on uh, reducing uh, pollution. Uh, we all have been on the highway one day and we all have witnessed trucks uh, um, producing clouds and clouds of uh, 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 black smoke and that's a uh, uh, visible pollution, but uh, what this bill's uh, target is reducing the smaller particles uh, that are invisible to the human eye and which are highly, highly damaging to the human uh, uh, health. And as a few of us have already mentioned, transportation is responsible for a large share of air pollution in our states. We are also living in a state where many cities and many towns are divided by highways impacting uh, localized air quality and negatively affecting local communities. There are multiple reports that highlight that minorities are disproportionately affected by air pollution. Therefore, there is an environmental justice angle in this bill, uh, which is why we are supporting it. There are some clear health benefits, health benefits as well in reducing uh, emission contracts, not just for those who, live, who are living between uh, uh, highways, but also for the truck drivers themselves who are inhaling a lot of particles during their work hours. There are uh, quite a few survey on that at, uh, uh, on the uh, negative impact of uh, particles on truck drivers. I want to say to those who are claiming to defend truck drivers by opposing this bill, that if they really want to defend truck drivers' health, they should in fact support this bill. And to conclude, uh, if the technology is there, uh, there is really no reason uh, uh, to wait to use it. And of course, this bill is just a starting point. We are very much eager, eager to see the plans that the General Assembly is going to outline in order to uh, uh, transition away from the use of internal combustion engines. I know that we are going to talk about the Transportation and Climate Initiative uh, uh, next week, uh, but we are in a climate uh, uh, emergency that requires bold and fast action from our legislators. The Governor uh, has outlined some ambitious targets in reducing greenhouse gas. The White House has outlined some very ambitious goals as well. We have rejoined uh, the Paris Agreement. It's time to go further and faster on these uh, uh, issues. And I want to thank you very much for your time, uh, uh, for listening to me. And uh, um, I want to wish you a good uh, day. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you for all of your testimony. And I did see a hand up, but it went back down. Uh, but it's back I'm up. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Representative, I, I took down um, Representative Michelle's uh, hand raise. I oh, you took it down. Okay, by accident. Okay, that's fine. Representative Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was wondering what was happening to my hand. <laughs> uh, uh, bonjour, Monsieur Lefebvre. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I <laughs> uh, just wanted to say thank you for testifying and uh, raising the point of uh, environmental justice, which is... Uh, uh, there are other bills that we're working on. And uh, so I just wanted to say merci and don't hesitate to, to me contact in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Madam Chair. I just well, thought I, about I don't know what you said, but thank you for your testimony and your question, Representative Michelle. Thank you very um, much. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Uh, right. Truly appreciate it. Okay, our um, next speaker after Thomas. Guy, I'm looking for number 25. I see 26 is Nicole. Hi, I'm here. Sorry, 25 Hi. only spoke. Um, that was the one who spoke with 20, number 23. Oh, Kathy spoke. She was number 25. Okay, great. Okay, Nicole. Hi, everyone. Happy World Wildlife Day. Unfortunately, we have a state wildlife agency speaking in written testimony on behalf of the hunting industry today, but I'm here to speak for Africa's Big Five for Friends of Animals. Trophy hunters want you to believe they are better than poachers because they have a permit from Fish and Wildlife Service to slaughter African lions, leopards, elephants, and rhinos. Giraffes currently have no protection under US law, so they don't even need a permit to kill them to mount their head or to make Western boots, pillows, and rugs from their skins. However, it makes no difference to these species who are vulnerable to extinction and battling habitat loss and the bushmeat trade, if their killers have a permit or not. Cecil the lion didn't suffer any less because the American who shot him with the first arrow at 10 p.m. July 1st, 2015, had a permit. Wounded, he was left for at least 11 hours before the hunter found him and finished him off with the second arrow. That was key because the hunter wanted a bow hunting record. And if a rifle was used, the record would be disqualified. Trophy hunters kill for recognition like the African Big Five Grand Slam Award, not conservation. The Safari Club International's record book ranks biggest tusks, horns, skulls, and bodies. And make no mistake, Connecticut residents want bragging rights too. Since 2005, Connecticut residents have killed 71 leopards, 39 lions, and a giraffe. They've also killed seven elephants who are our ecosystem engineers. The, near, the 2016 near total ban on commercial trade in elephant ivory still allows Americans to import two elephant trophies per year. Let that sink in. Hunters killing these keystone species essential to maintaining balanced ecosystems live in Greenwich, North Haven, Norwalk, Berlin, Westport, Stamford, Weston, Easton, Southington, and Middletown. While they probably didn't travel in 2020, the big five still didn't get a reprieve. Since wildlife watching tourism flatlined because of the pandemic, poaching soared because the presence of visitors deters poachers. Uganda recorded 365 poaching incidents between February and May, more than double the same period in 2019. The irony is if the money from trophy hunting made its way into African communities like the hunters claim, there wouldn't even be a need for poaching. It's often driven by poverty and desperation. Trophy hunters don't want you to know that non-consumptive community-based wildlife watching tourism is what provides incentive for conservation. It's the silver bullet for protecting African wildlife, not actual bullets. And also permits don't make a difference to the offspring of the dead animals who must survive without parents to teach them about the harsh lessons of nature and avoiding conflicts with humans. Leopard cubs would normally stay with their moms for two years. The pandemic has showed us how excruciating it feels to be apart from family when we need them the most. Let's not be arrogant enough to think humans are the only species who feel this way. Thank you. Please support SB 925. Thank you so much, Nicole, for your testimony and for all of your advocacy around this. I know uh, we've seen this bill uh, before the committee in the past. We've gotten it out of committee. We've gotten it out of the Senate, and uh, we uh, hope this year uh, we can get it out of both chambers and on to the governor for signature. Um, I see Representative Michelle has his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Nicole, uh, your neighbor, Friends of Animals in Darien. Um, you mentioned something at the beginning of your uh, testimony. You mentioned uh, um, another testimony, and I have to say that I'm also kind of shocked by a testimony uh, that was submitted by uh, the DEEP on Senate Bill 925 by Commissioner Dykes against, well, uh, against the bill, uh, talking about uh, conservation and um, 
you know, I, I, I remember um, looking into uh, poaching and corruption and money, uh, money involvement in uh, Southern African countries. And it seems a lot uh, was omitted in that testimony. Can, can you comment on this testimony from uh, Commissioner Dykes, please? Of course. Um, you know, I feel like when it comes to pollution and pesticides and waste management, like deep is your agency. But I feel like with this testimony, it seemed uninformed and like they didn't do their homework. Um, they, they don't acknowledge, you know, what I already talked about, community-based non-consumptive wildlife watching tourism and how it's actually protecting wildlife in Africa. Um, saying that there would be no money for conservation without trophy hunting is just simply a lie. Um, I have one example, there's uh, Camp Yakanzi in Kenya they created a payment for ecosystem service where wildlife watchers pay a daily conservation fee earmarked to compensate local landlords for livestock losses from predators. So consequently in that community, the lion population is thriving. I can speak, you know, Friends of Animals is also involved with conservation projects on the ground in Africa. We talk to conservationists on the ground in Africa, um, you know, and I can guarantee that the projects we're involved in um, that are actually making a difference are not funded by trophy hunters. Um, I think that their testimony doesn't acknowledge that conservation is just more than anti-poaching efforts. It's about the reintroduction of species into their native habitat. It's, it's about protecting habitat loss. Um, I feel like they don't acknowledge that when you put a price tag on these animals, it sends a, mix, a mixed message about whether they need, they need to be protected at all. And so our wildlife agency in Connecticut can't be talking about and prioritizing money. It should be thinking about ecosystems and climate change and preventing, you know, the extinction of, of these animals, but also our very own extinction because it's all interconnected. Um, you know, I, I find it fascinating that with elephants and rhinos, they're responsible for, you know, their grazing maintains these grasslands in Africa and these savannas are actually function as carbon sinks, which means, you know, it absorbs more carbon then it releases and, and things like that are important. And I think, you know, their testimony just not only just addresses the, the animals that are shot dead, it's not thinking about all the animals that are left behind to deal with, you know, the mess that the trophy hunters make. Including, I think- yeah. Excuse me, Representative Michelle, I am just going to uh, recess the meeting momentarily. We're having a little bit of a technical issue and um, some of the leadership of the committee is able to um, be in the room right now. So I'm just going to recess and, and I will get right back to you, Representative Michelle, as soon as I get the word that we are back in working order. Okay. okay.
Are you there? Yeah. Yeah, it still won't let, it will not let me in on the computer. Shall we, shall we resume uh, as, can you use your phone as, and try to work out the technical difficulty on the other end? An effort to. Yeah, I, I'm certainly not trying to uh, tie people up. I'm just, <clears throat> I just don't know why it threw me off the computer. And so I will operate with the phone, but I got to hold it. So. Um, I don't know if Guy is on here or. Hi, Senator. I'm on with ITS on the phone. And it sounds like what you're saying is that you can't get on through your computer. Correct. When I go on the computer, it comes back to that same note. Uh, OK. And I wonder, so I wonder if you would close that down and reopen it again. Would that help? I can try that. Sure. But what I'll do is I'll. Um, what? Yeah, I'm still connected. What, I'll just. What, what Cheryl Smith is saying is to log out of Zoom and log back in on the computer. Oh, sorry. Log out oh, of Zoom. Log out of Zoom and then just click the link that was uh, sent to you, and I can resend that to you so you have it quickly. In front of so you. Should, I, should I log out of Zoom on my phone? Is that what you're saying? No, nope, on the computer. So I don't have Zoom on the computer. Oh, up. okay. Um, and I'm on the inbox. So all I'll do is go to. Uh, I guess your email. There have been a few since then. I can resend it so that you okay. have it quickly in front of you. Okay, it'll just take okay. one minute. If you would, that'd be great. Sure thing. Thanks everybody for your patience. If we could just wait a few more minutes, get make sure we resolve all the technical difficulties. We want to make sure everybody uh, is able to um, participate in the hearing. Um, and if leadership can't be with us, that's problematic. So bear with us as, as we uh, get these things solved. It just resent that over, Senator Meyer. Yep. I got so I just uh, I'm just clicking on where it says click here to join. So there's a little screen that says open Zoom meetings, and then there's the larger uh, screen that says your download should start in a few seconds. Okay, hopefully we're in business. I would hit the open Zoom meetings. That's what I usually have to do. Open so, Zoom meeting. Yes, that's what IT is saying as well. Thank you, Senator Cohen. So, so I just did that, and it still comes up with the same. You are unable to rejoin this meeting same. because you were previously removed by the host for not bringing cookies or... <laughs> right. <laughs> I wonder, Senator well, Miner, do you want to wait? I, I'll just, Senator, I'll, do you want to? We can we could do one of two things. We can continue in recess. You can hang up and and work with ITS and let me know when that's resolved, or we can continue with you on your phone. I'm gonna leave the phone on in the hopes that I can listen along, and then uh, I'll just mute myself on the phone for now, and then. Um, I gather I still have the raise hand option this way, so. You do, but Senator Miner, since you can't take a phone call or text from me right now, I just wanna say the ITS is saying that on your upper left-hand corner on Zoom to, to choose to log out and then and then you should be, it should clear you. If it doesn't, we'll use the phone, but I just wanna be able to see how I can stay in touch with you. So this says launch Zoom meeting? On the upper, so maybe we should be in recess for, for three more minutes and I will definitely have ITS. I'll be on the phone with you, Craig, and we can talk to right. Senator Minor. Okay. 
Thank you. We'll continue to resume. Uh, and then Senator Minor, if you can take that call from Guy and hopefully get it resolved. Okay.
Now I'll just uh, I'll just do it by phone. Okay. Uh, okay. The hearing is uh, back in order. Um, we have uh, Nicole Rivard who is testifying right now, and I believe Representative Michelle, did you have a follow up question? Thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, um, and Nicole, thank you for your testimony and uh, happy World Wildlife Day to you. Um, I, I had another question because you, you guys are really extensively knowledgeable on, on this issue. Uh, can you talk about the monies involved, uh, some of the finance that uh, might have been uh, sort of mentioned in the uh, in the testimony from uh, Commissioner Dykes, but can, can oh. you talk about what you know about what goes, you know, what's typical practices? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I, I felt like in terms of that testimony, um, some of it, like it was like they didn't do their homework because it's easy enough now to, you know, read articles and talk to conservationists on the ground um, you know, their testimony doesn't acknowledge that even the small, like measly amount of money that might go into communities, um, not, it might never get there because of the corruption. Um, and there was an example in 2019, the Community Resources Board in Zambia expressed deep concern over the fact that the communities had not been given their share of concession fees or um, hunting revenues since 2016. <laughs> so um, let's just say we've, you know, Brent Staplecamp, he's a conservationist that studied Cecil and was the last person to see him alive. You know, he knows all this looks good on paper, um, but the reality is some of these countries are the most corrupt on the, per, you know, on the planet, particularly Zimbabwe. And so, you know, if this, if this was working the way it claims to on paper, you know, I, the species numbers wouldn't be plummeting. You know, they're calling now what's happening to leopards and giraffes, the silent extinction, which is why we added giraffes to this legislation. When we first introduced it, giraffes weren't on there. Um, it's about, you know, doing, doing things differently um, because, and, and, and not letting the trophy hunting industry get away with this narrative that they've been getting away with pretty much up until Cecil was killed. I mean, the one positive thing that came out came from him, his tragic death is that, you know, people started to take a look at this industry. Um, and, and there's studies out there that, you know, prove that it's economically useless. And, you know, at, at this point, you know, we feel like we want Connecticut to step up. We feel like these species are running out of time. But one thing I would, last thing I would like to add that I feel like the deep testimony doesn't address either is that um, a federal ban has been introduced. Um, and actually I just um, yesterday got off the phone with um, Congressman Liu's office from California and they're going to be reintroducing the Protect Act again this Congress. So, you know, I feel like since we've been working on this bill, you know, society is is <laughs> is speaking up and and saying that they're they're sick of this. You know, they don't buy what the trophy hunters have been trying to, you know, that that perpetuate that myth. They're not buying that myth anymore that without um, the money from trophy hunting, there would be no money for conservation in Africa. It's just simply not true. And Cecil's death raised awareness about that. Thank you so much, Nicole, for your testimony. And uh, it's certainly, the bill was certainly highly supported by the uh, uh, Connecticut Animal Advocacy Caucus. So uh, thank you for testifying and th thank you for your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Um, I don't see any other questions. So, uh, uh, yeah, no, no more questions. So, thank you so much, Nicole, and thanks for being so patient in the midst. Thank of that. you. It's, it's an honor, you know, to see the bill raised and to be able to speak about it for Friends of Animals. So, thank you for your support. Okay.
Okay, uh, next up we have uh, uh, William Lucy, Lucy from Save the Sound, followed by Ruth Kennedy. Uh, and Jean uh, uh, if everybody could just mute themselves, that'd be terrific. And, and this is a good opportunity to also say um, um, that we are not using the chat um, during these public hearings. Uh, if there is, uh, for some reason, the need to get in touch with one of the clerks of the committee, um, that is often accept acceptable use of the chat. But otherwise, uh, we should not be using the chat for discussion. Um, during these committee meetings or committee hearings. So uh, with that, Bill, welcome. Thanks for being here today. All right, thank you. Um, and thanks to all the members of the Environment Committee. It's uh, the technical ch challenges this year obviously just continue on through no fault of anybody's. Um, I'll just briefly mention a couple bills and I'm going to testify mostly about uh, HB 6497, um, but briefly SB 927, Sewage Right to Know update. We're very close to final language. Uh, we hope to have that to leadership uh, tomorrow morning. We just had another meeting with Deep today, just hammering out a few few more details on that, but the, the uh, the basis of what you have in front of you is going to stand. Um, and then as far as HB 6502, the single use, I just wanted to mention, I was out with uh, Representative Gresco a couple weeks ago, checking on a tidal gate in my boat and there was a balloon. Every time I go out there, there's balloons. So I'm really glad to see this as an omnibus bill, which throws everything in the, the comments about the straws notwithstanding. Um, instead of a bunch of piecemeal, like that was a wise choice of the committee this year. But what I'd really like to talk about is uh, 6497, uh, trying to get the enabling legislation for uh, Connecticut to have stormwater authorities. Um, the reason Save the Sound is interested in this uh, is twofold. Uh, one is that Stormwater is the largest impairment to our surface waters and Long Island Sound. So every time it rains, all the pollution goes in and we have our 303D listings from the state, it impairs recreation, uh, fishing, uh, shell fishing. So that's one reason we're into it. The other is simply the fact that we're gonna have a lot of resiliency issues. I submitted a written testimony that included uh, a road outside my house that was completely destroyed by a storm uh, that lifted the blacktop off about eight inch storm. And the town didn't have that in their budget. It was an expensive repair. We lost a lot of roads in one storm. So if we had had the road set up where it was diverting storm water off to the side, that wouldn't have happened, saving the town a lot of money. Um, and I'll just, I guess to encapsulate, I'll use an example from Maine where there was an industrial park with big box stores and welders, pipe fitters. And right down the middle of it was a brook trout stream that was too impaired to have brook trout in it. So they decided to form their own stormwater authority up there, they're called utilities. They put a fee on themselves. They enacted close to a hundred different practices, porous pavement, trash traps, uh, cutting into curbs or redirect the stormwater to try and get the uh, water quality to improve in the stream. And once trout can live in there again, they're going to reduce all those fees. So um, that sort of encapsulates what we're what we support here. Thank you. Thanks so much, Bill, uh, for your testimony on this uh, important piece of legislation. I, are there any questions from committee members? Seeing none, thanks for being with us. All right, next we have uh, Ruth Canavi or Canavi. I hope I'm, I, please correct me. It's Ruth Canovi, but thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. So, distinguished chairpersons and members of the Environment Committee, my name is Ruth Canovi. I'm the Director of Advocacy for the American Lung Association in Connecticut. And on behalf of the Lung Association, I speak to encourage the passage of Senate Bill 931 in relation to reducing harmful emissions from the medium and heavy duty trucking sectors to protect the health of Connecticut residents. Every Connecticut resident lives in a county that received a failing grade for unhealthy ozone days in the American Lung Association State of the Air report in 2020. 
Connecticut must continue to evaluate and then implement the most health protective standards possible as we continue to make progress in cleaning our air and protecting public health. This is especially important when considering those living in communities most impacted by the burdens of poor air quality. The trucking sector is a leading source of on-road pollution in Connecticut, contributing to smog and particle forming NOx emissions and carcinogenic diesel particle pollution. These pollutants contribute to a wide range of poor health outcomes, including asthma, heart attacks, strokes, lung cancer, preterm births, and premature deaths. We also know that lower income communities and communities of color often face a disproportionate burden of exposure and poor health outcomes due to transportation pollution. In order to achieve clean air for all communities, we urge you to move forward with this legislation to begin the process of assessing and implementing stronger standards. The benefits of California programs are well documented and will provide for major reductions in pollution through more productive engine standards while ensuring real world emission reductions under all driving conditions over the lifetime of a truck. We are also in strong support of Connecticut's participation in the multi-state MOU in pursuit of the transition to zero emission trucking in the coming decades. Such a shift to zero emission trucks was included in our um, report called The Road to Clean Air, which was released last year, um, we found that a widespread shift to zero emission transportation, including passenger vehicles, buses, and trucks, could yield significant health benefits in Connecticut. We urge you to support uh, Senate Bill 931 to address a leading source of harmful pollution in the state and to ensure that the combustion trucking sector becomes cleaner over time as Connecticut transitions to zero emission technologies. So thank you so much for your time and the opportunity to speak today. Thanks so much, Ms. Kenobi. I appreciate your testimony. Uh, any questions from the committee? See any? Seeing none, thank you so much for being with us. Great, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Okay, next we have uh, Jane Mangan, uh, followed by Elizabeth Raceback, followed by Stephen Lake. Jane, are you with us? And we don't have that, we don't have number 29 with us at this time. Okay, so uh, Elizabeth, are you with us? Oh, I, for some reason, we can't hear you. I don't see that you're on mute, but you're not, your sound isn't coming through. Now you're on mute. Let's see if you try unmuting if it works. No. Hmm, uh-oh. I wonder, um, maybe we'll go on to the next uh, person and uh, maybe perhaps try logging out and logging back in. Maybe that'll do the trick. I'm not sure why your sound's not coming through. Uh, okay, so we will move on to Stephen Lake and then we will uh, try circling back to Elizabeth after Stephen. Is Stephen with us? Yes, I am. I'm just trying okay. to get. Sorry, <laughs> got moved up, moved up the chain. Okay. Welcome. Uh, committee members, thank you for allowing me to talk today. Uh, my name is Stephen Lake, and I'm the uh, plant manager at America's Tyrannics, or AMSTI, uh, for short, in the Allen's Point site at Gales Ferry, Connecticut. First, uh, I want you to know that just like you, I'm passionate about eliminating waste in my plant and in the environment. And as a minimalist, I have a great appreciation for the fact that uh, Connecticut lawmakers are wanting to eliminate waste and reduce our carbon footprint. As someone who's participated in beach and roadside cleanups, uh, seeing the amount of uncontained waste is disheartening to me. Uh, that's why I appreciate the investment and commitment AMSTI has made to uh, innovate and ensure that a circular economy for polystyrene is possible. This means that all polystyrene products are infinitely recyclable, so they never need to be landfilled. That's our long-term vision at AMSTI, where we're, we're being a good stewards of our environment is a priority and a commitment, and we take uh, this action very seriously. For example, at Allen's Point's plant, we produce several products that contain up to 25% post-consumer recycled material, also called PCR. Since 2014, we have recycled more than 17 million pounds of PCR into food service packaging. Since 2019, our 
Tiger Oregon recycling plant has converted more than 1.5 million pounds of used polystyrene to all new material. That's equivalent to uh, keeping more than 56 million foam cups or nearly 49 million takeout containers out of the landfill. And we have expansion plans to drastically increase our circular recycling capacity in the U.S. Uh, today, more than ever, consumers rely on food packaging. Uh, that's not only safe for the environment, but also has played a vital role in the midst of the public health crisis created by COVID-19. Polystyrene packaging is not just a matter of convenience and enabling restaurants to serve customers safely and affordably in a time when businesses are strained in every way. Uh, and compared to other materials and packaging, polystyrene is the most recyclable material based on energy emissions, raw material usage, weight, and market value. Our attention, resources, and innovations are focused on recovery, recycling, and reuse of polystyrene. Uh, we feel the best path forward is recycling rather than plastic prohibition. Our focus needs to be on funding recyclable food packaging that meets evolving customer demands for products that are environmentally friendly, safe, and protect consumer health. I'm proud to work for a company that shares my values, that uh, innovates and invests in recycling, and that demonstrates progress in a fully recycled or circular economy for polystyrene. That's why AMSI opposes Bill 6502, unless amended. Thank you again, and I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lake, and thank you for um, your um, fast testimony right right within the, the timeline. I see Representative Savitsky has his hand up for a question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you say that you oppose the bill unless amended. In what ways would you suggest it be amended? Just the removal of the uh, polystyrene ban, foam ban. Okay, and what do you suggest, if anything, that the legislature do with regard to polystyrene? Um, you know, we support recycling and uh, you know, what's been getting a lot of uh, press these days is the circular economy. So we would like to see our efforts go into the recycling of polystyrene. Okay, and, and in what way could the legislature participate or help to ensure more recycling of, restyrene, of polystyrene? Um, you know, I, it's a very good question. Um, I'm not real sure how to do that other than making it available for people to recycle when they can. Right now, uh, recyclers in the state do not take polystyrene at all. And I'd like to see, um, you know, just kind of broadening that recyclability to polystyrene. Okay, so what would you suggest? You know, we had a public hearing a week or so ago, and there was a, there was a bill up to uh, have a um, sort of a mandate that the producers of, uh, of propane tanks um, create a system where they take the propane tanks back um, and that they, they participate in the, in the, um, uh, the, the, the funding of the recycling of, of those tanks and that, and that, they, uh, that they participate in that in some way. Is that something that the polystyrene industry would be interested in doing and coming up with some way that um, that there is a uh, a system that starts at manufacturer and ends back at the manufacturer for for the kind of uh, foam products it would be the uh, I mean not the manufacturer of polystyrene but the producers of the clamshells but yeah having kind of a uh, overall way to get those materials recycled back in, collection of them. I think that builds uh, circularity into the, into the economy. Yeah, well, that's, that's the question. How do you do it? 
Um, you know, I, I'm sure everybody here would love to see every piece of polystyrene produced um, recycled. I would, I'm sure we would love to see every, uh, you know, you walk out of a deli with a, a salad and a little polystyrene clamshell. I'm sure everybody would love to see that recycled in some way. The uh, question is, how do we do it? You know, we're, I, I'm not, I'm not a, a recycling expert. I'm a, I'm not a, um, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I don't know how that works. So if you are suggesting that we should be, we should re recycle more polystyrene, tell me how. Um, well, I, I think it starts with creating uh, a mechanism where it doesn't exclude polystyrene. Right now it excludes polystyrene and you got to have collection facilities. It's got to be, um, it's got to be a drive for it, but I think banning the plastic doesn't really help that. Okay. So you're suggesting that the, like when, when I, I do my single stream recycling, into the big bin and the town picks it up and it goes over to uh, Willimantic Waste and is sorted there. Are you suggesting that polystyrene be one of the products that is uh, included in that? Yes. Okay, have you, have you or anybody from your industry touched base with any of the recyclers to figure out how that could be done? Uh, we've had, uh, not officially, but I think there's, you know, we talk to people in the local area, they just, they just say, well, that's not on our list. It's not on our list to recycle those on our recycle uh, containers when we have at the plant. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a tough problem. I think it's a tough problem because you got to have the drive and the need for it. And then the, the uh, recyclers and sorters need to be able to make a little bit of money from the material that they get. So I, I don't think it's an easy um, problem to solve by any stretch of the imagination. I know that AMSI is trying to collect. Uh, we have, uh, what we do in Allen's Point is we take PCR and we uh, put it back into products, but AMSI itself is taking plastics and turning it back into styrene. And I think uh, you know, collecting those and, and trying to build that supply chain to get it back into a, a technology that converts it back into styrene is what, is what we need to do. And I don't think there's any easy answer. How is, how is it collected? Uh, they have uh, MRF that collect it. Uh, the Tiger in Oregon place uh, collects it in Oregon locally. Uh, we're trying to get other municipalities to, to supply their uh, polystyrene that we can take. It's a scale up issue as well. You know, this is uh, what, what we're doing in Tigard is probably startup scale, not, uh, not world scale yet, but I think there's a lot of places that are trying to expand into that. So is it fair to say that there is a, a, a market uh, for recycled polystyrene? I think there is. I mean, there's there's a lot of places. Uh, I know of Exxon Mobil and uh, some other big players that are getting into that technology so that they can convert polystyrene back into styrene molecules. Okay. Well, I'm I'm suggesting more of like bales of recycled polystyrene. So, for example, if Willimantic Waste um, is sorting out, and I only use them because they're my local. Uh, recycler. So if they're if they're sorting out uh, plastic bottles over here, glass over here, um, you know, cans over here, and polystyrene over here, and they make up bundles or bales or dumpsters or whatever they do, um, is there is there a place where they would be able to sell? Uh, bales of recycled polystyrene if they were in that stream? Um, not sure the uh, supply chain for that, but I know that Amstai is interested in getting uh, densifiers out to those local lo locations. 
it's uh, mm-hmm. if you have foam and you don't densify, you're moving a lot of air around, and that's uh, cost prohibitive. But if you densify it, I think that's the uh, way to get local areas to get their polystyrene to an area that um, will convert it. Okay, so um, if does your company purchase uh, post-consumer polystyrene? Yes, we do. Yep, for the, in the, the Tigard, Oregon facility, we purchase that from a local sorting sorting company. And do you, would you be able to do that in Connecticut? Right now, I don't know if there's a plan to expand that kind of. Uh, you know, it's kind of localized. We were working in a place in uh, Chicago, large population area. But I think, um, you know, if there's, a, if there's a big drive for it and a big uh, need for it, it's possible. Right now, there's no plans to put anything in the New England area. Well, it would seem that a bill that proposed to ban the substance altogether would be a pretty good incentive for your industry to to uh, get on the ball and, and start uh, start moving on that, don't you think? Yeah, I, I, without having a stream of uh, recycled material that we can collect into, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to get the raw material. I mean, there's, it's gotta be, uh, in, in Oregon, they collect it and then we can, we can take it into our uh, facility that uh, converts it back into styrene, so. I think it's a it's a starting of a uh, circular economy. I don't know if uh, it's fully built out, but I think that I like to see circular economy in most of the things that we uh, use in our daily lives. And polystyrene is one of them. Okay. Well, it seems like it would be the it's sort of a chicken and egg situation where um, there has to be a market. Somebody's got to be standing there with a handful of dollar bills telling recyclers, we will buy this stuff if you start recycling it. Um, They're not going to push to include it into single stream and they're not going to start bailing the stuff up and separating it out um, unless they know that there's somebody who's going to buy it. And if you're telling me that your industry buys this type of stuff, it just seems like until they like you know otherwise just, otherwise bills like this you know are are going to go through um you know it just seems that that it makes sense for you know we we're not going to start a recycling program it will be up to you well but i, I appreciate your your uh, your coming in and giving us your answers thank you madam chair and uh uh thank you for your time thank you Thank you, Representative, uh, and uh, Representative Chavey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for speaking with us today. I, I had many of the same questions as uh, Rep Dubinsky. Um, kind of one follow-up. You said, I believe you said Oregon currently recycles polystyrene. Do, do you have any data um, what percentage of polystyrene actually ends up being recycled in states that do recycle it? I don't have that data in front of me, but... Uh... It's a pretty small number, if I remember. All right. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. And I don't see any other questions at this point. So uh, thank you, Mr. Lake, for your testimony. And then Senator Senator Cohen, number 30 for Elizabeth. She's back on. So I, I did hear her. So hopefully she's, she's all set to speak. Oh, good. Good. Welcome, Elizabeth. You're up. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Okay. All right. Um, Senator Cohen, represented for members of the committee. Um, I am Liz Raysbeck, co-chair of Groton Conservation Advocates and BYO Groton. And I just thought today it might be helpful to you to hear our experience in how we went about getting a, an almost total ban on single use plastic items. Back in 2019, GCA, Grant and Conservation Advocates, started having uh, conversations with the 
um, Conservation Commission uh, for the town of Groton. And they decided to put out a survey to see what people thought about banning um, single-use plastic items. And they, I think, surveyed for almost 500 people, 480 some people. I have a wrong number in my written testimony. And, um, and they, they, um, the results of that were extremely supportive. They had about 70 businesses reply and the businesses were quite positive and the rest were individuals. Um, so the, the council with our support decided to move forward with a ban. And uh, they had, um, they put actually a couple of bills out before they settled on the final one and had a couple of public meetings and of course a public hearing. And the, uh, uh, there was really no opposition to our ban, which includes single use checkout bags, styrofoam, basically all single use styrofoam, cups, plates, trays, um, <clears throat> plastic straws, and plastic stick stirrers. The only opponent who ever came to testify against the bill was uh, Dunkin' Donuts. And it was actually to our surprise, they weren't concerned about styrofoam because Dunkin' was already in the process of phasing it out. They were concerned about plastic straws. And for them, it was a cost issue. Uh, so we were able to pass a very strong ban with um, very strong support from the town. And um, so today we just want to speak uh, in strong support of uh, the bill 65. 6502, and especially want to know how important it is to include balloons and urge you to ban the release of balloons outright. Seems to me that your legislation is written in such a way that it will be impossible to enforce um, the release of 10 or more balloons that uh, that you really, there's really no reason not to just go ahead and ban balloons. They are death to the creatures in our aquatic environment. And a moment of pleasure is just not worth the devastation that they cause. I also want to say we support the study, section five of, uh, of your bill to have a study on compostable materials. Um, uh, single use, uh, uh, sing single use um, biodegradable bags. I, I just need to interrupt for one moment. I just okay. need to interrupt one moment because the timer went off a few moments ago and just that the three minutes is up. Am I up? Uh, the time the time has ceased for the three minutes. So if you would if you wouldn't mind to wrap up, please. Okay. Well, I, I'll wrap up there and just say we strongly support Section 5. A lot of interest in composting in Groton, but it's very confusing as to what materials are appropriate at this time. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Rizek, for your uh, testimony and, and for, uh, you know, BYO Groton and all the good work uh, that's been done there in, in um, making progress for a cleaner environment. Um, I don't see any questions from the committee. I also just a, a point, you know, as we're talking a lot about this, um, Section 5 deals specifically uh, with produce bags, but we will be at a future hearing um, talking about, um, likely talking about compost and anaerobic digestion. We, we have a lot of uh, bills uh, around waste that we've raised and um, so that that conversation will continue I'm sure um, so I don't see any questions from the committee and I just want to thank you for your testimony today thanks for being with us thank you uh, next on the list we've got Amy Ewing followed by Teresa Geary followed by Laura Simon 
how's that and I'm feeling? Hello, everyone. My name's Amy Ewing, and I live in Stamford, Connecticut. Um, and I want to thank the committee for the important work that you're doing. Um, all the bills that you're bringing forward uh, are worth your time, our time, the state's time in making improvements for our states. I also would like to encourage you that when this pandemic is over, you still keep a Zoom component for those of us who can't maybe come from Stanford to spend the day in Hartford, or last week I was in testimony that, that I gave at 1130 at night. So even though Zoom has its problems and its challenges, it does allow for more participation for more of your constituents, which um, I would encourage you to continue. Uh, I was made aware of uh, Senate Bill 925 by the Sierra Club and I'm not representing them. It's just like they, I uh, support the bill. Um, I, when I submitted my read, written testimony, I focused mostly on the threat of poaching and then the products that would come out of that poaching like decorative items or so-called uh, medical um, uh, purposes that so-called, they, they have no efficacy. Um, I'm a volunteer uh, docent at a zoo, and I'm not a spokesman for the zoo either, but through my docent training, I've become well aware of wildlife issues, and as a docent, I am an advocate for conservation. I understand the value that comes from biodiversity and from people finding ways like ecotourism to coexist with wild animals, animals that contribute to their richness and the wonder of our earth. Um, one thing that I, I did not mention in my written testimony was the specific problem of trophy hunting. And I would like to point con in contrast to uh, a tradition in the Maasai tribes that goes back hundreds of years where it used to be a rite of passage for young men to have to go out and track and kill a lion but NGOs have decided, no, that's not the only way that you need to, that you can show your strength and bravery. And they've actually come, in, come up with different trials. So I would encourage uh, trophy hunters to be similarly as creative and thinking other ways of showing their strength and bravery. Um, the conservation of the big six African species, and oh, by the way, in my written testimony, I referred to tigers, they're in Asia, they're, they're in trouble too, but I, I shouldn't have included them because they're not in the scope of your bill. Uh, the conservation of the big six African species requires education to reduce the demand for these animals, their parts and trophies, and then laws to reduce the supply and disallowing the import and trade of key African species and prosecuting all violators can help reduce the supply. Um, and then it's also important to protect the animals locally. And you wouldn't think that this bill at first blush would help with local protection, but by reducing uh, the amount of poaching, it keeps safe the rangers who help protect the animals from those poachers and it helps therefore the communities to be able to benefit from ecotourism that can bring well needed dollars into their communities. So I really uh, ask that you raise the bill SB6, uh, let's see, it changed its number, I'm sorry, 925 uh, and let, let's do Connecticut's part to help conserve wildlife. Well, that was good. You were right on the right on the mark. I heard the alarm going off. So perfect. Thank you, Miss Ewing. You're uh, any, any questions uh, for Miss Ewing? I don't see any oh, questions. I thought of one. Could I make one other comment? Uh, it's uh, earlier someone made a comment about zoos, and I didn't know if you if everybody knew that AZA's accredited zoos can't take animals out of the wild unless it's a rescue situation. So all zoos have species survival plans where they figure out how to breed animals that are farthest apart in their genetic makeup to keep as, as a healthy a captive poly, uh, zoo po population 
uh, so that they can be used in education of, for local people to, to viscerally understand the value of conservation and the value of keeping these animals in our world. Thank you for that uh, clarification. I do see Representative Michelle has a question. Thank you for, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Ms. Ewing. Uh, I'm from Stanford too, and so I really can say I appreciate your testimony and thank you for bringing the clarification. I also tried to clarify some of that information earlier, uh, but you also brought up a very um, uh, concrete points uh, and that was an excellent testimony. So I just wanted to recommend you for that and, and thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Representative, and thank you, Amy, for your testimony today. Okay, next we have uh, Teresa Geary, followed by Laura Simon, followed by Dr. Regina Milano. Do we have Teresa with us? Yes. Good afternoon. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Cohen, Representative Borer, Ranking Members Minor and Harding, and members of the Environment Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on House Bill 6504. First, I'd like to say that we greatly appreciate the work that the Department of Ag has done with this bill and taking it to the where it's gotten um, this far. We are also really positive about some of the changes in this bill, the increase in funds to participating veterinarians is a great step in the right direction. Increase to the feral cat funding program is amazing. That work is necessary and important to continue the health of those cats in Connecticut. And a lot of the language clarification will make um, the animal control officer's job much easier. We do have a couple of concerns. Um, in section seven, we are not inclined to support the recommendation of using 1963 municipal standards for groups that regionalize when they're building a new facility. It is, they're 58 years out of date and it, we need to come up with new standards and not keep relying on these old standards. So we're not in support of that. Um, and we'd be happy to work with the Department of Ag and other groups to create new standards that are up to date and, and not 58 years old. The other section in which we have um, a little bit of a struggle is section 12. We originally submitted some legislation to reduce the wound of unknown origin quarantine from six months to four months for those, cat, those animals that fit a particular criteria, meaning they were the wound was identified in 96 hours and a rabies vaccine was given to that animal and lessening that from six months. Um, the, the language that is in there now is suggesting that we need to go through a waiver process, which we do know exists. However, we would like it to just skip the waiver process and not put any more work on the Department of Ag and just add that into a, the, the determining agency can make that call based on the criteria that that animal meets. Um, and we think that would make it a little bit of a smoother, more streamlined process. So again, we appreciate um, your help and your listening to this testimony. And we look forward to working towards these goals. Thank you so much, Ms. Geary, for your testimony and for your work uh, with animals. Um, I do have a question about that, um, that quarantine period. Do, are, are shelters and um, folks that are um, keeping these animals in quarantine aware that there is a waiver process currently through DOAC? I'm not sure. I don't. I don't know for sure. Um, but it's it's not um, necessarily really publicly announced that that exists. It is written on the rabies um, flowchart that that we all use when we're dealing with these animals. Um, but it is in small print. Okay. So that it's not typically something that's used at this point. So six months seems to be the standard because that's the law. Yes. Okay. And when, can you just um, clarify for me a little bit more on section seven, uh, what the, what you're asking for? Well, we're asking that if shelters are regionalizing, we're asking that they remove the section that says, if you're gonna build a facility, use the 1963 standards for municipal facilities. We would rather that language just come out until new standards can be achieved. And then those regionalized, regionalized municipalities can then build um, over the next handful of years as they say fit, but we aren't going to build a facility that's outdated. Can you tell me what in the 1963 standards would require updating at this point? Yeah, so there's, not specifically, but there are some things in there that 
we have learned in animal welfare in this country over these years that can create a much more environmentally friendly um, environment for those animals, that they're more behaviorally sound and not in a concrete kennel with gutter drains, that they can be in a more comfortable setting while they're impounded for the period of time that they are. Um, and, and we've learned so much with between architects and other um, agencies who've built updated facilities that are still capable of housing these animals and yet maintaining disease control and other things that are appropriate. So, so it, it's time to take a look at, at the materials used. Um, there are far better ones that are, are still easy to clean and, and maintain those animals. Um, but certainly the settings some of these facilities have with cats and dogs very near to each other, um, we have an obligation to, to also maintain these animals' emotional well-being. Right. And are you aware of anybody who's taken a look at that, at those standards, you know, outside of the state and the agency of cognizance? Have there been any working groups around that that you're aware of? Yeah, there's there's some definitely some best practices out there. Um, the association of, um, and I'll have to get the exact name to you because the shelter veterinarians, the ASV have written standards for, um, this was done many years ago, but they're also updated and, and include the behavioral enrichment of these animals. So they, they do exist. And many shelters around the country refer to those. Okay, I would love it if you uh, could get those to me and we could disseminate some of that information to the committee. And just as we go to craft this language, we certainly don't want to have something that's outdated um, and cumbersome when we could have something that, as you say, is more comfortable for the animals uh, while keeping with all of the safety controls and standards uh, that need to be in place. Um, you know, I think that's, that's important. Absolutely, we will get that to you. I appreciate that. All right, I don't see any other questions. So thank you, uh, Ms. Gary, for your testimony. Thank you for your time. Have a good afternoon. You too. All right, we've got uh, Laura Simon next, followed by Dr. Milano, followed by Louis Rosetta Birch. Hello, can I be heard? Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, Ms. Simon. Thank you. Um, Chairman Cohn and members of the committee, I'm thrilled to be back to testify on behalf of the Connecticut Wildlife Rehabilitators Association, which is a statewide network of volunteer wildlife rehabilitators. And we are very concerned about House Bill 6504 because this bill would change the uniformity of the definition of animal and create a lot of confusion in the three chapters and the various sections that pertain to animal cruelty. Um, Annie Hornish of the Humane Society of the US already explained why this creates a big problem, but I wanna underscore that the definition as it currently stands in all these chapters and sections is defining animals as brute creatures, um, which may be archaic, but it is all encompassing. And what this bill does is change the definition so it only applies to domestic animals and some pet store species, which would leave out wildlife. And unfortunately, um, we are seeing a sharp increase in wildlife cruelty cases from people who are deliberately catching birds, ripping out their feathers, leaving them to starve in traps, um, all kinds of horrible situations where we've had to call upon deep and animal control officers to intervene. And we really need them to remain nimble and able to follow through on these cruelty cases, many of which occur on e in, in the evening or on weekends, um, but they need to be able to prosecute and enforce the law. And when you start changing the definition of animals and it, some chapters it may apply to wildlife and some not, it just creates so much unnecessary confusion. And so we, we object to this bill for that reason. Um, Additionally, in this bill, normally we'd support the sections that require that vet only licensed veterinarians can apply euthanasia. Um, obviously, that is the most humane and appropriate for domestic animals. Um, however, if this section is being applied by an animal control officer, um, we need them to be able to euthanize wildlife in the field. And often the most humane way to do that is properly place gunshot to the head. Um, they can't be trying to drag an animal to a vet and we don't want them encumbered with thinking that is the requirement. 
um, that would not be practical or possible. So we, we have concerns with that. Um, I also wanna briefly just mention our, our hearty support for SB 925 regarding the um, banning of body parts from six imperiled species. Obviously this is a common sense and vital um, an important bill and, and paves the way for Connecticut to play a key role in stopping this horrific trade. And we also heartily support House Bill 6502 regarding various plastic um, single use items. Um, we see so much wildlife that is not only entangled in plastics, you know, six pack dividers um, and balloons, but they have ingested a lot of plastic products um, from the items named in this bill and they die a horrible death. It just blocks their gut. Um, and it's just terrible to see and it, and it occurs to a far greater frequency than most people realize. So we strongly support this bill because it will reduce all these harmful plastic items that are thrown out in the environment and definitely imperil wildlife. So um, I did submit testimony, which I encourage you to look at, but um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Simon, and, and happy World Wildlife Day. And uh, thank again, you. thank you uh, for all of your help uh, in, in rehabilitating wildlife. I see Representative Dubitsky has his hand raised, followed by Representative Dillon. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, thank you, Ms. Simon, for coming in and talking to us today. Um, I wanted to talk to you specifically about your comments on the change in the definition of mm -hmm. animal under uh, 6504. Mm -hmm. um, I was interested to see your, in, to hear your interpretation that it, that this change actually limits it to, um, to basically dogs and cats and some, uh, and some pet shop animals, where we had the commissioner of agriculture indicating that this change actually expanded the definition um, to include all animals that uh, ACOs typically deal with. Um, so, you know, I too had was confused by the change, but I couldn't tell if really if it was limiting it or expanding it. Um, clearly, there's a dispute. You seem to think it's limiting it, and the commission seems to think that it's expanding it. Um, can you explain to me why you think this is limiting? Yes, I'm, I'm referring to the definition of animal on the first page of Raised Bill 6504. Yeah. And whereas previously, I'm just taking it at face value, and I read it many times over and consulted with people, um, whereas previously it said any brute creature, including but not limited to cats, dogs, blah, 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 a lot of species. The new definition takes out that language and puts in animal means any domestic animal bred, born, and raised in captivity, including, but not limited to, any cat, dog, other companion animal, list a number of them. And then it goes on to say, or any bird, amphibian, fish, or reptile offered for sale by a pet shop. But by stating, taking away any animal and replacing it with any domestic animal, that to me says wild animals are not included in this definition. Okay. Did you hear the uh, commissioner's testimony that there was, there seems to be a, uh, a typo for no better term? Um, throughout the bill where the word domestic is, um, sh should have been removed, but was not? I heard that. So my concern is fine if the word domestic is removed, then we're fine with that. But until that happens, this is of great concern. I thought he was also addressing that in some cases domestic appeared in others it didn't. Um, but he did not directly answer the question of whether wildlife would be included under the definition of animal or not. And so we remain concerned till we see the language changed. Okay, which is actually a good segue into my second question, which is, um, you know, I, I have in my experience, um, animal control typically does not get involved in animal issues. 
I mean, in wild animal issues. Mm -hmm. um, at least out here in Eastern Connecticut, if you've got a, uh, an, a wild animal that's either a problem or injured or you know anything, um, you call the ACO and they say that's wildlife that has nothing to do with us. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that this change in definition is intended to focus more on what ACOs actually do, um, which in my experience is they don't do wildlife. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Is it your feeling that they should? Um, it, here's the way the situation appears to me. Um, with injured and orphaned wildlife, wildlife rehabilitators work with ACOs. Often AC ACOs usually will not take in those animals, but they may refer calls to us. So they're not responsible for taking in injured and orphaned wildlife. But what this bill concerns and what our concern is, is wildlife cruelty cases. And that varies from town to town. In some towns, animal control officers are told not to get involved in wildlife cruelty cases. In other towns, they're given free reign. Um, we've worked with a number of animal control officers on some wildlife cruelty cases, and we've worked with DEP, DEEP, DEEP, DEEP. Um, but DEEP is often stretched thin, their officers are not available, and we've had some very good outcomes with animal control officers on cruelty cases. And just about every single one, we need urgent help right away, um, and we need to be nimble. And we have had some um, good outcomes, and I think the most um, the most notorious one involved a, a, a drowning of raccoons in front of children um, by a nuisance wildlife control operator. And that case alone was, um, was taken up by the animal control officer and resulted in uh, nuisance wildlife control legislation that the state now operates under, um, creating a better program for training and licensing nuisance wildlife control officers. So my short answer to your question is, um, we're talking about wildlife cruelty, and yes, some animal control officers in different towns um, do work on those cases, and we want them to continue being able to. Okay, um, but if the definition on the first page mm -hmm. is changed to include um, wildlife, mm -hmm. does that not give all ACOs the responsibility to now deal with them? If you're saying that some do, some don't, yeah, right. um, if they are included in that definition, it would seem to me that they would all now be required to do that. Um, no, that is not my understanding because the prior language, which said any brute animal um, was standing and different towns had different um, procedures for whether or not they would allow their animal control officers to handle wildlife or not. So no, this, this bill does not dictate that if, if you remove the definition, it will not dictate that they have to handle wildlife cruelty cases. Every town makes their decision on that. But what by being included, if a town does allow their animal control officer to handle a wildlife cruelty case, that officer will not be hampered by a lack of understanding which law they need to use to, to follow up with a cruelty case and whether there's restrictions that apply to domestics and not wildlife. You know, we're just saying keep the definition of animal uniform, keep it inclusive and let the towns decide what they wanna do. Okay, well, thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. it, my, I think my last line of questions is about um, your understanding of the limitations on euthanization. Mm -hmm. um, if you were listening when I was asking the Commissioner of Agriculture about this, um, I also interpreted it, you know, and, and I, again, I, I was not able to point to a specific line, but it seemed to me like the bill is limiting mm -hmm. euthanization to veterinarians. Mm -hmm. And I was, it, was, it was my feeling that it should not be so limited because there are other instances when other people do need to dispatch an animal to be right. the most humane. Mm -hmm. um, it, can you point to a specific place in the bill that gives you the interpretation that I also had, that it limits um, it to, to veterinarians? Well, I just looked at the language 
And the language seemed in the, the bill seemed to state that um, or any euthanasia of a, an animal under this section would have to be done by a licensed veterinarian. So um, it, just occur, it just seemed to me that, let's see, um, that it referred to such officer, whereas before it said may humanely destroy or cause an animal to be humanely destroyed. Um, it now says may have such animal humanely euthanized by a licensed veterinarian. So it seems that if a licensed veterinarian is not available, um, their hands are gonna be tied. What are they gonna do with a, a drastically suffering animal, a car hit animal, an animal that's mortally injured and suffering? Do they, are they able to use a CO2 chamber gunshot to the head or do they have to go to a vet? And um, we all know on, on weekends and after hours, really your only option are these 24 hour services and most of them will not see wildlife and you know, may or may not be available to humanely euthanize an animal for an animal control officer. Right. I so think I you think, and I interpret yeah. it the same way. Hopefully yeah. the department um, picks up on that and, yeah. and uh, suggests some changes to, to uh, make sure it's clear that, that all animals that are uh, in such condition don't need to wait for somebody to yeah. you know, drive 20 miles on a weekend evening to, to euthanize them. Well, I, I appreciate your, your coming in and thank you for your responses. And uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. And I do just want to point out because this has uh, come up again and uh, that, that uh, issue with the word in the bill of uh, domestic, mm -hmm. it, I went back and, and checked on it, and this is not something that is LCO's fault. Uh, this is the language that was provided, and that word was not bracketed. So it was just, um, it was it was done as requested. And so we'll have to make those corrections going forward, and I'm glad it was all brought to light. That's the purpose of the public hearing process, but just wanted to clarify that uh, as we move forward. Um, Representative Dillon, did you still have a question, or are you off that now? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I was concerned about raptors, actually, and how, how they would be treated under the current language. We have a lot of competition for space. I, I think, unless, unless Ms. Simon would like to clarify that, that the discussion with Representative Dubitsky may, may have illuminated part of the problem here. Um, but I, I haven't heard as much conversation about birds, and that's kind of they're kind of big where I live, you know, ospreys. And I know I live in a city, but we we have a a, a lot of a lot of uh, wildlife and, and raptors. Yeah. Right, right. Well, technically, wildlife rehabilitators in the state can handle injured and orphaned animals. Um, raptors um, fall under a federal permit <clears throat> because they're a protected species. So we have specially designated wildlife rehabilitators who handle them. If they're hit by a car or anything happens, um, we have a phone number, but you can reach us through DEEP um, and you can go online, um, Connecticut Wildlife Rehabilitators Association, and you can locate a rehabilitator. Um, most of our members are home-based, which means you know, they're available pretty much all the time and, and can help out. Um, but again, something like this, if there's a cruelty case or say it's a raptor hit by a car, we want and that animal is suffering. Usually when birds are hit by cars, <laughs> there's so much internal damage, there is no recovery option. Um, and if that animal is suffering, we do want that animal control officer or police officer or deep officer to be able to humanely dispatch the animal. And, and I'll give you an example. I was involved in a case where actually somebody tried to get a raptor, a, a hawk out of a tree, and they couldn't get the hawk. He was tied up in, in string and they couldn't get him out of the tree. And so they just cut his legs off to get him out. And I arrived on the scene and I was horrified as you can imagine, this bird is suffering, he's lost his legs. I mean, this person was well-meaning but I don't know what the heck they were thinking but that animal needed to be euthanized immediately. It was a weekend and we needed to, we couldn't take this animal to a vet, wait in line, try and find a vet, you know, we, we had to, um, utilize the services of the local police immediately. 
it was a horrible situation and not likely one you're ever going to hear about again. But but it just to underscore, there are sometimes emergencies. We always opt to use licensed veterinarians wherever possible. Rehabilitators do not want to euthanize animals themselves or have anybody else do it. So we work closely with vets. Um, and we do uh, most of the time when we have to euthanize an animal, it's only with our, our veterinarians. That's our preferred option. But sometimes you have these crises and you need to, to go to other means. So actually, thank you, Madam Chair, for noticing my hand was up because the clarity about the, about the raptors is, is interesting. <laughs> yeah. We knew that here. Thanks. Thank you, Representative. And, and thank you again, Laura, for your testimony. I appreciate you being with us today. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Regina Milano, uh, followed by uh, Louis Rosado Birch, followed by Joseph Mullen. Dr. Milano, are you with us? Oh, I think you're on mute. Welcome. Good? Perfect, yeah. Okay. Good afternoon, distinguished chairs and members of the committee. I'm here today to testify regarding HB 6504. I strongly oppose redefinition of the word animal in C uh, CGS 22327. I support increased funding for feral cat grant program. I support changes to the rabies quarantine period. I support SB 925, big six uh, trophy hunting ban. I support HB 6502, restricting plastics and helium balloons. I'm a science teacher and biology professor and Connecticut wildlife uh, licensed wildlife rehabilitator. I hold a doctorate in educational leadership and policy studies, and I've studied the use of language and policy making. In my years lobbying for animal friendly legislation, I've been concerned uh, by the diminished effects of subtle language changes to animal friendly bills, both at the state and federal level. And I'm disheartened by the lack of fidelity to the integrity of our words. It's one thing to architect bills that make compromises and something altogether different to bastardize words by arbitrarily redefining them. Biologists have proven that animals have intelligence, communicate, their, communicate and share the same range of emotions as human animals. We must not tolerate language that fails to demonstrate compassion and empathy for all, not simply animals as it pertains to a political, political agenda. Redefining the word animal in this case undeniably sets precedent for weakening animal cruelty laws long-term and may increase acts of cruelty against animals. I strongly oppose redefinition of animal because it would remove wildlife and community cats from protections. These issues facing cats are not of their own doing, but rather the negligence of humans, and it is unjust to impose such harsh punishments upon them, the victims, an all too common theme where animals are concerned. I support increased funding for the feral cat grant program and increasing reimbursements to veterinarians participating in the APCP and an increase to 20% of APCP income being used for feral cat grant programs. Furthermore, as a licensed wildlife rehabilitator in the state of Connecticut, I oppose the redefinition um, of the word animal uh, based on horrific situations I've encountered involving wildlife. Animals have come into my rehab with bullets embedded in, in them, languishing for days before being found or reported. One man baited arrow wildlife with the intention of eating them. A witness noted that the man often left these animals in crates outdoors without protection from weather. If you're not directly involved in the animal welfare arena, it may be difficult to imagine the heinous acts committed against animals, but these malicious acts are more common than many imagine. We need greater protections for animals, not fewer. To arbitrarily redefine the word animal would be an act of speciesism, discrimination in favor of one species, usually the human species, over another, specific, um, especially in the exploitation or mistreatment of animals by humans. Philosophers have argued that there is a normative relationship between speciesism and other prejudices. And psychologists suggest that speciesism relies on similar psychological processes and motivations as those underlying other, underlying other prejudices. We must be better than this. With your help, we can. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Dr. Milano. I appreciate your testimony. I see my co-chair, Representative Bohr, has her hand up. Yes, thank you, Senator Cohen. I want to, of course, thank you, Dr. Milano, for coming and testifying today. I am long familiar with 
um, Regina's work and her advocacy, um, and it's very admirable. So thank you for coming and all your advocacy. Um, in the beginning of the day, which seems like yesterday, <laughs> we did have the commissioner of DOAG on talking about the definition of animal and feral cat did come up and it was the intention not to exclude feral cat. And we've had um, more discussions over the definition of animal. So I think this is going to be a conversation that continues beyond the public health, uh, beyond the public hearing. Um, and your input is valuable. So we're gonna take back all this feedback and um, revisit the definition of animal. Thank you very much, that, that's appreciated. And um, it would be uh, wonderful to see that, uh, that legislation in written form. Thank you so much. Okay, thank appreciate you, it. Regina. All right, I don't see any other questions from the committee, so I thank you for your time and testimony. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, we've got Louis Rosado Birch, followed by Joseph Mullen, followed by Nathan Rowling. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you, Senator. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, honorable committee chairs, vice chairs, ranking members, and rank and file uh, members of the Environment Committee. Appreciate the opportunity to test testify today. Uh, for the record, my name is Lou Rosado Birch, Connecticut Program Director at Citizens Campaign for the Environment. I'm going to be testifying today in support of Senate Bill 927 and House Bill 6502. Uh, on 927, revisions to the sewage spill right to know law. You know, we strongly support updating and strengthening Connecticut's right to know law uh, to protect our, our surface waters and our public health. Our state continues to suffer from raw and partially treated sewage overflows. Uh, as a result of outdated sewage treatment infrastructure. Uh, this includes a, a sewer line failure in Hamden in June of last year, which resulted in a uh, upwards of 2 million gallon sewage spill into the Mill River and New Haven Harbor. And despite existing requirements under the law, uh, downstream communities, New Haven, uh, were not notified in a timely manner, uh, leaving the public unawares uh, to potential health hazards for several days after the spill. Uh, Connecticut Department of Energy and Environmental Protection has been working on a series of updates to the existing uh, sewage right to know portal to create a more user friendly uh, experience. CCE has been a part of these ongoing discussions along with Save the Sound, uh, Representative Reyes and some others. We are supportive of the substitute language that DEP is recommending including uh, leveraging existing social media tools such as Twitter or other available electronic platforms as a means to push messages out to the public. Um, the, the, their substitute line also moves a five gallon threshold for reporting spills uh, and requires reporting whenever a sewage spill reach a, reaches a water body. Uh, we think that that makes a lot of sense, acknowledges that uh, any spill that reaches a water body may present a public health risk. And uh, we also recognize that clear, consistent signage is needed in areas where the public is likely to come in contact with contaminated water. Uh, that signage needs to be conspicuous with clear directions and must offer uh, bilingual advisories as, as, uh, at a minimum. Uh, regarding House Bill 6502, uh, CCE remains supportive of state and local efforts to eliminate food packaging made from polystyrene, to promote the use of reusable straws and tableware, and to prohibit the reuse, the release of helium balloons that end up in our waterways. Excuse me. Uh, for many of the reasons that we've heard several times today, these materials contribute to plastic ocean pollution, threaten our wildlife, and take up unnecessary space in our waste, uh, solid waste stream. Uh, polystyrene, as you've heard today, is not currently offered for uh, recycling uh, by any of the municipal recycling programs. That means that new polystyrene packaging is primarily manufactured from virgin materials. Uh, polystyrene garbage is almost universally disposed of as municipal solid waste, which you know once again contributes to growing solid waste, waste management costs for cash-strapped munis municipalities. Um, and uh, CCE supports phasing out the use of foam lunch trays uh, for uh, educational institutions. We do recommend that the requirements of section one be accelerated to implement the phase out as soon as possible. Additionally, we recommend moving the effective date of section two to prohibit the distribution of 
uh, polystyrene food service containers no later than January of 2023. It's important to point out that effective, cost-effective alternatives to polystyrene food packaging exist and are already widely available and in use. Uh, and while it may be necessary to provide academic institutions with some time to discontinue existing contracts, uh, there is precedent for this phase out uh, and the replacement of uh, uh, polystyrene products need not be delayed uh, longer than necessary. We think that a six month to one year phase out is ample reasonable time to give retailers uh, uh, time to use up their inventory. And uh, we'd like to point out that New York State actually has passed a comprehensive ban on polystyrene food packaging uh, that, that passed in April of 2020. With Excuse phase out me, I just, I just need to interrupt. Just we cut off the timer a few times and I just wanted to let you know that the three minutes uh, was over. Sure, appreciate that. Just so you know, we can't hear that from here, but I, I appreciate you letting me know. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, you know, uh, the, I'd just like to close by saying, you know, a number of municipalities have already taken steps to reduce uh, foam, uh, including local ordinances in Groton, Norwalk, Stanford, and Port. We said we feel strongly that any statewide ban not preempt municipalities from passing their own ordinances. We believe that you know, when putting measures in place to prevent wet, uh, wasteful plastic pollution, the state should provide a baseline of protection and not a ceiling. And so I'll uh, conclude my comments there and happy to answer any questions that uh, committee members may have. Thanks, Lou. I appreciate it. I see uh, Representative Flora has her hand up. Maybe she doesn't. No, nope, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was my hand up from before. So now oh, okay. I can go back down. But <laughs> okay. while I have you, thank you, Lou, for being here. And uh, ditto, I concur with everything you said. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your support. All right. Representative Michelle. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Lou, as always, for your um, great testimonies. Uh, I'm just curious, I have a question because uh, stairs could keep coming up, uh, at least on my side. I was just wondering. Uh, is what's the uh, deal with steroids? Can we can't uh, is any industry like been fighting the fact adding steroids to the bill, or is there any drawback, or would it jeopardize or anything? Uh, just curious because I think steroids are probably even less used than uh, straws, but that's my impression. And then I was thinking it would be a good idea to maybe add it to the bill. What what are your thoughts on on this? Appreciate that, uh, Representative Michelle. We would agree that this is a somewhat of a low-hanging fruit. Um, the bill does not make any mention of plastic stirrers. These items are uh, infamously used for a few moments at a time and, and are not easily recycled. In fact, um, I think most folks uh, in the committee know that any plastic waste or any other type of waste going into the uh, single stream recycling program that's bigger than about a, or smaller than about the size of a dime, um, quite literally slips right through the cracks. And so those materials are typically disposed of as waste. Um, we have recommended in our testimony, amending the language to include plastic stirs in the definition of single use plastic straws uh, to prohibit their distribution or, or to prohibit uh, their distribution altogether. Um, Norwalk is another municipality that uh, has passed a, a legislation regarding straws and actually the Norwalk law uh, ordinance rather um, does contain an outright prohibition on plastic stirs. And so we, we think that's appropriate. We've also recommended in our testimony that uh, uh, along the lines of what Janine from BYO uh, recommended earlier, that uh, the bill be amended to apply the same requirements to plastic tableware um, as, as it would impose upon single use plastic straws. Uh, and further that the language be clarified to apply to takeout and delivery orders in addition to dine-in patrons. And thank, thank you very much for that. And then just for clarification, uh, I'm struggling with computers today, but in the polystyrene, in the in the EP, uh, in the polystyrene products, what, uh, what products are actually included? Did we, we did include old schools, is that correct? Or is there some limitations or? 
Uh, based on my, based on, there may be limitations to that, but based, based on my reading, uh, schools, school districts, and institutions of higher learning would all be uh, included in the requirement. Okay, that, that was just for clarification. Thank you, thank you, Lou, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Representative. Uh, Representative Dillon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hi, Lou, it's good to see you. Um, well, thank you. If I understand your testimony correctly, first of all, it's good to hear that that you're that you're tracking the the incident at the Mill River. Um, uh, it was and and I I had thought that everything was getting resolved this summer, but then I was confused by testimony this morning. Um, it's your position though that you support the language that's before us. Uh, we we've. Um... We've signed on in, in support of the substitute language that DEP is going to be uh, offering or, or may have already offered up to the committee. Um, you know, once again, we, you know, we've actually been in, in conversations with DEP about this issue since 2011. Um, we're, we're one of the one of the groups that worked to get the uh, law established in the first place. Mm -hmm. And there have been there's been a need for updates. Um, throughout this process, this is probably about the third amendment to the law to strengthen and to further clarify some of the responsibilities on municipal CEOs and, and, and what have you. So um, at the time uh, when, when the law was initially passed, uh, we were advocating for a real-time public notification system that could push alerts out to personal electronic devices um, what we ended up, uh, what the legislature ended up passing was essentially a, an electronic portal where wastewater treatment operators could report these type of spills electronically versus the paper by fax system that was in place previously. Um, and, uh, it became clear at that time, at that point in time, that there was a great deal of work that needed to be done in terms of modernizing the reporting system, getting to where New York is at. Um, and it became clear that there were some limitations, uh, you know, financial resources not being the least of them and, 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 uh, and technical ability to meet some of those um, requirements. And so at the time we thought it was a good first step in the right direction. We recognized that we would need to come back and, and, and readdress some of these issues over time and to DEP's credit, they have, um, you know, they've been very diligent in terms of they've identified a new contractor to help overhaul uh, the existing system. And, um, you know, we've, there's been a great deal of dialogue, including recommendations that we, the advocates have made for steps that they can take in house within existing resources. Um, you know, there, there have been some areas that we would we would like to see them go farther, but considering that they have really been working with us on, you know, in, in a what I believe is a good faith uh, effort to improve the system, we think that this is a, a good a good step in the right direction. <laughs> okay, but I'm still. Is your are you expecting that there will be new language brought forward, or are you supporting what's in front of us today? We, we once again are endorsing the language that DEEP is submitting, may have already submitted to the committee. I'm not quite certain. Okay. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks for what you do. Thank you, Representative. Thank you, Representative Dillon. All right, I don't see any, uh, oh, Representative Tomiko. Did you have a question, Representative? Yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, th th thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm inco incognito for a couple of minutes here because I'm bouncing around. So thank you for your forbearance. I, I do have a question for, um, for, for, for Lou, Lou Birch, if he's still available. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. Hey, Lou, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Good, good. So, Lou, I just want to ask you a question about 6502. So, so um, at the very end of the bill, um, it, 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 um, we've, it talks about the study of the single-use uh, plastic bags. You're familiar with that? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so the, the, the language that I'm looking at, unless I'm misinterpreting it, seems to indicate 
that that deep is, is going to accept an application on behalf of a single manufacturer of a single use produce bag is it just one manufacturer and if so does that make sense um i to be clear i think that uh that what you all have have offered in terms of compostable bags and a review of of those type of materials through case an independent inquiry into um into these materials makes sense M my understanding is that this section would not limit this opportunity to one uh producer um and uh and, and again, we, we think that this is a, a reasonable um, compromise. There's been a great deal of discussion about this issue. Um, we have uh, had conversations with, with uh, the folks here in Connecticut that are producing these materials, Novamont. Um, we've, we've also had some discussions with some of the composters that are on the ground doing this. Um, look, you know, we recognize we, we absolutely need to move away from single use plastics um, and look for as many opportunities to do this. Um, we certainly do not want to stand in the way of research and innovation, um, but we believe that that this offers a reasonable opportunity to those companies to provide the state and, 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 the, and the Academy of Science and Engineering with the relevant information that they need to prove their case, demonstrate that their products behave, you know, as advertised in a variety of environments um, and are safe for, uh, for distribution. Um, we have in the past had concerns and, and continue to, to have questions about, um, about the management of those waste products. And so, um, I would agree that ample public education is necessary before we begin transitioning uh, to a new type of plastic material. Um, but as far as as far as we're concerned, you know, the Academy of Science and Engineering, they, they have the, the resources and they have the tools necessary to look at these materials in an independent way. And uh, and, and we're supportive of that as a whole. I think the bill makes a lot of sense. You know, we've we've offered up some some recommendations to strengthen some of the other pieces of it, um, and um, and we hope that the committee. But regardless, we hope the committee will move forward with this bill as uh, as laid out. Uh, Lou, Lou, I, I appreciate all that, and I, I, I you know I appreciate everything that you said, and 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 but 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 the, the the one thing that I'm again maybe this is directed more towards the chairs than it is towards you. I'm looking at the language on lines 127 through 129 of, of, of this bill, 6502, it says that the, the, the commissioner of deep shall accept an application on behalf of a manufacturer of a single use produce bag. Wouldn't it be more appropriate to say an application on behalf of several manufacturers of single use produce bags or, or am I missing something? So if I, if I may jump in, because this, this language is, was not provided by Mr. Birch, uh, nor any of the advocates who have been asked this question. Um, okay. So the intent of the language is to allow an application from a any manufacturer, a manufacturer of a, a single use produce bag um, to be tested for compostability. We can certainly talk representative, um, if it makes you feel better to say any instead of a, the intent of the language is to allow any manufacturer who chooses to submit an application uh, to the department okay. and uh, therefore the Connecticut Academy of Science and Engineering, um, you know, for, for testing of compostability, uh, be allowed to do so. Okay, fair enough. I, I appreciate that, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Thank, thank you. We think that makes sense and we're comfortable with that as well, Senator. And thank you for your question, Representative. Thank you, appreciate it. Sure, and uh, next we have Representative Dillon followed by Representative Reyes. <clears throat> Representative Dillon, did you have a question? No, I didn't, ma'am. Okay, all right, thank you. My Zoom has been freezing, so. Oh, okay. You're not here, thank you. Sure, Representative Reyes, you're up. Thank you, Madam Chair. Simply uh, just want to uh, thank Mr. Birch for uh, his uh, spirited uh, advocacy and uh, in the 
always being a, uh, an available resource for us when we call. And uh, I stand in support of uh, most of the bills that he uh, testified in, in support of. And uh, I wanted to say that um, the, uh, that sewage bill, um, right to know, is uh, we've, grown, we've grown a lot since uh, the last few changes. I just had a question for Mr. Birch. We just had a spill back again in the Nogatow River, and uh, just out of curiosity, wanted to know if that, how did that uh, work electronically, and uh, where, how w did you know uh, prior to reading it in a newspaper or hearing it on the radio? Uh, no, sir. Admittedly, I, I was not. I was not aware. So I would. I would have to look at that, and and can certainly follow up with you and other committee members offline on that particular spill. Uh, as you as you know, there are a number of areas that have chronic sewage spill issues. And again, the whole intent of this legislation is to help provide additional, uh, you know, levers to the public uh, and, and additional transparency with respect to how, you know, those those spills are reported. So uh, my hope is that uh, that this will help to further clarify those type of incidents in the future, but I don't have specific information for you on that bill, on that spill at this time. Well, thank you, Mr. Virgin. Again, thank you for your advocacy and uh, for testifying here today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. And uh, seeing no further questions, thank you, Mr. Birch, for your testimony. Appreciate you being here. Thank you again. All right, next we have uh, Joseph Mullen, followed by Nathan Sterling followed by Sarah Baird. Welcome, Mr. Mullen. Madam Chair, am I coming through okay? Yes, hear you loud and clear. Perfect, thank you. Good afternoon, distinguished chairs, vice chairs, ranking members, and honorable members of the Environment Committee. My name is Joe Mullen. I'm a registered lobbyist in the state of Connecticut. I'm from Grafton, Mass. And I'm the Northeastern State's Assistant Manager for the Congressional Sportsman's Foundation the 501c3 nonprofit I represent before you today. Um, I would like to express my opposition to Senate Bill 925. I've also submitted a sign-on letter of opposition to the committee, um, which saw participation from uh, numerous other organizations. But for right now, I'd just like to touch upon some of the high-level points uh, with my time. Uh, I'd like to start off by recognizing the challenges associated with developing policies that regulate the take and uh, trade of wildlife across multiple administrative and regulatory jurisdictions, uh, primarily through the lens of international trade and commerce. Uh, however, Senate Bill 925 poses to have far reaching and unintended consequences that will negatively impact uh, the conservation of the very species that the bill intends to protect. Uh, protect. Um, this bill will also adversely uh, affect the people and the communities that rely on the much needed tourism dollars generated through uh, legal hunting. In the United States, we're fortunate enough to have the guiding principles of the North American model of wildlife conservation uh, to protect and promote the sustainable use of our fish and wildlife resources. Uh, these principles are possible through the American system of conservation funding, a user pays public benefits system, uh, which provides the necessary funds for implementing professional science-based fish and wildlife management throughout the nation. Uh, however, uh, across the world, um, you know, many African nations included, legal regulated hunting is the primary driver for conservation funding, wildlife management, and anti-poaching efforts. Uh, these hunting programs have been established to allow a limited sustainable offtake and to generate funds for conservation, anti-poaching, and uh, community incentives. Uh, the final point that I'd like to make or, or highlight here is that we have established uh, case law in the books regarding legislation such as this. Uh, looking back to 2016, uh, New Jersey passed Senate bills 977 and 978, which prohibited the import and possession of items from certain lawfully hunted big five species. Uh, the state was then sued by several organizations who argued that this ban was preempted by section uh, 6F of the Endangered Species Act. And uh, the presiding federal district court uh, quickly enter judgment against the state, ultimately overturning the ban. Um, I know I have to wrap it up here, but uh, I would just like to also highlight that in 2018, former governor of California, Edmund Brown, 
uh, stepped in to veto similar legislation that would have established the uh, iconic African Species Protection Act, um, reasoning that this legislation would have imposed a state civil penalty on activities expressly authorized uh, through the ESA, emphasizing that the bill would have been unenforceable. In consideration of these reasons, uh, I would just like to reiterate my opposition to Senate Bill 925. I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mullen, for, for that testimony. And can I just ask you to clarify, you, you mentioned that the bill would um, promote, uh, will actually create negative consequences to the species. Can you just expand upon that a little bit? In what way would there be negative consequences to this sure. species in particular? A absolutely. Um, you know, and the funds for um, that, that you know, are spent on um, international hunting such as this, uh, those funds go towards funding actual anti-poaching teams, um, giving them the ability to uh, hire more members, um, you know, and, and really have the latest technology and equipment to get out there and protect these species because, you know, the poaching and hunting are two separate things. Um, and it's, it's a constant battle to try and, um, you know, uh, put poachers in prison where they belong. So it's, it's your position that we should continue to allow for the hunting of these um, six species in particular, primarily because of the dollars they garner that then go to anti-poaching efforts. Also with assisting these, these nations in having a sustainable population as well. Of these particular species? Yes. Okay, uh, Representative Dubicki. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I was gonna ask the same question you just asked, so I will uh, refrain. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Representative. Any other questions for Mr. Mullen? All right, uh, seeing none, thank you for your time and testimony today. Thank you as well. Okay, next up we have uh, Mr. Nathan Froling, followed by Sarah Stared, followed by Joe Stelly. Welcome, Nathan. Good to be here as always. Um, dear Thank committee you. chairs, ranking members and honorable members of the Environment Committee, I am Nathan Froling, Director of External Affairs for the Nature Conservancy, and am pleased to express our strong support for HB 6497 enabling Connecticut municipalities to create stormwater authorities if they choose to. We're very excited to support this bill because stormwater authorities are a fair and effective way to address the serious issue of stormwater management and an issue that will become even more serious in a changing climate. Stormwater runoff is one of the worst problems affecting our lakes, rivers, and Long Island Sound, contributing to violations of water quality standards and low oxygen dead zones among others. Our region loses hundreds of beach days a year, millions in tourist income, and water dependent businesses are adversely affected as well. Storm runoff also causes flooding and significant physical damage to property and infrastructure. So stormwater authorities provide a reasonable approach for funding that is what funding what is needed to address stormwater problems. They provide a dedicated self-sustaining source of revenue to fund needed projects from rain gardens to sewer pipe repairs. Fees collected from landowners are small in comparison to the cost of the problem and are small for the vast majority of landowners. For most residential property owners, monthly charges are minimal, about $2 to $7. There are about 2,000 such authorities across the country, so this is not a new untried concept. Stormwater authorities are equitable because they charge property owners a user fee based on how much runoff they produce. All types of developed property pay appropriately. Stormwater authorities can be flexible to account for local concerns. For example, if a municipality wants to provide consideration for low-income property owners or other local priorities, they're able to do so. The costs for not addressing stormwater runoff are great and end up being borne by the same folks who pay the fees that we're talking about. It is financially frugal to address stormwater issues before they, necessi before they necessitate expensive repairs. <clears throat> we heard Bill Lucy mention a couple of examples earlier today on that. Stormwater authorities also help create good jobs, sustain a healthy environment, essential for tourism, fishing, oystering, and waterfront businesses. And finally, I think most notably right now with uh, some of the new federal stimulus money that we anticipate, 
Federal funding can be a significant source for support for stormwater projects, but typically these require a non-federal match that is often unavailable. Stormwater authorities can provide that match, allowing much greater overall funding to be realized. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Appreciate that, uh, Nathan. Does anybody have any questions? All right, seeing none, thanks so much for your testimony. You bet, good to see everyone. Thanks again. Thank you. Okay, um, so next we have Sarah Chair, followed by Joe Shelley, followed by Chris Self. Do we have Mr. Bear? Cyrus, yes, ma'am. Oh, Cyrus. Sorry you're about fine. that. I've only heard two names today. You won't, <laughs> you're you're not the first, you won't that. be the last. Do not worry, do not worry. Good afternoon and thank you to the chairs, Cohen and Bohr. And I also wanna thank uh, the vice chairs, ranking members and the rest of the committee for allowing me to give testimony today in opposition to Senate Bill 925. My name is Cyrus Baird and I'm the manager of, of government relations for Safari Club International, a not-for-profit organization with tens of thousands of members worldwide including right here in Connecticut, with the sole purpose and dedication to promoting wildlife conservation and protecting the rights to hunt worldwide. For your awareness, I've submitted written testimony on this legislation that I hope you all will be able to review. To keep things concise in the time that I do have, I want to clearly outline why Senate Bill 925 is bad for species conservation, bad for African countries, bad for law-abiding hunters, and bad for the state of Connecticut. First, Senate Bill 925 directly contradicts decades of scientific research compiled by the world's leading wildlife experts, ranging from the United States' own government and African countries to the International Union for Conservation of Nature and the parties to the Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora, commonly known as CITES. That research clearly shows that legal regulated hunting generates incentives that actually protect hab habitat reduce poaching, and encourages local stakeholders to participate in the conservation of these species. To put this in perspective, there is currently more land in Africa conserved as hunting areas than as national parks. Secondly, Senate Bill 925 will have detrimental financial impacts to rural communities in Africa who not only use hunting as a management tool in their conservation strategies themselves for the species in question, but also rely on the funds derived from hunting-related tourism as major revenue sources. Loc for example, local communities in Namibia and Zimbabwe currently receive 100% of fees associated with hunting, whereas fees related to photo tourism only go to a handful of individuals. I would strongly encourage members of the committee and supporters of this legislation to directly consult with African wildlife management authorities and government officials in Southern Africa before attempting to regulate their natural resources. And finally, this legislation is simply unenforceable. Established legal precedent shows that Senate Bill 925 would be preempted by Section 6F of the United States Endangered Species Act. In 2016, New Jersey passed similar bill and when challenged, the state conceded that it was not, could not be enforced. And in that same year, the US District Court entered, in, entered into a judgment against the state overturning the ban. Should this bill be enacted, Connecticut would very likely expend both financial and personnel resources defending the law, which clearly violates federal statute. In closing, hunting plays a huge role in species conservation, both in the United States and abroad. This legislation does nothing to protect the species in question and only seeks to harm law-abiding hunters in Connecticut and the citizens of the African range countries it claims to help. Please oppose Senate Bill 925 and thank you for your time. Thanks, Cyrus, for your testimony. Um, can I just ask, are, are there other species, you, you mentioned the uh, protected lands uh, specific for hunting use in Africa, are there other species aside from the, uh, the six listed in this bill that are hunted in Africa that, um, that hunters perhaps pay for uh, trips to, to go over and, and hunt uh, different animals aside from these called out? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Representative Dubisky. Representative, I believe you're still on mute. There you go. There we go. I think I'm on. Um, thank you, Mr. Baird, for coming in. Um, as you can imagine, uh, most of the members of this committee are unlikely to 
get in touch with any Namibian um, conservation officers directly. Uh, perhaps you have some type of uh, research that you can provide to us um, or some, uh, you know, some correspondence from them indicating that uh, what you say is, is the case and that, um, that hunting, uh, controlled hunting under certain regulations is, uh, is actually benefiting their uh, areas? Yeah, absolutely. I've, I've got as much research and data as you as you want to read and then to do one better I'd be happy to connect you or anybody with the committee uh, with folks in Africa who work for the various range countries wildlife um, uh, departments you know similar to our Department of the Interior uh, so to speak would be happy to make any contacts that I can. Okay now obviously one of the big questions is how if if somebody is coming into Bradley Airport with a suitcase full of rhino tusks or whatever it is, um, how how do we know that they were legally hunted and not poached? Well, you can't just bring rhino tusks in in your in your check baggage. Um, all of this is highly regulated within the Department of the Interior, specifically with the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, there are import export uh, paperwork that you have to fill out both in Africa and at the port of entry. Um, so it, it's, it's not as simple as just bringing something back in your check baggage. It's a, it's an entire process that's highly regulated and um, has oversight authority from the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. Would it, would it be fair to say that if you showed up in Bradley and you didn't have all of that documentation that the likelihood of those items being poached is a lot higher? I, you could make that assumption, yeah. I, I, we're talking about legal regulated hunting, which is a, a sharp contrast to poaching. Okay, um, well, you know, that, that may be something that is um, not well known. Can, can you just walk me through it? Let's say, um, you know, I have, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a rich guy and I have lots of time and I would like to go hunt something in Africa. Um, what, what do I do now um, to ensure that what I do is legal and, that, and to ensure that the money that I'm going to spend, which I assume is considerable, um, goes to the local community in, in Africa? Again, there, there are separate permits and paperwork associated with different countries. Uh, usually those are handled through uh, the different outfitters or directly through the wildlife departments that they have over there. Um, okay, can you give me an example? I, I mean, I don't have anything on, on my, at my fingertips, but would be happy to provide you with clearer examples after this if. Okay, because you know, I, I think there's a perception that um, people just kind of head over there, blast something and kind of pack it into the suitcase and bring it home. Um, and, you know, I'm sort of giving you an opportunity to explain what the real situation is um, and, and explain, you know, how the process works and where the money goes and why. Yeah, well, well permits are allocated through, let's... Um... Zimbabwe Parks and Wildlife Authority, Management Authority, um, use that as an example. That they're regulated through their own wildlife agencies in that in that country. So same way you would buy a, a hunting license in Connecticut through DEP, they're regulated through those local wildlife management authorities. Okay, so I I get in touch with a outfitter and I say, I would like to uh, go hunting in Africa. And they hook me up with the Zimbabwe wildlife authorities and I, I buy a permit, right? Okay, then what? And then you hunt. <laughs> okay, and then I, then I get on a plane and I go over there. And um, is there some, uh, some oversight in some way to make sure that what I'm doing is legal? 
no more so oversight than hunting in, in Connecticut. I'm, I'm confused, I guess, at your line of questioning. It's well, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to give you an opportunity to explain how, how the regulations work and to dispel the perceptions that exist that, um, that, that, that there is li little difference between poaching and legal hunting. Um, I'm trying to give you an opportunity to, to give us the, the procedures for doing this and, and explain why, why legal hunting is very different than poaching. So and I think the, the clearest, the sure. I mean, the, the clearest, the clearest example there is, um, you know, the, the tags and permits that you're required to get from these different agencies and, and, uh, you know, that poachers don't get licenses and permits. They don't okay. follow the law. Okay. Now you, you said it's regulated through the department of the interior. Returning? Or, yep, returning. Okay, how, how does that work? You know, apply for a permit and each case is reviewed uh, by the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Okay. And if, if accepted, if granted, you're, you're allowed to bring your trophy back into the country. Okay, um, and let's say I get a permit from the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, and they say, "Okay, we have checked this out, and you you've done everything correctly, and your money is going to the right people in the right place, and this is a this is a a legal conservation hunt." Um, they give you a permit, you get on the plane, and you come home, and um, I assume you have to show those documents at the point of entry. Correct. Okay, and if the point of entry is, um, let's say it's in Connecticut and Connecticut has some type of ban, uh, what would happen? Uh, that person would not be able to import that into that port of entry. Okay, so they have to go to some other port of entry. Uh, I guess theoretically, yes. Okay, all right, um, well, I. We're sort of hoping you could give us a little more narrative on this, but uh, if you can't, that's fine. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Representative Dubitsky. And uh, I don't see any other hands. Um, so I think um, I, I don't think there's any more questions. So we want to thank you for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I think next in the queue, we have Joe Scully, who will be followed by Chris Phelps. Uh, good afternoon, co-chairs Borer and Cohen and ranking members, Minor and Harding and committee members. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Joe Scully, president of Motor Transport Association of Connecticut. Uh, I am a registered lobbyist, by the way, uh, here to speak in opposition to Senate Bill 931 about California truck emissions standards. I did submit my testimony to you all, so I will try my best to uh, summarize my high level points as, as to why we are opposed. Um, first of all, it would put Connecticut based uh, small business trucking companies at a competitive disadvantage compared to their competitors in other states. Here in Connecticut, they would have to buy uh, more expensive trucks with uh, honestly unproven technology and those same rules won't apply in other states where the EPA uh, standards are accepted. I mean, we would be in Connecticut saying the EPA standards, you, you can't buy an EPA compliant truck. It has to be California, extra stringent standards. So I think one of the effects this will have is it'll probably push truck sales from Connecticut to other states. It may very well push trucking jobs from Connecticut to other states and then if that is the case, when EPA compliant trucks are sold in other states, they can just drive through Connecticut as usual. Um, you know, the state cannot um, turn these trucks away at the, at the border, for example. Um, so I, I think we'd really be, you know, shooting ourselves in the, in the foot here. Um, you know, I have a few um, 
data points what, that I included in my testimony, you know, one was from deep data, which suggested that only 2% of mobile greenhouse gas emissions come from diesel. And, you know, 97% of trucks are run on diesel. So to me, that says, you know, trucks are, are not the problem. Uh, the trucking industry has made tremendous strides over the last 30 years in, in emissions and environmental progress. Um, it would take 60, six zero of today's trucks to equal the emission of one truck uh, from 30 years ago. So we are making great progress through federal rules and that's what we need. Um, we have more federal rules on the books that are just now coming uh, to, to into effect. There are more in the works on low NOx standards by EPA. Uh, so I would say we need federal rules. I think there are other alternatives. We can, we can do uh, the DERA option that was mentioned earlier. The folks can't fund uh, for any trucking company that wants to voluntarily step up and say, I'll buy a newer, cleaner, more expensive truck if I can get a little bit of uh, uh, assistance through a grant. And by the way, literally destroy um, the older, dirtier truck. We've had members take big time advantage of the Volkswagen program to date. So to me, that shows that we, you know, we do care about environmental progress. I think we have a very good record of it, but we've got to uh, make sure we don't put ourselves on an unlevel playing field. Uh, we're an interstate industry and we need federal governance. And I suspect I'm probably running out of time and, and I did submit a lot of testimony. So I, I can I can stop there. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> so you stopped yourself before the bell rang, unless the bell rang, we didn't hear it, <laughs> but uh, but well-timed. And uh, thank you for your thoughtful testimony. You do have um, a question from Representative Dubitsky. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for coming in. Um, you, you said something that I, I kind of like you to flesh out a little bit. You said we can't stop trucks at the border. Um, Explain that a little bit, if you would. Yeah, what I'm saying is there will be trucks that meet the uh, EPA standard um, that Connecticut would, with this bill, would be saying that's that standard's not good enough. We're we're having a more strict standard, but in other states they will follow the EPA standard, uh, and then those trucks that are sold there in their course of business will be driven to Connecticut or, or through Connecticut or, or both. And um, my, my point is um, that this bill would prevent them from being sold here, but it can't prevent them from being operated here. Okay, so are, are you saying that trucks that don't meet a higher California standard would still be able to operate in Connecticut. They just couldn't be sold in Connecticut. Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, th think about um, big, big uh, trucking states, Texas, Oklahoma, Iowa, Arkansas. They're not going to do this. They have trucking companies that distribute products uh, all over the country, including to and through Connecticut. Um, and that will continue to, to be the case. Uh, th those, those trucks will still come through here, even though uh, the state is saying um, they're not good enough to be sold here, but they can't stop them from, from coming through or coming to here. Okay, so if I've got a trucking uh, dealership in, say, Danbury or someplace like that near the border, um, and Connecticut imposes a strict stricter standard, um, I could just move across the border and continue to sell my trucks and the trucks could continue to be operated in Connecticut, right? Yeah, you could, that's one way, or uh, many trucking companies or, or some, I should say, I don't know if many, including some of our members have locations in multiple states. They could decide, I'm gonna go buy my, my trucks and base them at my New Hampshire location, uh, as New Hampshire is not going to um, pass legislation like this. So that's jobs and business and commerce that is moving to New Hampshire because the company uh, decides um, 
I can buy an EPA compliant truck with proven technology at a lower price than I would be able to in Connecticut. So that's a decision they could make. So I, I want to make a distinction. You're, you're saying one, one is, I think your, your example was a trucking company um, that's, that's buying trucks and housing them and uh, housing them in another state. I was talking about a dealership, somebody who's selling trucks. Um, with regard to selling trucks, that is, is that the only limitation? You can't sell a truck uh, under the EPA standard in Connecticut? Uh, you are correct. And kind of further to your point, I, I believe um, dealership groups will oftentimes have more than one location. So they, if they felt they needed to, they could move their dealership from some town in Connecticut to a nearby state that was not doing this because that is where the, the business would be going. Okay, and just for the, for the record, can you just tell us why the Connecticut couldn't stop the trucks at the border? I mean, it's, it, it's interstate commerce, um, you know, uh, uh, under uh, the international registration plan. Um, if you are, if you are, if you are properly credentialed, registered through the international registration plan and you have Connecticut on what they call your cab card, uh, you can, you can go to or through Connecticut. Uh, it would be a violation of that. And it would also just be highly impractical for some law enforcement agency, whether it's uh, deep or state police or something to stop a truck and, and, and try to figure out what standard did it meet? Did it did it meet the EPA standard or the California standard? It just it's just not going to happen. Okay. Now, when you say interstate commerce, you're referring to the United States Constitution's in, uh, interstate commerce clause, I assume. Uh, absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, well, thank you for your time. I very much appreciate it, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Dubitsky. Senator Cohen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Mr. Scully, for your testimony. I, I just want to clarify, you're aware the intent of this legislation is not to stop trucks at the border, but rather to uh, begin to get medium and heavy duty vehicles to conform to certain standards going forward uh, for new medium and heavy duty vehicles, correct? Right, right. When I, when I mentioned stopping trucks, I, I, I realize that's not the goal, nor is that going to happen. I'm just saying that um, a likely result of this, um, because we would be um, setting a standard that would uh, require the purchase of more expensive trucks um, with yet to be proven technology, the very trucks that Connecticut is saying are not good enough to be sold here are going to be sold in other states and they're going to come here anyway. That, that, that's, that's my point is it's, 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 it's pushing it to other states and, and because they could still come through here, I have a hard time seeing how this is going to improve our, um, our emissions standards while I do see how it would it would be bad for business here. So I, I'm not sure you're aware, um, Mr. Silly, but we are one of 15 states who's entered into uh, the zero emission vehicle memorandum of understanding. So we're not sort of standing alone, though I appreciate <laughs> Connecticut's uh, willingness to be a leader on this. Um, we're certainly not um, you know, alone in this. And so we wouldn't be the only state requiring uh, zero emissions vehicles by 2050 um, for medium and heavy duty vehicles. And just for the record, those include many of our neighboring states, including New York, New Jersey, Maine, Massachusetts, uh, Rhode Island, uh, Vermont, many in the area, including the District of Columbia. So we really, as a region, have established this memorandum of understanding. And would you say at this point, uh, with an emphasis on global warming and greenhouse gas emissions and the recognition that 
we are in this state and in many others in non-attainment when it comes to those national ambient air quality standards, um, that this is sort of the direction that the industry needs to head in in order to address the significant, um, you know, detriment uh, that that these emissions are having on our air quality and impact to our ozone and thereby global warming. Um, I, I would just, uh, again, go back to the strong record that our industry has achieved through federal standards. The fact that um, MTAC members really stepped up during the first two rounds of um, the deep Volkswagen grants to say, we, we are gonna buy these cleaner new trucks. I will literally destroy an older truck. And I think that's an important point because oftentimes they will, they will sell it on the used truck market. They're saying, I don't even care about that. I will destroy this older, dirtier truck if, if I can get um, a cleaner new truck. And I would just very, as respectfully as possible, point out that this, this, this bill is being pushed by deep under the guise of um, you know, emissions reductions as they seemingly have no problem with the uh, Killingly plant that is going to emit 2.2 million tons of CO2 annually, which is 13% of Connecticut's emissions. And as I said um, before, their data also says that uh, diesel powered vehicles are only 2% of, on, of um, greenhouse gas emissions. So I just, um, I think it's got to go, <laughs> It's got to go both ways, right? Um, trucks can't be the only bad guy while we have other sources of emissions uh, to consider. You know, I think, you know, I think the transportation industry, we've seen a lot of data that the transportation industry has a significant impact on emissions uh, in general. Uh, and I'm not just talking about medium and heavy duty vehicles, I'm talking about all vehicle emissions. Um, and the effort um, of, of our state to reduce those emissions, I think is really important. But to your point, I think uh, absolutely we should be looking at other sources and we are doing so in the state. I know I introduced a bill uh, for a moratorium on those fossil fuel plants. I'm with you on that. I do not believe we should be burning uh, fossil fuels at this point and creating more carbon emissions. But similarly, I think we need to be moving in the right direction on uh, medium and, and heavy duty trucks and, and doing all we can. And I think at this point, you know, seeing that there's uh, 15 states that have signed on to this memorandum of understanding, knowing that globally we have an issue and knowing that the federal administration is taking a close look at this, that it would behoove the medium and heavy duty truck industry to uh, be moving in that direction as well and to look at uh, sort of cost, of, uh, cost efficient alternatives uh, to, uh, you know, and long-term solutions to the serious problem that we have around the globe, not just here in the state and not just here in this nation. Uh, but I appreciate your testimony, testimony today, Mr. Scully. All right, thank you. Thank you, Senator Cohen, and thank you, Mr. Scully. Um, I don't see any other hands up, so I think that concludes the questions and the comments right. on thank your you. testimony. Thank you. Our next speaker is Chris Phelps, followed by Alicia Charamont. Um, hi, thank you, Representative. Hope you all can hear me. Um, I'm Chris Phelps with uh, Environment Connecticut, uh, State Director in the organization, and I've um, submitted testimony on a couple of bills before you. I'll try to summarize my points, then speak to some of the things that have been raised throughout the course of this hearing. Um, but one of those bills is the one that you were just talking about with Mr. Scully, Senate Bill 931. Uh, in contrast to, to him and his organization, Environment Connecticut strongly supports this bill, as you might guess. Uh, and, and that support dates back uh, on this issue to 2004 and before, uh, when Connecticut adopted, as has been discussed, the California Emission Standard Program for light duty vehicles, passenger duty vehicles. Um, you know, as I was listening to Mr. Scully, I, I, I was having flashbacks to that debate over 15 years ago now. Uh, a lot of the same 
opposition arguments that he just made in response to this bill or about this bill were being made back then. And I would just suggest that, frankly, the, the proof is in the pudding on how these standards actually work when enforced by Connecticut and multiple other states around the country, including California. Uh, when it comes to light duty vehicles, they've saved money for consumers at the pump. They've dramatically reduced emissions and strengthened our economy and positioned our state as a leader in the pursuit of clean technologies, in this case, clean vehicle technologies. It's been frankly a win both economically and environmentally. Um, we strongly believe, and as our testimony points to, that, that the same dynamic plays out with this bill as well. And I'll just point out one thing in response, direct response to Mr. Scully um, and the points he was raising. Connecticut isn't doing this in a vacuum, as Senator Cohen pointed out. In fact, all of our neighboring states are moving forward at various stages with this exact same policy. Uh, we're not talking about a scenario where someone might just hop across the border to buy an uh, EPA compliant truck versus a California compliant truck. They'd have to hop across multiple borders to do that. It's in the real world, the real experience, as with light duty vehicles, is that just isn't a concern that plays out negatively for Connecticut. Um, I'll leave it there and I'll be happy to answer any further questions on that later, but I want to touch on the other bill, 6502, before I run out of time. Um, this bill largely dealing with single use plastics is one we, we strongly support, particularly sections one through four. Um, primarily because you know our, our position on the issue of single use plastics and plastic products is that nothing that we use for just a short period of time from, from your minutes, like a plastic bag or a polystyrene container ought to pollute the environment, harm wildlife and exist persist in the environment for hundreds of years to come. Uh, I, I won't speak to the details of our testimony, and I'll just wrap up by saying um, there were comments earlier about polystyrene recycling, for example, and one question I think Representative Chafee asked, I believe the answer to is that currently less than 1% of polystyrene is actually recycled. Um, there are various reasons for that, but most to the point is that uh, what recycling is happening doesn't actually apply to the, to the materials mentioned, uh, products mentioned in this bill, because what recycling is happening happening doesn't apply to, to food products, to uh, food containers, for example, because those contaminate the recycling stream. They can't effectively be recycled. Uh, I also have other comments about compostable bags. I'd be happy to touch on if you're interested, <laughs> as well as straws. Um, I'm very sympathetic, and we are very sympathetic to the comments uh, on the straws question uh, from uh, Kathy Flaherty earlier. And I think they're um, there's a lot of best practices on this, some of which are reflected in this bill for how to address the very real concerns and, and needs of the disabled community on that topic. And I think there's room for, um, frankly, consensus on that. And I hope this bill can drive in that direction. I'll stop there because I'm sure I'm over three minutes, but I'll have, I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I had a couple of questions, but I am going to defer to Senator Minor. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, uh, trying to operate off of my cell phone. Um, so if, if uh, Mr. Phelps could forward to the committee uh, the uh, information that would back up the claim that uh, California emissions saves money at the pump, I'd be very interested in taking a look at that. Um, and if you could get that uh, to our clerk, uh, she can then disseminate it to the rest of the committee. Thank you. Sure, I'd be happy to pull uh, information together uh, for that, Senator. Um, just speaking just anecdotally on my experience with the California emission standards for light vehicles, um, the, the car I drove in 2004 got about 20 miles to gallon. The car I drive today gets about 90, but I'll provide more uh, I've, I've, written response. I was, in the, I was in the car business when the state of Connecticut pursued that, uh, so I'm I'm yeah, I'm pretty sure that what you're going to find me isn't going to show me what you said, but that's okay. I'd love to see it. Thank you. Fair enough. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Minor. Representative D'Amico. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, th thanks, Chris, for coming to testify. Um, I, I thought I heard at the end of your testimony that you wanted to make some suggestions as to how to improve Bill number 6502. If I heard that correctly, I'd be uh, happy to uh, hear what you had to say. Um, sure. I, I, I think, um, well, I, 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 we haven't offered specific suggestions to, to change the language, although I, I, I was listening to Ms. Flaherty's 
comments about straws, for example. I think that was the context I, I mentioned that in. Um, and and the, need, the needs of the disabled community uh, in that regard. And I think, um, I know a number of jurisdictions around the country, uh, probably the largest of course being California, have already enacted policy in this area as well as many municipalities, et cetera. And I, I guess what I was suggesting is that, and I know this bill language does try to speak to the question of how to balance those needs uh, with also the, the desire to reduce plastic pollution from that source, uh, that we, we really look to um, the best practices and the experiences of those jurisdictions um, to ensure that, that we're, we're talking about, um, uh, and I'm, I'm blanking on the phrase I'm looking for, but in this bill, it basically is, a, is pointing towards, as I understand it, ensuring that straws are available to disabled customers in restaurants, for example, upon request, but without caveat, if you will. Um, if this language isn't sufficient to accomplish that goal of meeting, accommodating that need um, appropriately, um, there ought to be room to, to answer that question without just striking the section altogether and not dealing with the issue, is, is my point. I, I'm not sure I, that's very responsive I, to your question. I'm sorry, Representative. No, that, no, that is very responsive, Chris. I, I appreciate that. And, and I, I was thinking that, that along the same lines when, when Kathy Flaherty was giving her testimony. Um, the, 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 and I appreciate the fact that you pointed out that other states have been able to do this successfully. Uh, you know, I think we need to look at what other states have done in this regard. And I, I can't believe that we, after, after all this time, we've been kicking this around for a couple of years now, that we can't come up with language that satisfies the needs of the environmental community as well as the needs of the disability community. There ought to be a way to do this. But anyhow, that's for, that's for another time. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, would you, agree with that. I would agree with that and say not only should we, I think or not only can we, but we really should because, you know, I, I don't want a bill language on this bill to pass in Connecticut that have the effect of, in effect, you know, discriminating against dis, you know, my disabled neighbors and family and friends. I, that's just not I don't think it's an either or choice, but that's certainly not a choice I, I think anyone wants to go to agree to in any, or, or have happen, so. Okay, agreed. All right, thanks, Chris, appreciate it. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. Um, and, you know, just to follow up on the straws and not to belabor the point, what I, what I was trying to say earlier, maybe I didn't communicate it so well, is one of the issues we had last time about requiring straws to be available is some restaurants don't have straws at all now. So in passing this, but mandating the restaurants to have them available for those who may need them, will actually be requiring a restaurant that doesn't have them to have them. So I think, does that make sense? So I think we have to come up with, when we work on this language, we have to come up with a way that, you know, it's a small percentage or, um, you know, supply um, so that we satisfy those customers, um, but aren't now requiring the restaurants that don't have straws at all to carry straws. Yeah, I, I think I follow that. And I, and I would agree one of the sentiments involved here or one of the contentions involved here is you, you don't want to, and I, I, and I hear it in what you just said, you don't want to create um, the word I'm hunting for, I'm sorry, a, a burden on that disabled customer. You know, right. that they have to right. overcome. That, that's not what anyone, that, that just would be wrong. I don't think anyone yeah. would have disagreed like, with that. Um, but there have to be ways to yeah. meet that test. There have to be. That's my As hope. Representative D'Amico said, right, we want to get rid of the plastic, but we want to accommodate. And we're smart enough to figure this out, right? I hope um, so. And then, you know, we've, we heard a lot about the polystream today. And I will just say that as we've been sitting in this meeting, we've been going on, what are we, we're in going on eight hours, um, all these students have been tweeting, you know, and tagging myself and Senator Cohen. And it's just an indication that the younger generation is advocating so much for these changes because they see it and, you know, it's their future. And it's, you know, it's great to see their advocacy, but it's also very telling that, um, you know, they're the ones who don't have the old habits that some of us have who are older um, that they are, they're the ones who are willing and wanting to change um, as much as we do. And then the other thing is, I know we are the Environment Committee, we're not the pop Public Health Committee, but we never talk about the public health risks. It's ironic that the styrofoam we talk about is the styrofoam that's used 
in restaurants for food. And we know that styrofoam leaches polystyrene into the food. And we know that that um, has ties to carcinogenics. So I just wanted to say once, I know we're an environment committee, but I just had to get that out there once. <laughs> and your point about the, the how much resonance this issue has with young people is, is right on the money. I mean, uh, one of the first environmental shows I got involved with as a, as a young person three decades or more ago now was this issue actually. Um, but uh, so it was a little bit of a surprise to me in 2019 when our organization, which as you may know, run a summer citizen outreach door to door canvas about talking to people in the state about environmental issues. And in 2019 was the last time we ran it because of COVID um, we were talking to people about polystyrene containers about this topic in this bill. And we had, that was the, the summer in recent history where I think the first summer in over 10 years, we, we just had more people, more young people come work on that canvas than ever before. They were actually just motivated by that issue. And uh, I'll be honest, I'm maybe a bit old and cynical. That surprised me <laughs> in a very great way. Um, this is an issue that's both result, you know, it is both motivates people, young and old, I think, but also is, is, is an issue that you know, we, we can just do. We have the ability to switch away from these products. And I think that uh, that experience in 2019 um, reinforced that point for me. So anyway, okay. I'm sorry, sorry to go on about that. But no, I that's great. You've been advocating a long time. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, so I do not see any other hands up. So I think that concludes any questions or comments. And so we want to thank you for your testimony tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Okay, our next speaker is Alicia Charma, followed by Ann Gadwa. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. So um, I want to thank the, uh, the co-chairs and the committee um, for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Alicia Charmet. I'm the executive director of Rivers Alliance of Connecticut. Um, and I am uh, here in support of 6496, an act concerning soil related initiatives, sections two through four, um, 6497, an act um, concerning stormwater authorities, and 927, an act concerning revisions to the sewage spill right to know statute. Um, I was the chair of the uh, Rivers Subworking Group of the working or the, the Working and Natural Lands Group Work Group of the GC3, the Governor's Council on Climate Change. And one of the near-term recommendations in our report was the to pass enabling legislation for stormwater authorities. So we're very pleased that this uh, this is being brought forward. And um, I will. Um, uh, Bill Lucy and Nathan Froling already gave you fantastic information on this, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, also, um, also related to the Governor's Council on Climate Change is the soil related bill and sections two through four essentially give the uh, soil and water conservation districts um, really statutory authority to do what they've already been doing. Um, and Denise Savage will be here later on in the hearing. And um, uh, she will be able to answer questions on that. Um, and um, I, I'm leaving for the sewage, leaving the sewage right to know statute for last. Um, I'm a little bit of a wastewater geek, which makes me really fun at parties. Um, and at, at, at Rivers Alliance, obviously, you know, our greatest concern is water quality and water quantity for all uses. And um, it's really important for folks, first of all, to understand that our wastewater control authorities are really taking the waste that we create in our businesses and homes and make it clean enough to uh, put back into our rivers so that we can fish, um, swim, and uh, paddle, whatever you want to do in them. So their job is really important. And I, I see this sewage right to know um, these changes as a way not only to let people know when there are concerns in their rivers and streams, but it's an education so people understand why we have to invest in our wastewater infrastructure. It is too often overlooked because things go down the drain and people don't think about it anymore. 
Um, so we were part of the stakeholder group that worked on um, work with DEP on this language. Some of the main items are there. We're still working on some of the specific language and we hope to have that to you soon and work with you as well because you are all stakeholders um, as well. And, and, and I've been listening through this whole time and hearing um, what some of you have had to say about what's happened in your communities. And I very much appreciate that. And I'll take any questions if you have them. Thank you very much. Hold on one second, I lost the participants. No, you actually don't, you don't have any questions. So thank you very much for your testimony. Thank and you. thank you for your patience while you waited. Okay, our next speaker is Ian Gadwa. Hope I'm saying that correctly. And then- I don't, have, number, I don't have number 44. I don't have number 44 on the list right now. Okay, I don't see 45 either. I don't have 45 as well. So we'd go on to 46 for Paulina after this. Okay, so, Anne. oh, so this is Anne. Okay, and then Paulina is after Anne. Yes. Thank you, Representative, you said it perfect. Um, Senator Cohen, Representative Borer, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. My name is Anne Gadwa, advocacy and outreach organizer with Sierra Club Connecticut. And I am testifying today in support of Senate Bill 925 and House Bill 6502. Sierra Club supports Senate Bill 925. We support it in the hopes that it will help protect these animals by helping to curb trophy hunting. Scientists have called the time we are living in the sixth great extinction. Many of these extinctions are caused by human activity and it is imperative that we do all we can to preserve the biodiversity of the earth. The animals listed on this bill are all threatened species if not downright critically endangered. Trophy hunting these animals not only lessens the numbers of the species, but it also adversely affects other animals and the ecosystems around them. As the United States is the world's largest importer of animal trophies, we are in a unique position to act to protect these animals. Often touted as a boost to local African economies and a funding source for conservation efforts, actual numbers show that it is neither. There are certainly better ways to fund conservation efforts and less cruel ways of boosting local economies such as ecotourism or picture taking safaris. And trophy hunting often blurs the line between legal hunting and illegal poaching creating a danger to park rangers, law enforcement, and local communities. Like I said, we have a unique opportunity here in Connecticut to help preserve and protect world wildlife, and we should absolutely take it. Sierra Club also supports House Bill 6502 with some recommendations to strengthen the bill and provide for local efforts to further eliminate plastic waste, as you can see in our written testimony. As I am sure you are aware, plastic pollution is a danger to wildlife, ecosystems, and human health. Most plastic is made from fossil fuels, contributing to greenhouse gas emissions, which is fueling the climate crisis that is already upon us. Most plastic is not recycled, even when there is the option. So we must take steps to reduce its use as much as possible to stem the tide of trash that threatens to engulf us. Banning polystyrene, excuse me, should really be an easy one. It's not recyclable here in the state, it breaks up into microplastics and overburdens our waste stream. There is a slew of other options for takeout containers and many municipalities have already banned it. It is simply not a necessity. We also support prohibiting food service establishments from providing single use plastic straws unless requested by a patron. We would also like to include plastic stirrers and plastic tableware in the language of this bill. There are many other alternatives to these items. Prohibiting the release of helium balloons into the atmosphere should also be an easy one. This just contributes to the plastic problem plaguing our oceans. Nobody wants to see a sea turtle or a pelican choking on a helium balloon or see one in the belly of a beached whale. We absolutely should enact a total ban on helium balloons release. Finally, we support a study of um, compostable bags, I guess. Um, if they are a viable replacement for traditional plastic bags, we need to know if they are truly better for the environment, particularly if they're going to be advertised that way. Plastic waste in general is completely out of control. We must reduce its use wherever possible. We urge the legislature to pass this bill with the recommendations from our written testimony. Thank you. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. I'm looking and I don't, questions get fewer and fewer by the end of the day. And it's not because our meetings are long, it's because the questions have been asked and they have been answered. 
um, and we've discussed it. So um, no questions or comments is a good thing. That means we're, we're, we're getting to the bottom of the issues um, and uh, have covered a lot of it. So I wanna thank you for your testimony and we really appreciate you being here. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. Okay, so that was Ian. So our next speaker is Paulina Munn and Paulina will be followed by Omar Terry. Thank you so much. Um, hello everybody, my name is Paulina Munn. I am a graduate of Cornell University and have personally witnessed firsthand the incredible value of wildlife tourism. And I'm speaking today to try to dismantle the myth that trophy hunting is the only viable tool for conservation available for countries in Africa which is why I'm very excited to support raising SB 925 as it is an essential first step towards a sustainable future. The six species noted in the big six bill, particularly the black rhino and white rhino are all crumbling under the weight of our inhumanity and antiquated and inadequate solutions to find, fight the rapid decline of biodiversity. While I do not personally support trophy hunting as it is, I can appreciate the revenue in tourism and direct conservation funding that trophy hunting created for the countries in Africa. However, I note with emphasis that the necessity of trophy hunting of non-nuisance animals to fund most African conservation is at this point orchestrated and preserved by government regulations and not effective in the long term. The argument that reducing demand for trophy hunting would be a conservation and fiscal disaster not only fails to recognize the undue burden that Connecticut would bear, would have the ethical obligation to bear in ensuring no illegally obtained trophies were laundered into the state, but also neglects to highlight the fact that trophy hunting as a tool for conservation exists only because our conservation systems have been structured that way. Unlike the early days of big game conservation, the world today is vastly different with more people preferring to travel to see wild animals and leaving them alive than going to kill them. Those who continue to promote hunting as a requirement for wildlife conservation, unfortunately, are also the entities that have inherited a significant conflict of interest created by our outdated conservation models. This conflict of interest is often muddled by confusing figures on the economic value of trophy hunting versus wildlife viewing tourism, with barriers to tourism being not only the effect that hunting has on wildlife behavior, which makes them harder to see, but also the reality that pro-hunting groups have historically opposed the exploration of alternatives by citing the conservation dollars lost if hunting were to be reduced. However, there are multiple studies of models that have managed to break through these barriers and have successfully pivoted in a sustainable direction. These models provide irrefutable evidence that the reason conservation relies on trophy hunting is because that is the only real system put in place, not because it's our only option. Agencies offering testimony against raising this bill in defense of the trophy hunting industry's well-being and that of the conservation movement have either intentionally or negligently failed to acknowledge that consumptive tourism, meaning hunting and fishing, is in sharp decline. And that is a reality that all of us must recognize and embrace as a clear indication that it is time we explore other ways to conserve. For these reasons, I support SB, raising SB 925 as it is an essential first step in Connecticut's embracing of a sustainable future that beckons wildlife agencies at home and abroad to find better and more sustainable solutions to save the biodiversity and habitat on our planet. Thank you and I'll take any questions you have. That was perfectly timed. Was it? Oh, great. <laughs> it was. It was. We didn't hear the bell ring and you got in all of your um, important uh, statements and comments. So um, we do have a representative who would like to ask you some questions and that's Representative Michelle. Absolutely. Thank you, Madam Chair. No, I just wanted to make a quick comment. That was a great uh, testimony, Paulina, and for sake of time, I'll keep it short, but thank you for coming and testifying. Of course. My pleasure. Thank you, Paulina. Thank you for being here and we'll certainly take your comments into consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Patricio. Patricio. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Hey, good afternoon, co-chairs, Cohen and Bohr, vice chairs and members of the committee. Um, thank you for holding this important hearing and for the opportunity to provide testimony today. My name is Patricio Portillo and I'm a transportation analyst at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Um, this morning I'm testifying, or this afternoon now, I'm testifying in strong support of Senate Bill uh, 931. This bill is vital to give Connecticut the tools it needs to meet its air quality and climate goals by addressing toxic emissions from the dirtiest vehicles on our roads. Um, so I was planning to talk more about the benefits of these standards, but seeing some of the testimony that's been submitted and hearing what was said today, I think 
I feel a little bit more, more obligated to address some of the misinformation that is being spread. Um, the first theme that I've heard uh, is that this will harm competition and business and disadvantage the state relative to its neighbors. Um, so first of all, all of Connecticut's neighbors have signed the multi-state zero emission truck and bus MOU, and many like New Jersey, New York, and Massachusetts have announced plans to consider adopting California's emission standards as well. Um, all, almost all of these medium and heavy duty vehicles are for commercial purposes. That means the purchasers are businesses making rational business decisions based on underlying economics. Um, and businesses want these vehicles. There are literally billions of dollars in pre-orders today for major freight movers for these zero emission trucks. Um, there's demand for these vehicles because zero emission trucks are attractive on a total cost of ownership basis due to the anticipated fuel and maintenance cost savings that we expect to see. But supply is limited today, um, which is why we need requirements like California's advanced clean truck rule to make sure manufacturers produce zero emission trucks at the volume that we need. Um, also to be clear, these rules are requirements on the manufacturer. They don't require businesses or fleets to buy anything. It just makes it just makes sure that there are clean, less expensive electric vehicle options made available to these businesses. Um, fuel and maintenance cost savings aside, there are also massive public health savings from more stringent emission standards. When California went through the low NOx rulemaking, they found that the rule would reduce NOx emissions by 90%, percent, providing nearly $37 billion in public health benefits. Um, another theme that I've heard is this idea that the bill somehow runs counter or conflicts with federal rulemaking. Um, I'm here to tell you this makes no sense. Uh, in 2020, EPA indefinitely delayed a low NOx rulemaking. It's extremely unclear if and when that rule will be finalized. But let's assume that they start that, that back up. The earliest that rule could come into effect is 2027. At a minimum, this would create a gap of several years between the California schedule and federal implementation delaying those critical reductions in toxic emissions that we need to see. Um, it also may not be stringent enough to meet Connecticut's needs. It may not include incentives for zero emission trucks. There's just a lot of unknowns around that. Fortunately, the federal and the state actions aren't mutually exclusive. And in this case, they're actually complementary. Connecticut can move forward with California's emission rule um, while continuing to advocate for strong national standards as well. On top of that, Connecticut is, you know, at the very least should make sure it has all the tools in its tool belt to address its own unique air pollution issues rather than you know, deferring that authority to the political whims and timelines of Washington, DC. Yeah, um, so a few minutes is up. So just would ask if you could wrap up. Certainly, yeah. Um, thank you again for this opportunity. I've submitted a sign on letter with 86 organizations, um, all urging states to adopt California emission standards and I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thank you, thank you for bringing that to our attention. I don't see any questions or um, I don't see any hands raised in the Zoom. So we wanna thank you for your testimony and for your patience. We know it's been a long day, but um, appreciate all that you have to offer and contribute to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Omar, followed by Denise. Good afternoon. Can you hear me, Representative Boer? Yes. yes, I Excellent. can. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chairwoman and uh, members of the committee. And thank you so much for bearing with us all. You guys are real troopers. Uh, my name is Omar Terry. I'm the director of the Plastic Food Service Packaging Group with the American Chemistry Council. Um, and I'm here to oppose a section of HB 6502, specifically the polystyrene foam um, ban. Um, you have testimony in there from some colleagues uh, concerning the School Nutrition Association of Connecticut, as well as the Connecticut Association of Board of Education on the extreme detrimental impacts that uh, this will have. So I'll let you guys read that at your leisure and concentrate on some points that I would like to readdress with the committee um, concerning advanced recycling, right? And the recycling of these, um, this material. Um, first and foremost, um, while polystyrene foam has had some issues when it comes to mechanical recycling um, and getting those numbers up, there are new technologies that are being brought to bear across the United States and the world under the advanced recycling umbrella. Um, as my colleague earlier, Steve Lake mentioned, uh, that is taking place with one company, Amstai, entire Oregon, uh, but that's not the only place. 
We're seeing advanced recycling technology take shape in Illinois, where a 100 ton per day facility is being constructed to recycle polystyrene foam, and in fact, all polystyrene uh, by a company called Enios Styrolutions. Um, this is also taking place in the Atlanta, Georgia area, where they are taking all types of plastics, polystyrene, polyethylene, um, you know, polypropylene, and they are turning those plastics into chemical feedstocks, waxes, and fuels, um, and increasing the production of post-consumer recycled content for consumers. Um, additionally, uh, this is taking place in Virginia as well through a company called Braven um, Environmental, which is building out an advanced recycling um, uh, advanced recycling firm there. Um, altogether, there are additionally another nine states that have advanced advanced recycling um, bills. Those states happen to be Florida, Wisconsin, Georgia, Iowa, Tennessee, Texas, Ohio, Illinois, and most recently, Pennsylvania. Um, as I'm sure most of you on this committee know, um, ACC is interested in bringing this type of technology to Connecticut. And in fact, the advanced recycling bill was presented before the Environment Committee. Um, however, it has not been, uh, it has not received uh, a hearing yet. And so we would urge you all first and foremost to uh, amend HB 6502 um, to look at advanced recycling technologies before pushing a ban and hurting uh, businesses and schools. Um, and to look into um, advanced recycling technologies and to allow us to actually have a hearing on the bill. Um, and then finally, as I'm sure most of you are aware in Connecticut, polystyrene is actually not allowed to be recycled um, by statute. So, um, you know, we can't really recycle it if it's not even allowed to be recycled. Um, I'm trying to be respectful of the, uh, the three minutes. So. Oh, okay. Thank you. Perfect guy. I'm just getting ready to close out. So uh, that's my testimony. I'm willing to answer any questions, uh, but I understand you guys have had a very long day as well. Thank you. And that's okay. That's what we're here for. So, you know, it doesn't matter what time it is. We want to hear your testimony. So does anybody have any questions for Omar? No. With that, then we're going to thank you for your testimony today and appreciate all your input. Thank you so much, Representative, and I hope the rest of the committee has a good day. Thank you. Thank you. That's nice. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker is... Uh, We've Tom Swan. He wasn't on before, but we have put him on now. Oh, Tom Swan, room. yes. He dropped off, and then I put him back in. Okay, so our next speaker is Tom Swan, who will be followed by Denise. Good evening, Senator Cohen, Representative Boer. How are you? Um, it's been a long day. I want to thank you and the other members of the Environmental Committee for um, raising a number of the bills today, but specifically Senate Bill 931, an act concerning emission standards for medium and heavy duty vehicles. CCAG strongly urges its passage and offers our support for your efforts to pass it. Adopting California emission standards is a smart policy. It will save lives. It will help us meet our climate goals. And it makes sense from an economic perspective. Trucks make up about 10% of the vehicles on the road, um, but are responsible for nearly 30% of carbon emissions and 60% of particle matter emitted from the transportation sector. These emissions not only contribute to climate change, but they also have significant health impact including asthma, um, heart attacks, lung cancer, and strokes that all contribute to more deaths. A recent Union of Concerned Scientists study found that African-Americans, Asian-Americans, Latinos are disproportionately harmed by air pollution and thus face much greater exposure, pointing to how this is truly an environmental justice issue. You all know that last year, Senator, or Governor Lamont signed a multi-state compact with 14 other states. Um, also last year, California adopted these more aggressive standards. We're really happy to see that DEEP has endorsed these um, policy um, standards and agree that it's an important part of us meeting our emission goals. The recent announcements by General Motors and Ford point to the in inevitability of the market moving in this direction 
and Connecticut will benefit by being in the lead on this front. We urge you to reject the tired rationale offered by opponents of this legislation. They used these arguments when earlier proposals were passed. The sky didn't fall then, it's not gonna fall now. Reduced fuel costs and less engine maintenance will mean it, there will be minimal additional cost, if any, for industry. Thank you once again, and we look forward to working with you for passing it, and you all are really putting in a long day, and we appreciate it. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for your years of advocacy. And I'm sorry, I apologize, that's my dog. <laughs> okay. Um, cool. So does anybody have any questions for Tom? No? Well, I guess you said it all, Tom. Thanks so much okay. for being here. Thank all you, right. and thanks for all you do. Bye-bye. Thanks. The team. Okay, our next speaker is... I, oh, it's some, I said it out of order before. I'm sorry. So our next speaker is Samantha Danowski, followed by Denise. Hi there. Thank you, Representative Borer, Senator Cohen, Vice Chairs, Ranking Members, and members of the committee, and the committee staff who are demonstrating that they're rock stars and making this hearing possible. Thank you. Um, my name is Sam Janowski. I'm State Director of Sierra Club Connecticut. On behalf of Sierra Club and our more than 40,000 members and supporters in Connecticut, um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today in support of Senate Bill 931, an act concerning emission standards for medium and heavy duty vehicles. Um, I've submitted written testimony on this bill and um, have heard several previous speakers cover our key points, so I'll just briefly summarize. Um, we are committed to solving the, so the climate crisis with just and equitable solutions that will result in a healthy world for everyone. And here in Connecticut, we are feeling the impacts of climate change uh, driven by greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we're also experiencing poor air quality and the negative health impacts of pollution with disproportionate impacts on Black and Hispanic residents. Senate Bill 931 is a meaningful opportunity to address all of these issues and an actionable step to attain the goals of the Global Warming Solution Act, uh, Connecticut's climate law introduced by this committee uh, that mandates a reduction of greenhouse gas emissions below 2001 levels by 45% by 2030 and 80% by 2050. Our testimony supplies more specific information on the climate, environmental justice, and health issues we are facing, um, as well as the benefits we anticipate from this legislation. And we've also shared information on the zero emission, medium, and heavy duty vehicles on the market. Um, a piece of breaking news on this front, today FedEx announced that its delivery fleet will be made up of 100% electric vehicles by 2040, with interim benchmarks including 50% by 2025. Um, in conclusion, Sierra Club strongly supports Senate Bill 931, appreciates the work of this committee on the bill and urges your support. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. And thank you for all your advocacy, all of your meetings, all of your testimony, thank you. <laughs> all of the work that you do. Um, does anybody have any questions for Samantha? I don't see any hands raised in the Zoom, so I want to thank you for being here and thank you for all of your support on these bills. Thank you. Take care. Have a good night. Thank you, Samantha. Our next speaker is Denise, who will be followed by Stacy Ober. Thank you, Senator Bora, uh, Representative Bora, I should say. Thank you um, to the co-chairs, ranking members, and other members of the Environment Committee for today's hearing. My name is Denise Savageau. I am the chair of the Connecticut Council on Soil and Water Conservation and here to testify in support of House Bill 6496, Soil Health Sections 3, 4, and 5. I've also provided written testimony that includes information on soil health and I'm happy to ask any questions at the end. First, I want to thank Senator Kasser for supporting our efforts to update Connecticut statutes to include health. We really appreciate them. I also want to thank the Commissioner of Agriculture for supporting this bill. I agree that any work related to soil health on farms and farmland soils must include the Department of Agriculture. We strengthened our working relationship with the Department of Ag during the Governor's Council on Climate Change process um, on soil and soil health, and we look forward to continuing our work with them on this important issue. Our understanding of soil and soil health like our understanding of climate change has advanced greatly over the last two decades. 
This bill seeks to update our current statutes to include, include soil health, keeping pace with the science. This is especially important as we seek solutions to climate change. Updating our statutes now acknowledges the importance of soil health, recognizes the ongoing work related to soil health, and most importantly, ensures that it continues. The council is grateful for the support of DEEP and its recognition of soil health as important for food supply and food security, for water quality and quantity, for carbon sequestration and biodiversity, as is evidenced in the GC3 reports. And although I understand their staffing concerns, I would respectfully disagree with them on their assertion that this bill creates new programs or increased workload. Instead, it recognizes and supports soil health as important to addressing matters related to soil and wa water conservation. Soil health practices are nature-based, low impact, low cost solutions and are an important tool in our toolbox when we're dealing with all of the issues mentioned before. We look forward to working with the committee and DEEP on language to ensure that soil health is included in this bill. In closing, we have included suggested changes to sections three, four, three and four. This language better defines the work of the conservation districts, the Council on Soil and Water Conservation and our partner agencies, including DEEP and the Department of Ag. Where current language defines soil and water conservation primarily as soil erosion, we propose expanding it to include soil health, soil erosion, loss of important soil landscapes, including prime and important farmland soils, watershed health, and related, related ecosystem services of soils, including their role in climate change mitigation, adaptation, and resiliency. Thank you for your time, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Denise. You do have a, um, we do have Mary, uh, Representative Mushinsky who would like to ask some questions or comments. Uh, oh, Denise, I just want to ask you, um, do you feel there's any benefit to passing this bill in order to possibly attract some federal dollars from uh, climate change investment to our state? Does this bill tie in with anything the feds are doing? It absolutely ties in with work of the federal government. As you know, they have a major climate change, change initiative, including at the Department of Agriculture. One of the initiatives there is actually creating a carbon bank for farmers and making sure that we have a soil health program here in the state, particularly for our agricultural producers, they'll be able to tie into that. What I think is importantly, as we work very closely with USDA, the soil, uh, Natural Resources Conservation Service now on soil health, and when we having programs like that allows us to um, tie directly into some of their funding, um, whether it be on agricultural lands or supporting, um, you know, other work that we do in forests and across the landscapes. You know, a lot of times we only think the USDA programs are about farms, but they actually have a much more extensive program than that. And some folks may be familiar that we're doing a source water protection work in the uh, Farm River watershed in the Branford Guilford area. And that's all USDA funded. And, and, and it's gonna be a big soil health component as part of this. So it definitely attracts more federal dollars. Okay, um, well, that's good news. And just if you would follow along the bill with us to make sure, and if you're also paying attention to Congress because we may not be as close to it as you are. And if we need to adjust the bill as we go, to attract those federal dollars. I hope you will uh, give us the word so we can make some changes and be the first one in line to get help for our uh, Connecticut constituents. All right, thank you. I, I, I will definitely do that. And I just wanna say to that point is that this conservation districts and the Council on Soil and Water Conservation came out of the Dust Bowl era. They were established in the 1940s. And one of the reasons that they were established was to provide local input into this federal dollars that's coming in through USDA. Um, the conservation districts are referenced in the Farm Bill, which is the largest conservation title and the largest funding for conservation in the United States. So I just wanna make sure people understand how important that the work of the conservation districts and the council that helps coordinate that within the state and with our other state agencies like DEP and the Department of Agriculture are to making those federal links 
at the at the state level and then bringing it right down to the local level. So thank you for that question. And thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Denise. Um, I don't see any other uh, questions or comments. So thank you for your testimony today. Thank you for the opportunity. Our next speaker is Stacy Ober, followed by Amy Millardi. Good evening, committee chairs leaders and committee and committee members. My name is Stacey Ober. I am the advocate in New England on behalf of the American Kennel Club and I am registered in Connecticut. Uh, the American Kennel Club is a nonprofit organization that is affiliated with more than 5,000 dog clubs across the country, including 57 in Connecticut. And we're widely recognized as the trusted expert in canine health, training, breeding, and responsible dog ownership. I wanted to acknowledge our support for House Bill 6504 on animal welfare, which would update Con Connecticut statutes in a number of ways. And I'd like to just make uh, three points on that. Um, in section six of the bill, it affords municipalities some flexibility by allowing allowing neighboring towns to contract for temporary coverage of animal control officer duties. If their own animal control officer is on leave uh, for pregnancy or an illness or something of that nature and to provide the town with full legal protections in doing that, which I think is important. Um, secondly, I'd like to thank the Department of Agriculture for updating under section 11 the service animal text, which aligns uh, Connecticut statute with the Federal uh, American with Disabilities Act. There was a working group that I served on under Representative Abercrombie back in 2019, where we reviewed all of Connecticut statutes. And I'm grateful to see the Department of Agriculture put forward that text we worked on to align Connecticut statutes. Um, in those areas of the Connecticut um, law where they have jurisdiction. The American Kennel Club appreciates the breeders, the trainers, the handlers of these dogs, and we support breeding programs to ensure that sufficient high quality domestically bred dogs are available to the disability community. Last, I wanna just acknowledge that Senator Minor made mention of the changes in section nine of the bill that would require any person operating an animal shelter provide a veterinary exam within 48 hours of importing a cat or dog into the state. I know there'll be others um, after me who will speak to that, uh, but did want to acknowledge the importance of actually providing that veterinary exam. Um, the, the proper intake of animals is important in terms of isolating health risks, not only to the animal population, but also to the people who uh, might work in the shelter and may be exposed to any number of zoonotic diseases. And of course, any family that might rehome uh, a, a pet in need. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Does anybody have any questions for Stacy or? Oh, uh, Representative Dubisky. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you for coming in. I very much appreciate it. Um, I know that the uh, American Kennel Club does uh, some good work with regard to um, dogs and, and other animals. Um, and now I, I just wanted to make sure that you had uh, time. Did you get through all of the sections that you wanted to comment on? Thank you, Representative. I did. I did submit written testimony, so I wanted to just highlight those areas and sections of the bill that had not been previously elaborated on. Okay, I, I appreciate it. Um, now, the uh, there's been a lot of discussion today about uh, the redefinition of animal uh, on in section one on the first page. Yeah. Uh, does AKC have any? Uh, position or any thoughts on that? When I reviewed the bill, I was looking at it from the standpoint of 
canines and how it applied to dogs. But I have sat through today's hearing and I am aware that other states have in fact moved forward to amend their animal cruelty statute to include wildlife because of the unfortunate instances that this committee heard earlier today. Um, as I look at the bill, it, it appears as though the attempt was to address under chapter 435 domestic animals and livestock that are domesticated as well. Um, that may not be the appropriate place if there are animal control officers who are engaged when there are wildlife issues. It may be that, that under your um, environmental agency, DEEP, you were all referring to, may actually be deserving of some language in terms of recognizing ACO's role. But as I review that section of the statute, um, I didn't find a, a problem with the changes that were made. Okay, well, thank you. I, I appreciate your, your answers and thank you for coming out and, and testifying. Uh, and thank you, Madam Chair, for the time. Thank you, Representative. Uh, seeing no other questions, thank you, Ms. Ober, for your testimony today. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. Uh, next, we have Amy Malardi, followed by Charles Munn, followed by Julie Deschamps. Thank you, Co-Chair, Senator um, Cohen. I know it's been a long day. Um, so thanks again to the um, Vice Chair, Senator Slap, Representative Gresco, um, Ranking Member Senator Minor, and Ranking Member Representative Harding and all the members of the Environment Committee. I will be brief. I'm offering testimony in support of SB 925, an act prohibiting the import, sale, and possession of the big six African species. Uh, my name is Amy Millardi, and I live in Oxford, Connecticut. That's House District 131, Senate District 32. Um, I, I would like to thank um, Representative Labriola from the 131st District for co-sponsoring SB 925. He has really become a receptive and reliable ally with regards to legislation to further animal protection laws. So thank you for that. And of course, to Nicole Rivard and Friends of Animals for their perseverance on this bill to protect the big six African species. Um, as a supporter of this bill, I realize that permits have been issued to Connecticut residents to hunt animals on the endangered species list. Um, as clearly evidenced by those permits, the Endangered Species Act does not prevent animals from being hunted. And this is why I feel str so strongly about passing SB 925. Um, as of last night, there were 42 written email testimony submissions and from what I could see, only two of those submissions were in opposition to this bill. Um, one submitted by DEEP and the other by ACLU. So as I saw it, the support far outweighs the opposition for this bill. However, what I did find very interesting is that I could not find one single trophy hunter that was willing to su submit testimony to oppose the bill. So where are those tro trophy hunters and why are they unwilling to provide their testimonies in opposition of SB 925. And lastly, um, I submit that biodiversity is and should be a major concern when this bill is discussed. The well being and future of humans is directly linked with all other species and the ecosystem that we share. So if we continue to lose species, either knowingly or silently, we lose that biodiversity. So I thank you for your time. I know it's been a really long day. And if I may just very quickly um, submit testimony in support, it's, I have emailed it in of HB6502, the polystyrene products. Um, as a breast cancer survivor, I am very, very aware of um, anything that could be a suspected carcinogen or neurotoxin, and I'm in full support of this bill. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Malardi, for your uh, testimony. And I see Representative Dubitsky has a question for you. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you for coming in. Um, you asked the question, why aren't any of the hunters here? I, I think you know the answer to that, don't you? I do, it was a rhetorical question. <laughs> right, and it's because they would be harassed and threatened and their lives would be endangered if they came and testified in public, right? I don't know that. Okay, but you've seen that happen around the country in the news, right? 
Um, I have seen it, and I, I also would submit that perhaps they're ashamed that they've hunted an endangered species. Well, I, knowing a lot of hunters, I, I can assure you they're not ashamed. They're just worried about animal rights activists showing up at their door and firebombing their houses. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Dubitsky. Thank you, Representative. Representative Michel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Amy, for your amazing advocacy uh, work and for being a, an amazing uh, peaceful activist as demonstrated many times and along with the other animal rights groups in the state. Uh, I just wanted to thank you. Uh, um, uh, just had a quick question. Were you able, did you see um, any of the other testimonies, written testimonies? Did you particularly see the one from the deep? Just a quick question. No, I've been popping in and out all day. Just, um, I have a small child at home, so I've just been popping in here and there to see where I am in the speaker order. Um, but I do plan to go back and watch the public hearing. Thank you, okay. All right, thank you, Madam Chair, that was it. Thank you, Representative Michelle. Thank you, Representative. Okay, I don't see any other questions. So I thank you so much, uh, Ms. Malardi, for your testimony. Next, we have uh, Charles Munn, followed by Dewey Deshaun, followed by Joanne Bessia. Hi, Charles. Good evening. Can you hear me? I can. Nice to see you. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm uh, testifying in support of the SB 925, the Act prohibiting the import of the um, six different species from Africa. And so uh, thank you, Co-Chair Cohen, Co-Chair Borer, Vice Chair Slap, Vice Chair Gresco, Ranking Member Minor, Ranking Member Harding, and honorable members of the committee. Of the six species listed, two are extremely endangered already, namely the black rhino and the white rhino. Therefore, no trophy hunting of them should be allowed at all. Therefore, importation of trophies of rhinos clearly should be prohibited. Regarding the other four species on the list, which are the lion, leopard, uh, African elephant, and giraffe, the primary reason why trophies of those four species should be banned from import into the state is that many or most of the countries of Africa that still allow trophy hunting are not sufficiently serious and rigorous about controlling the hunting. And I say this having worked for the New York Zoological Society as a field biologist, having worked in Africa in a number of countries there. There are too many opportunities for countries to launder trophy animals hunted in neighboring countries that have very little control over the sustainability of the hunt. It is too difficult for authorities in Connecticut to evaluate the sustainability and social and environmental impact of trophy hunting in so many African countries and to keep up with changes in the laws and law enforcement in many African countries. Additionally, given the glaring conflict of interest of DEEP with regards to any issues related to hunting, it is hard to take their testimony at face value. It is true that large wild areas in some African countries are set aside specifically for trophy hunting, carried out almost entirely by uh, Europeans and North Americans. Recent studies of the economics of this hunting, however, shows that the local black communities adjacent to these hunting reserves receive a very tiny percentage of the money being generated by the hunting. Thus, until the economic benefits to local communities uh, are increased to be both substantial and fair, and the sustainability is demonstrated beyond any reasonable doubt, the state of Connecticut should ban imported trophies of all six of these species. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Munn. Uh, I see Representative Michelle has his hand raised. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Munn, for testifying again uh, this year under different conditions. Um, I was just wondering, uh, is there, do you see uh, with hunting for conservation comments that we made earlier in the, in the call, uh, do you see any conflicts of interest? 
Well, I mean, it's, I mean, the problem with most state wildlife agencies in the United States, this is not unique to Connecticut, is that almost all of the state wildlife agencies of state governments have a conflict of interest when it comes to hunting because they receive so much money from the gun and ammunition tax. And the more uh, sport hunters in a state, the larger piece of this federal gun tax pie they receive. Therefore, it's very difficult to take them seriously because they're gonna be pro-hunting automatically. That's a major conflict of interest. So, I mean, Deep might be right about some of their statements supporting um, trophy hunting, but I, I, it's hard to take them seriously because they show so much bias, pro-hunting bias otherwise. I see, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Moon, and thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. All right, I don't see any other questions, so thank you, uh, Mr. Munn, for your testimony today. Thanks so much. All right, next we have uh, Julie Deschamps, followed by Joanne Basile, followed by Betsy Guerra. Welcome, Julie. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the Environmental Committee for the opportunity to express my support of HB 6502. I'm Julie Deschamps, the founder of Waste Free Greenwich, and I'd like to comment on one section of the bill in particular, styrofoam trays in Connecticut schools. As a Green Schools Committee member of Greenwich Public Schools, I've led efforts to eliminate polystyrene trays from our cafeterias. After pleading our case to administration for over a decade, local advocates began a sustained lobbying campaign to the Board of Education in 2018. At meeting after meeting, in op-eds and in community petitions, we argued that our children should not be exposed to styrene, a carcinogen and hormone disruptor. We were especially concerned about those students participating in the National School Lunch Program who did not have a choice but to ingest styrene with breakfast and lunch every day for up to 13 years. The cumulative health effects of styrene exposure on developing bodies can be nothing but detrimental. Our team discovered that the Greenwich Public Schools trashed almost a half a million non-recyclable styrofoam trays each year to be incinerated at the detriment of our air and soil quality and the health of our neighbor, neighbors in Peekskill and Bridgeport. These trays used for mere minutes create a trail of harmful pollutants and waste from manufacture to disposal. Use of polystyrene trays in Connecticut schools is an unsustainable harmful practice. It's simply unacceptable, particularly in a state facing a waste crisis and grappling with environmental injustice. Our environmental affairs director, Pat Sesto said it best, quote, the trays demonstrate wastefulness is, o wastefulness is okay. We owe it to our children to practice what we preach and make responsible choices for their future, unquote. Finally, in the spring of 2019, the Greenwich Board of Education eliminated styrofoam from the school cafeterias. At first, they transitioned to a paper boat as the molded fiber trays food services intended to use contain PFAS. They have since been reformulated, but this is a cautionary tale to schools and to the committee not to replace one hazardous product with another to avoid regrettable substitutions. I would recommend that schools be required to use only BPI certified compostable products as they will not contain PFAS. Even, even more, I would suggest that school districts adopt reusable foodware over disposables, the most responsible decision that in the long run will save money and is the only waste-free sustainable solution. The fight to transition away from polystyrene was not an easy road for advocates in Greenwich, and I worry for other districts trying to move in this, dis in this direction. We need our legislators to stand up for our children and safeguard their health. We need you to protect our environment from toxic polystyrene and to advocate for more sustainable waste practices, eliminating the millions of styrofoam trays that make, up, make their way from school cafeterias to incinerators, polluting Connecticut's most vulnerable communities. Thank you.
I'm muted. You're muted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Ms. Dusan, for your uh, testimony and, and for all your advocacy. It sounds like uh, it was a long road, but you um, were able to get uh, so much accomplished in your town of Greenwich. It also sounds like we heard earlier from uh, Ms. Getz uh, of CYOCT that Greenwich is moving uh, towards uh, town-wide bans on um, some of the items that are contained in this bill. And I will just point you, um, as reference, we do have a uh, toxicity bill um, pertaining to PFAS and packaging um, and other materials that um, would be of interest perhaps as you talk about um, some of these other um, potentially hazardous items that we would be replacing um, with styrofoam. So I just uh, appreciate all of that and I see Representative D'Amico has his hand up. Representative. Uh, th th thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Julie, for uh, coming and testifying. So I just wanted to pick up on, on uh, what, what uh, Senator Cohen uh, was discussing with you just briefly just now. So I, I, I'm kind of curious, uh, is, it, is it a financial concern? Is it a, a labor intensive concern that, 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 that precludes uh, uh, the schools uh, from uh, going to uh, re, uh, reusable uh, materials. Uh, in other words, I, I appreciate what you had to say about moving from one single-use product to another single-use product, and, and and the problems that you know th that are inherent there. So, so what what is precluding schools and and other entities, as far as you know, from going back to the old-fashioned reusable um, um, items? Well, I was more referencing. Um that I, I, don't, I think in some, some communities and, and a lot of communities that there's just not this groundswell of support and people just don't have time to go to every single board of ed meeting, you know, constantly lobbying the, the superintendent, the food services director. It was a really, really long road and took a lot of time and a lot of effort from a lot of people. And I'm just not so sure that every community in Connecticut can go through this entire process to get you know, th this, the same result, getting styrofoam out of the school cafeterias. I know that schools are concerned with um, you know, the price tag for other disposables, um, but really, you know, th if there were um, PCBs in the soil, no problem, their money's there to get them out, right? Is there asbestos in your walls? There's no problem, you're gonna get them out. This, this is the same thing. There's a toxic substance in our school cafeterias and we need to pay to get them out. No, no, I, I, I appreciate that. And, and, and maybe I wasn't clear enough in my question. I, I'm just curious to know what, 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 what is, what, why can't we, I, I'm not phrasing it properly, perhaps. What is, wouldn't it be a better idea instead of going from a, a, a throwaway product to another throwaway product to go to a permanent product like we did back in the good old days? Or, or, or is there some reason why we can't do that? I, I think that's the best solution. Um, if we could move to a reusable um, product. In fact, we piloted uh, um, stainless steel trays in one of our elementary schools that had a dishwasher and it worked fabulously. We cut waste by 80%. It was really fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. we're st our school district is still looking at um, options to move to a reusable system. Um, unfortunately with COVID, you know, things have been disrupted severely, um, but you know, when things get back to normal, we're gonna further um, explore that route. Okay. No, great. I, I appreciate that. Th thank you. No, thank you very much. All right. Thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative. All right. I don't see any other questions. So thank you again for your time and testimony. Thank you very much, Senator Cohen. All right. Next, we have uh, Joanne Basile, followed by Betsy Guerra, followed by Paulina Muratore. Muratore. Joanne, welcome. <laughs> thank you. And um, thank you, uh, Co-Chair Cohen and uh, Bohr, uh, all of the uh, vice chairs and ranking members and the honorable members of the committee. I'm Joanne Basile. I'm the executive director of Connecticut Votes for Animals. 
Um, and I happen to live in Guilford, Connecticut, and I am a constituent of Senator Cohen's. Um, I, so much has already been said uh, about the bills that I'm going to speak to. I wanted to just raise a couple of issues. Uh, first of all, um, CVA uh, is an animal advocacy organization uh, representing more than 5,500 uh, Connecticut residents uh, throughout the state. And we strongly support policies that involve Connecticut's participation in saving imperiled animals uh, from needless slaughter, including trophy hunting, poaching, and wildlife trafficking. Uh, accordingly, we strongly support SB 925. You've heard from many of the other speakers all the reasons why we would do that. We want to applaud the committee's uh, actions in the past two years in moving this bill out of committee and uh, trust that that commitment will remain strong in 2021. Uh, I'd also just say, as on a personal note, I have been on a safari, and um, if you uh, had the wonderful experience of being able to see uh, the uh, Big Five, and uh, if you could see them, you could, would never understand why people would want to kill them. So um, let me uh, turn quickly then to uh, HB 6504, which CVA supports with some reservations. and. Um, we want to commend the Department of Agriculture for um, its both successful implementation of the APCP program, as well as uh, increasing the am amount of funding available for um, the feral cat program, uh, the, and, and also raising the uh, veterinary uh, voucher costs. Uh, obviously, it's something that needed to be done. I'd like to just draw the committee's attention to one item. Um, currently, the APCP program has a mandated $300,000 limit by which um, if, the, if the funding is there, um, they must stop funding programs. This past year in 2021, they initiated the program in, in July of 2020, and they had to stop it in December because they had reached that limit. Now, uh, that meant that, that means that for the next six months, there is no low income vouchers being uh, given. And um, there, I, I, I'm not sure I fully understand uh, the reason for this $300,000 limit. It is in fact statutory. And so we would urge the committee to look at that and perhaps consider giving the Department of Agriculture some flexibility to b go below that number if in fact they find that they are running out of funds uh, well before the end of um, uh, the fiscal year. Uh, uh, secondly, um, obviously we wanna bring up again and show our concern about the question of the uh, definition of the term animal. I think you've heard from so many people from both sides of, of, of this issue that this is not an easy and simple uh, answer. And I think that the department is to be commended in terms of trying to um, uh, tackle this issue, but I don't think they're there yet. And I would I hope and recommend that the committee would actually remove that section from uh, this statute, this bill, so that the bill can move forward, but in fact, direct the commission to uh, this summer, pull together the interested parties so that we in fact can find a definition that is good for everyone. And that would be both the Department of Agriculture as well as with the Department of, um, um, of with DEEP. Um, Thank you very much. We just we just reached our three minutes, and I just wanted to note that. Okay. Well, um, uh, Senator Cohen, I'm going to send you a a, a personal note about um, the issue of uh, upgrading standards for uh, municipal shelters. You have a wonderful example in Brantford at the uh, Dan Cosgrove Animal Shelter. They have a new shelter that they're building. I think they would be a tremendous resource to the committee. Uh, in terms of uh, looking at how you uh, uh, develop standards that are both humane as well as sanitary and so on. Thank you for that, uh, Joanne, because uh, you know we heard a testimony earlier from the Connecticut Humane Society um, talking about you know antiquated standards and, and uh, you know if, if the need be to update those standards, how do we go about doing that? And does that, do those exist anywhere um, that we could really pull from? I think that's the question at this point. Well, um, I'd like, we'd like to associate ourselves with the comments of the Connecticut Humane Society. I think they raise a very good and very serious question. Okay. Um, 
So great. Well, I appreciate that. And I see Representative Mishinsky has her hand up for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Joanne, I miss you on the train. I miss you too. <laughs> um, this, the tech instead. Oh, well. Uh, but yeah. I have some questions on the spay neuter program. I was the author of the spay neuter program. I and know. the reason the 300,000 was in there was the department wanted to be sure they could keep their, as I remember, they wanted to make sure they could keep their staff on board in a continuous manner and not have to lay them off and put them back on. So they put a cushion in there for the staff and to uh, front some of the fees. So that was really why that number was picked. If the number is out of date, you can talk to the commissioner and see if there's a new number that we should be using. But the reason was to protect the department so they wouldn't go into the red for part of the year. Okay, so that's why that number is there. Um, but I wanted to ask you, the, the, the law gets out of date periodically, just like the Medicare law fails to reimburse doctors for the for what it costs them to treat a human patient. This this bill also gets out, this law gets out of date because the vet fees are pegged in the law. And I was wondering, is there anything we could index rather than having to manually change the vet fees in the statute every 10 years or so? Is there anything we could do to index the vet fees so they would automatically match real world conditions? Um, something we could tie it to in, in, in the statute rather than manually changing the number? You know, it's a, it's a very interesting question, Representative Mashinsky, and I don't have a simple answer for it, but I would say that that is, that, that is true. I mean, there's obviously a finite amount of money. And um, if you peg uh, veterinary costs of reimbursements, for instance, to a cost of living, uh, you might find that escalating faster than in, and, and draining out, if you will, even more so the amount of money that is available for vouchers. There is also a problem that, you know, they allocate these vouchers and if they aren't um, and if the vouchers are so low, um, the doctors, the veterinarians aren't interested in taking the animals. So there's got to be a balancing act there. Um, I would again, I would like to see there. I think. Honestly, I think the program is in need of an overhaul. People need to look at it. There are questions about can you peg the veterinary reimbursement cost to a, a, some kind of an economic indicator? Um, can you also, um, you know, should we be looking at that three hundred thousand dollars? I mean, how do you how do you justify a low income program that ends within six months of when it began? Mm, doesn't make any sense. And and you're sitting there with a pile of money, which, as we all know, if there was a sweep we'd lose. Well, there was an attempt to sweep and the money was <laughs> claimed after a court, after a court fight. But anyway, um, we, even if we fix this now temporarily with the statutory fix, uh, we really should look at this long-term because I don't like the way it's operating where it works really well. And then suddenly it has to shut, shut down. And then, and then I agree. you lose 15 veterinarians and then you have to go get them again and tell them we've changed the fees. They can come back into the program. And meanwhile, you're t sending people away. Well, and you read, you're I'd to, like be to be stable. Yeah, you're to be congratulated because it's one of the most successful programs I think we have in the state. And we need to do something to really preserve it and make sure that it operates on a continuous basis. Okay. So, Everybody wins. All right. So um, if, if you and the commissioner, commissioner staff could talk about this and see if there's a way to stabilize it. Um, otherwise, I guess we have to do another band aid fix, but I'd rather stabilize it permanently if we could okay love to, i we will certainly look into that thank you okay thank you thanks representative uh senator minor thank you uh madam chair so um the commissioner and i had a conversation much earlier today about imported dogs and the health risk uh and the uh, his interest, the agency's interest in having a veterinarian uh, inspect that dog upon arrival. Are you, you're okay with that part of the, of the bill? Yeah, yeah absolutely, Senator Minor. You know, I, I've got to tell you, I've got to go back and take a look at current law. It has been my understanding, and I've worked with some of these, um, just on a personal level, with some of these uh, rescue groups when they bring dogs in, particularly from the South. As you know, I have one actually in the dog hospital as opposed to being downstairs. But um, 
it has always been my understanding that those dogs were in fact, um, uh, they in fact had to see a veterinarian at the time they were imported into uh, Connecticut. They had, or they have to provide a certificate of health uh, where they're being exported. Um, and I thought they had, there was a limited, uh, there was amount of time where they had to see a veterinarian, <clears throat> excuse me, at the time uh, after they were adopted. Or perhaps maybe this is now before they're being adopted. We have no problem with that. Uh, we absolutely agree. You wanna be able to uh, ensure um, as best as we can the health at least get the animal started off in a, in a good, healthy way. Uh, it's good for both the animal and it's obviously good for the, um, the pet parent. So yeah, we agree. And so <clears throat> my other question to the point of, uh, you know, trying to make sure that the program for spay neuter continues to move forward on a more consistent basis. Um, I keep thinking about changes that have occurred and are continuously proposed uh, in, in the sale of cats and dogs within the state of Connecticut, predominantly through pet shops. And I wonder if, um, if a modest fee were to accompany the importation of a dog uh, into Connecticut uh, my recollection is it's about 28,000 animals a year. Um, you know, $10 on 28,000 would more than double the amount of money in that fund. Um, what would you think about that option? I'd certainly, we would certainly want to explore um, uh, different funding options for the APCP program. I mean, right now, as you know, it is basically, it's a fee. So it's consumer driven. Um, so it is, there's, I don't believe there's any state money in that program whatsoever. I, I believe it's all, it's all so generated. It, right. I, I believe it's a fee, uh, when you adopt a dog out of a municipal pound, I don't think there is a fee when you adopt a dog anywhere else. And so it's not a, correct. it's not an even up fee. Yeah. Uh, most of my constituents are doing business over the internet. Yeah, uh, they have uh, all sorts of issues, but nonetheless, right. at least it would provide some uh, continuum of care for those that believe strongly uh, that spay and neuter of um, animals is probably the the most likely solution to having unwanted cats and dogs, I guess, uh, roaming around the state of Connecticut. So. Uh, maybe we can talk about that further, or perhaps you'd consider that as a friendly amendment. I, I, you know, I concur, and you are right. As I said, the the APCP program is incredibly successful, and it does get to just that just issue of finding unwanted animals, and uh, finding a way of giving it some sustainable funding uh, is a very good idea. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Miner. All right, Joanne, I don't see any other questions from the committee, so thank you for your time and testimony. Thank you. Be well. All right, uh, next we have Betsy Guerra uh, from Cross, followed by Paulina Maratore, followed by Lieutenant Bright. Hi, Betsy, thank welcome. Thanks for your patience. Well, thank you, Senator. Thank you for your patience and committee members. Um, my name is Betsy Gare. I'm the Executive Director of the Connecticut Council of Small Towns, and I'm here to support House Bill 6497, which is an enabling authorization which allows municipalities to create a stormwater authority to assist them in funding stormwater management compliance, um, which is needed to protect our water resources and water bodies. Um, as you probably heard earlier today, when uh, DEEP reissued the, storm, uh, the MS4 general permit in 2017, under EPA's um, stormwater phase two rules, there were certainly a considerable amount of requirements that were applicable to many towns. In fact, the permit now applies to approximately 121 towns under the, the definitions included uh, under the federal law. This has resulted in significant costs to towns, sometimes overwhelming um, costs associated with purchasing new equipment, uh, with uh, 
legal fees, engineering costs, staff costs, consultant costs, and it is an ongoing expenditure. And we do believe at this point that it is necessary to provide towns with some opportunity to determine whether or not in conjunction with their lo local legislative body, whether they should create a stormwater uh, authority that would allow them to set fees based on how much stormwater a property contributes to the, the system. And so we think that this could be a fairer way of funding stormwater. I know EPA has indicated that stormwater management is probably one of the biggest uh, funding requirements that are facing municipalities. And although we have a clean water fund and a state revolving fund for drinking water. We don't have a dedicated fund for stormwater management. And again, this would provide towns with the opportunity to do that. So I appreciate your listening and I have submitted written comments and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Betsy. It's good to hear a uh, cost uh, stance on this. Um, any questions from the committee? All right. Well, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Have a good evening. You too. All right. We have, we're down to the last three here. Paulina Muratori, uh, Uchenna Bright, and Lori Malucci. Paulina, are you with us? Oh, Gaia, did you? Sorry, Senator Cohn, we don't have number 60 uh, in, the, in the room. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Paulina. I'm, I probably butchered your last name. I apologize. Please correct me. <laughs> no, it's okay. You were close. Um, Muratori. So um, thanks again. Um, holding up to the back of the line here. I'm glad you're all still on. I'm happy to um, finally give my very brief, hopefully, testimony to not keep you all too much longer. Um, I want to thank um, the chairs, vice chairs, ranking members, and members of the Environment Committee my name is Paulina Muratori, and I'm a senior transportation campaign organizer with the Union of Concerned Scientists. Um, I'm, I'm testifying today in support of Senate Bill 931, an act concerning emission standards for medium and heavy duty vehicles. We think this bill is a critical step in the right direction as Connecticut continues to make headway on clean energy and transportation policy, namely how the state will achieve widespread deployment of zero emission trucks and other heavy duty vehicles. You all know this, but the transportation sector is the largest source of global warming pollution within the state and is the key sector to focus on in order to reach climate goals and achieve co-benefits such as clean air and healthier communities. And across the nation, heavy duty trucks represent only 10% of vehicles on the road, but are disproportionately responsible for local air pollution. UCS analysis has shown that these vehicles make up 45% of on-road nitrogen oxide emissions and 57% of on-road fine particulate matter emissions. As has been mentioned, this local air pollution is extremely detrimental to public health leading to respiratory illnesses, missed work and school days, emergency room visits, and even early death. Um, and what's more, uh, communities of color across the Northeast region breathe on average 66% more of this pollution from on-road vehicles than do white residents. Adopting California's medium and heavy duty emissions and sales standards uh, and pairing them with other targeted local emission reduction policies can help Connecticut start to reduce this historic and current inequity along with neighboring states who have been engaged. Uh, these vehicles are already available in a wide variety of models and sizes um, and decreasing costs means that they will soon reach upfront parity with traditional combustion engine trucks. Um, and battery electric trucks also do not release tailpipe emissions. When, when charged on the average US electrical grid, they have 44 to 79% lower life cycle global warming emissions compared to the diesel trucks. Um, so just in sum, uh, we really support this bill. Uh, we support Connecticut continuing to be a leader in this space. And along with my testimony, I'm also submitting a recent letter uh, that was signed by 86 groups um, about the multi-state MOU to the Northeast States for Coordinated Air Use Management's comment portal, which was alluded to in someone else's testimony as well. Um, thank you for your time and um, thank you for hanging in this long. Happy to take any questions if there are some. Thank you, Ms. Muratori. Uh, are there any questions from the committee? 
All right, seeing none, I thank you for being with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, Gaia, did um, number 60 come in or no? No, I don't have number 60 in the room. Okay, so last but not least, uh, Lori Malucci, welcome. Thank you very much. Good evening, Senator Cohen, Representative Bohr, and members of the Environment Committee. I know you're crushed that number 61 is finally upon us. It's been a very long day. Um, I come before you as president of the Connecticut Federation of Dog Clubs and Responsible Dog Owners, which represents the members of over 50 dog clubs in the state of Connecticut, as well as the over 50% of Connecticut households that contain at least one dog. The Federation supports the passage of House Bill 6504, particularly Section 9, which addresses the importance of requiring a veterinarian examination for dogs and cats being imported into this state. While we acknowledge that there are responsible shelters and rescues who currently work to ensure the safety of Connecticut's population, we are sadly aware that there are also those who do not operate in that manner. 2019 U.S. Department of Agriculture report indicated that over 1 million mostly rescue dogs were imported into the United States from foreign nations, with less than 3,000 of that 1 million having had the required veterinary exam. Many of these dogs are intended for transfer to local rescue organizations, including some organizations in our state. To ensure that any of these dogs subsequently imported into Connecticut are healthy, a Connecticut veterinary exam must be required. As Senator Minor pointed out earlier, the number of dogs that originate in Connecticut do not meet the consumer demand, resulting in significant importation into this state as well as surrounding states. Protecting the health and welfare of the human and animal population of Connecticut is of utmost importance. And we are grateful to Commissioner Herbert and his staff and this committee for putting this bill forward. Thank you again for providing me the ability to testify in HB 6504. Federation is always happy to be part of any conversation about animal welfare in Connecticut. Thank you so much, uh, Lori, for your testimony. Does anybody have any questions or comments? All right. Seeing none, I appreciate uh, your testimony tonight. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Gaia, is there anybody else that is, it doesn't look like we have anybody in the wait, right? No, we don't have anyone else in the waiting room. All right, well, it looks like we have near the end of our public hearing, but I do want to just give uh, my co-chair an opportunity to say a few words, Representative Warr. Thank you, Senator Cohen. And I know it's been a very long day and night. So thank you all for indulging me. But um, I did want to make an announcement and I wanted to make sure I made it here to the Environment Committee. Uh, as many of you know, Senator Leone uh, transitioned over to the Department of Transportation. And with that left a vacancy and Pat, um, Pat Miller ran for his Senate seat and she was successful last night, which we congratulate her in that um, effort. And that left a vacancy in her role and she was the bonding committee chairwoman. So um, I have been offered the position of bonding chair. So I'm going to be transitioning out of my role as environment chair into that role. So while I'm very excited for the new chapter, it's really bittersweet for me because I've been on this committee for four and a half years and I love the work that we do together. And uh, I think in, in even in my most recent role as um, co-chair, I think together with the leadership team and all of you, we've set a great agenda that we could be proud of, not just for this session, but for Connecticut's environment for years to come. And I hope in my new role, I can continue to support our environmental efforts because now I'll be on the funding side and we've talked about a lot of initiatives that will need that funding. So I will continue to be um, a champion for all of us. And um, I just really wanna take the opportunity to thank Christine, Senator Cohen, my co-chair because we've spent day and night together for the last few months, more time than we've spent with our, our families. And um, 
I think it's been a great partnership and I've really enjoyed um, working with you. And um, I just admire your knowledge and passion and dedication. It's, it's really admirable. So thank you for all that you've taught me and worked with me on. And I wanna thank our ranking leader, Senator Minor and Representative Harding. I think um, our work together has all been very professional and bipartisan and it just demonstrates what uh, great work you could do when you all work together. And um, lastly, I wanna thank all of the members, all of the members that have contributed to the environment agenda this session. Um, we've all learned from each other and, and just made our legislation, made us better legislators and uh, made better legislation for the state of Connecticut for our environment um, so that we could have a good healthy environment for years to come. So um, with that, that is my announcement. And um, yeah, that's my announcement. <laughs> uh, well, I just want to say congratulations, uh, Representative. It has been an absolute pleasure to have you by my side uh, these past couple months. And you are correct in saying that we spend more time together than we did with our family. But I think together, uh, and with our ranking members and, and vice chairs, we have um, developed a really great agenda for this session and you've really uh, set us up um, nicely to uh, proceed and uh, in good stead. And, and uh, I'm confident um, that, you know, because of all the hard work you did on the front end, uh, that uh, together with all these committee members that, that we'll get some of these important pieces of legislation uh, accomplished this session. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. I feel uh, good I, about I feel good about the place that I'm I'm leaving from. Yeah, that's great. All right, I see uh, Senator Miner had his hand up. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I too would like to uh, offer my sincere congratulations. I have uh, greatly enjoyed uh, the time we've spent together. Uh, it's unfortunate that this has uh, had to all occur, occur uh, via Zoom, uh, via voice, uh, but uh, I'm sure you will do well uh, as chair of the bond committee. And I'm sure we'll come up with a couple of great ideas to send your way <laughs> and uh, hope you will uh, remember us fondly uh, when those uh, kind of hit your desk. So thank, thank you. you, Godspeed. Thank you so much, Senator Miner. And I, uh, you know, it's been not just as chair, but uh, we've worked together as I was a member of the committee. And I came to learn that uh, when you made a commitment, you honored that commitment. And I really appreciate that. And, and you're right. I think I just made 187 best friends overnight. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Representative Harding. Yes, uh, I just want to uh, echo what everyone else has said. Uh, Dorinda, you've been fantastic to work with, uh, and I really appreciate the time that you've uh, given me to 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 make this committee bipartisan, which you've really done a great job of. Uh, I'm, I've been very impressed in the short period of time with your intellect, with your understanding of the legislative process, and, and your ability, again, to work in a bipartisan fashion to get results. And um, we're going to miss you uh, in your leadership capacity here in this committee, uh, but I'm, I'm sure you're very excited about your new role new role and I'm sure you're, you're going to do great in that new role. Uh, so we're going to miss you, uh, but we'll be seeing you a lot in the building and looking forward to all the great things you're going to do uh, in your new role. So congratulations and um, thank you for all the time working with me over this past couple months. Thanks so much, Representative Harding. I look forward to seeing you again on the floor. I hope we're back together on the floor soon. Representative Gresko. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oswa grant money, um, Greenways grant money, um, <laughs> heritage funds. Uh, wait, I have a list. Uh, so uh, thank you for uh, for having the reins of the of this important committee um, uh, and doing the work and the hard work for the months uh, ahead of where we are now. And uh, it's much appreciated by the entire committee. Um, uh, you'll have a great time uh, being the uh, bond chair, but don't, uh, you know, don't forget us. Uh, I'm sure we won't forget you. And uh, when it comes time to uh, 
to uh, uh, fund what I had just uh, uh, mentioned. And um, um, while everybody is, is uh, here, um, uh, the question must be posing in, in all, all of your brains and who will be the house chair of the environment committee. And so I'm here to tell you, I'm not telling you, no. Uh, it, it's gonna be me. So um, I'm gonna hopefully endure this tsunami of, uh, of uh, bill information that uh, is waiting for me. And uh, we will try to uh, navigate uh, through uh, and get uh, some good legislation passed. I'm gonna have to ask for everyone's indulgence uh, to give me some time to, to catch up, but um, um, I promise to do my best. So uh, Dorinda, best of luck to you and thank you. Thanks so much, Joe. And I know that everybody's in good hands with you. Um, and you know, I, you mentioned the bonding, Pat Miller, I have big shoes to fill. I mean, she served with dedication and a lot of um, institutional knowledge. So I have a heavy lift on that side of it, but, um, but you're right. The bonding finance revenue and bonding are uh, the three stools of our, our finances for the state. So it's a critical role in them. I'm looking forward to it. And, and thanks Representative Gresco, you and I have worked together, this is our third year together now, and I know you've been on this committee for many years and a lot of these initiatives you've been uh, working hard at work on for long before my short tenure. Uh, so I always look forward to learning from you and grateful to have you by my side as we navigate the rest of this session. Yeah, and the beautiful thing is Joe doesn't need to get up to speed because as vice chair, he's been involved in all of our screening meetings and crafting the legislation. And, you know, you're already there. So you're ready to take the reins. No pressure. <laughs> oh, sorry, Joe. Did, did you, were you saying something? Hey, oh, no yeah. pressure. <laughs> yeah, no pressure. Representative Piscopo. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Congratulations, Joe and, and Dorinda. I, I, Congratulations, and let me be the first to welcome you. I'm, I'm ranking member over there on the bonding subcommittee, so I'm looking very, very much looking forward to working with you. Thank you. I understand I have a great new partner in you. I've already, uh, your reputation precedes you, so I'm looking forward to working with you as well. So I think so. Big congratulations to Joe. Um, I'm not going too far. I'll be here if anybody needs me, and uh, thank you for all the kind words. Well, we're counting on that, Dorinda. We'll be, we'll be knocking on your door. You can count on it. So great that you've been a part of the committee and you know how important these initiatives are. So <laughs> when we come yeah, that's, talking, yeah, you won't slam the door on us. That's um, the great part. All of these initiatives we've been talking about in committee saying, where are we going to get the funding? Where are we going to get the funding? <laughs> I hope. <laughs> hope I'm going to get my hands on the funding. Right. Oh, so you had another question or comment. Yeah, just real quick before we uh, we wrap up, I would be remiss to uh, to uh, not at least to, uh, let everyone know who will be taking over as vice chair, and uh, that will be Christine Palm. So uh, we are we are uh, a good group, and uh, congratulations to uh, Christine, and uh, look forward to working with us. What a team! Very go, exciting. Go Who knew that the end of our, our hearing, our what, how many hours, nine hour hearing was going to be so exciting. <laughs> so congratulations, Christine, congrats, Joe, and congratulations, Dorinda. And I'm really looking forward uh, to working with everybody. So I, I think we've got a good, good team going. Thank you. And good luck, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Session. All right. Be well. This concludes our hearing. Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Congratulations. Good night.